Phillips on CAC. Of course. You're welcome, Mayor. Okay, I have six o'clock sharp and we've got all council members here. So I guess we're gonna check in on channel eight. Channel eight, good to go, Chris. I'll check in with Emily. How are we looking in the council chambers? You are muted, Emily. Sorry about that. We're good to go. Great. I'll hit record. Oh, I did hit record, so we're good. Okay, super. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, I'll bang, bang, bang. Welcome everyone to the Boulder City Council meeting of February 16th, 2021. We are going to start by having an explanation of our interpretation services tonight, so I'll turn it over to Brenda for that. Thank you, Sam. Um, we are pleased that tonight's meeting through most of the meeting will be supported by interpretation into Spanish. Manuela, do you want to do concurrent for me? Estamos eh, muy complacidos de poder ofrecer la mayor parte de esta reunión con interpretación al español. And I'm sharing my screen. Are we seeing the slides? Let me try again. Sorry about that. And it's not letting me try again. Okay. Hmm. All right. Let me end that. Okay. Let me try again here. I'm screen sharing. I would like to stop. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so we have interpretation this evening, as I mentioned. Here are slides to help folks find the function on the Zoom call to turn interpretation onto the language of their choice. Entonces tenemos interpretación para esta noche. Tenemos la opción de eh, seleccionar el globo eh, de interpretación y escoger el idioma que prefieren. Please choose the icon that looks like a globe at the bottom of your screen and choose English or Spanish. Al, hasta abajo de su pantalla hay un icono en forma de un globo terráqueo y si lo escogen tienen la opción de escoger entre español e inglés. Escojan el idioma que prefieren. For those who will be speaking during open comment or one of our public hearings this evening, um, we have some suggested tips for working with an interpreter. Y para aquellas personas que van a estar hablando hoy o presentando, tenemos algunas pautas o recomendaciones sobre cómo trabajar con un intérprete. We ask that you speak slowly and clearly pronounce your words and breathe between sentences. Le pedimos que hable despacio, pronuncie claramente sus palabras y respire entre una oración y otra. Please do not interrupt each other while speaking. Por favor, no interrumpa a otros que tienen la palabra. If you own a headset with a microphone, it is helpful for the interpreters if you use it. Si tiene audífonos que incluyen micrófono, por favor, úselos, pues ayudan a los intérpretes. Please select one language channel, English or Spanish, and stick to the language of that channel while you are speaking. Por favor, seleccione un canal de idioma y cuando lo haya seleccionado, use solamente ese idioma al hablar. And please avoid using idioms such as quit cold turkey or be under the weather. Y por favor, evite usar frases idiomáticas como, por ejemplo, vender gato por liebre. Thank you, Manuela, for concurrent interpretation. From this point forward, interpretation will be simultaneous. So please be sure to choose a channel. We're good. Thank you both. Um, with that, I think we're ready to start our announcements. <clears throat> we have three major types of announcements. The first one is about COVID-19. Um, 
The first part is that exposure notification uh, application is available for cell phones. This is an application which is completely private and safe and will let you know if you have been exposed to someone who tests positive for COVID-19. And you can use the uh, website www.addyourphone.com, which you can also see on the slide. And then the second part, and the very hopeful part is that vaccines are being administered right now in Boulder County. And if you'd like information on how to get your vaccine and to sign up for notifications when you become eligible, the website for that <clears throat> is on the screen. And it, in short, it's www.bouldercounty.org. And then you go into families, disease, COVID-19 and vaccines. Next, we have boards and commissions. Annual recruitment for the 2021 boards and commissions has closed for most of the boards or commissions. The city clerk's office is in the process of reviewing all applications to ensure applicants meet the requirements for the board or commission they applied for and is on schedule to have the application notebook posted online Monday, February 22nd. We do, however, have four boards and commissions that did not receive enough applications to proceed to the interview portion of recruitment. So we'll continue to accept applications through five o'clock on March 18th for the following boards. Boulder Junction Access District Parking and the same Boulder Junction Access District Travel Demand Management, then Beverage Licensing Authority and the Colorado Chautauqua Association Board. If you are interested in applying for one of these, please visit the link that is shown on the slide. And then another <coughs> um, advisory panel, the City and Excel Energy are seeking a representative group of community members to serve on the first Energy Partnership Advisory Panel. The panel will meet regularly to review and discuss energy issues and provide feedback on projects and programs arising from the partnership. The advisory panel will serve to connect the community to the new partnership by representing electricity and gas customers in Boulder in both residential and commercial sectors. The panel will review project proposals, gather perspectives on community impacts, and make recommendations to the partnership's oversight team. Interested members of the community are invited to learn more about the working group and apply at the um, link that is shown on the slide. The applications for the partnership advisory panel will close at five o'clock on February 26th. And with that, Alicia, I'll turn to you and see if you could call the roll, please. All right. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Brockett? Present. Friend? I'm here. Joseph? Present. Nagel? Here. Wetlick? Present. Wallach? Present. Weaver? Here. Yates. Here. And yeah. Present. Mayor, we have a quorum. Very good. Thank you, Alicia. <clears throat> and next, I'm going to ask for a motion to amend the agenda. Here are the items uh, that we would amend. We would add a declaration honoring Black History Month to the beginning of item 5A, the racial equity plan item. We would add item 6A, which is an update on CU South annexation negotiations. We would move item 8A, maintaining self and welcoming public spaces um, to item 8B. And we would move item 8B, which is the selection of city council finalists um, for the city attorney search committee. Um, and we will be nominating folks for that and confirming them tonight. So could I get a motion for amending the agenda? A moved. Second. Second. Okay, great. Thank you all. Is anyone opposed to amending the agenda? Great. Seeing none, that passes unanimously and we'll move on. So next we will go to open comment. And before we um, start taking open comment, I will turn again to 
Brenda to help us uh, remind us of the rules and guidelines for open comment. Great, thank you, Sam. Let me see if I can do a better job of sharing my screen this time. Can you see the rules currently on my screen? Yes, we're good? Okay, great. Um, so uh, thank you all for participating in public comment this evening. Uh, we do to keep our meetings safe and productive in this virtual space have a few rules that we ask that you be cooperative with. Um, we have this meeting called to order for the business of the city of Boulder. Any activities that disrupt that business are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited. We will tell you how many minutes at the beginning of each of our comment sections. No person, oh, lovely. That again. All right. Uh, no person may speak unless recognized by the mayor. And the chat function is disabled. There is a Q&A box to be used for technical questions for me only for help with the Zoom platform. We cannot use this function for, the con for questions about the content of the meeting. The host and individuals designated by the host are the only ones who may share their screen during the meeting this evening. Uh, no video. I'm sorry, I'm doing these all out of order. I'm a mess tonight, Sam. I apologize. No, no video will be permitted except by city officials, employees, and invited speakers or presenters. And Sam, the mayor, may um, enforce these rules by requesting that I mute anyone who is violating any of these rules. Another rule I skipped from slide one is that we do need you to be using your full and true name um, associated with your screen presence tonight. If your name does not currently show in your little box, please let me know and I am happy to rename you for you um, or you may rename yourself if you know how to do that. All right, mess as it was, I think we have covered all of the rules, Sam. Great. Thank you, Brenda. So we'll now go to open comment. And our first three commenters are Rosemary Hegarty, Brookie Gallagher, and Evan Rabbits. Rosemary? Rosemary, would you be able to un- Yes. Hi, my name is Rosemary Hegarty from South Boulder. I want to speak to you tonight about CU South. The recent transportation study by Fox Tuttle had numerous flaws. The first being that it was conducted at a time when CU and Boulder Valley Schools had shut down all in-person learning, so traffic was vastly decreased. Fox, Fox Tuttle did not accurately account for this drop in traffic when they used an October multiplier and applied it to November. Another huge flaw with this study was in not showing any increased traffic flow onto Moorhead Avenue. Part of the additional 7,000 daily vehicle trips that CU South will create will certainly impact Moorhead Avenue. It is also aggravating to hear city, the city and CU say that CU is donating this flood mitigation land to the city of Boulder. This flood land is a bargaining chip for CU to achieve its goal of annexation. If CU is donating the land, then why are the strings attached? The city is projected to spend at least 25 million of the total 66 to 99 million for preparing the land for CU's future development. Couldn't we use that 25 million to do flood work elsewhere in Boulder? Fraser Meadows, the only South Boulder neighborhood that will benefit from this flood mitigation is not the only ones facing huge flood concerns. Martin Acres also flooded badly. What about our other neighborhoods? While a true open space donation from CU to the city of Boulder, which this is not, would be wonderful, do we have money and open space budget for more rangers and rectifying the years of off-leash dogs impact on this land, especially the wetlands? Is there really a need for this CU development? College age students are decreasing and many colleges are trying to find creative ways to stay open because of anticipated decrease in student numbers. Has CU done any projections for student enrollment post COVID and with drop in US population of college age students? Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Next we have Brookie Gallagher, Evan Rabbits and Eric Tusi. Brookie. 
Uh, Brookie, I am promoting you to panelists temporarily because um, because the can you hear me? Can you. Yep. We can. Yes. All right, here I go. My name is Brookie Gallagher. I've lived in South Boulder for the past 13 years. Like the previous speaker, I'm deeply troubled by the recently released CU South development related traffic study. Presented by CU's contractor, Fox Tuttle, it contains at least several glaring problems which call into question the validity of the entire study. On page 11, Fox Tuttle states that traffic growth along the Table Mesa Drive corridor has been nearly flat over the past 20 years. My lived experience alone tells me this cannot be true. Looking at the historical data they used in drawing this conclusion, the numbers show an increase of over 30%. I wouldn't call that flat. They set up their graph with increments of 5,000 vehicles on the y-axis. These oversized increments are bound to yield a flat graph. Some might call this statistical malpractice. It was highly inappropriate for, C for the CU study to count South Boulder traffic the day after 46,000 people stopped traveling to schools in South Boulder because both CU and BVSD had just gone 100% remote. Fox Tuttle counted traffic in November 2020, the month most impacted by COVID, but they used the multiplier for the month least impacted by COVID, October. Some would call that statistical malpractice. If they use an extraordinarily low initial traffic count and use an incorrect multiplier, once they add their projected 7,000 additional vehicle trips per day, the ultimate number is going to appear far lower than it really will be. Decisions based on unsound data can be nothing but unsound themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Brookie. <clears throat> Next, we have Evan Rabbits, Eric Tusi, and Macon Coles. Evan? So, after three years of city staff trying to keep online petitions off the ballot, trying to switch us from online petitions to Denver's inferior tablet system, pretending that the city charter had to be changed to allow online petitions, a year after voters did just that, and after rejecting the offer of free software for online petitions under false pretenses, and instead spending $490,000 on an inferior system, online petitions are finally working, barely. As the city attorney told you in January, all the heartache caused the city manager city IT director and city clerk to leave their jobs. Now the city attorney is leaving. He tried to blame it on me, telling you the IT director left because I said she lied about why the free software was rejected. Ha! Ah, she stopped working for the city on January 22nd, 2020. I didn't begin work on the PowerPoint that proves she lied with audio recordings until January 28th, and I didn't make it public until February. Everyone can see the PowerPoint with its date at tinyurl.com slash petition story. That's tinyurl.com slash petition story. I can't imagine her lying unless she was told to, and that can only come from the city manager or city attorney. I can't imagine anyone under 40 or just having ethics will vote for you ever again, except council members Friend, Swetlick, and Brockett. The days of Boulder government being a lying, cheating, thieving, slandering, killing machine are over. Your beautiful evil is melting. Thank you, Evan. <clears throat> Next, we have Eric Tusi, Macon Coles, and Christopher Centeno. Eric? Eric should be able to speak shortly. Eric, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Sorry, I didn't see that. 
Thank you for being here tonight as publicly elected officials. Our neighborhood wants to especially thank council members that attended the Parks and Rec neighborhood Zooms last week and those of you that have actually come out to visit with us and witness the rural quiet of the reservoir in the evenings. We are asking city council to review and rewrite the restaurant lease so that it meets the requirements and parameters of the public input process. 2012 and 2014 Boulder Res master plans are baseline documents that outline the uses and limits of the res. The adjacent neighborhoods, like all communities, have community rights. Nature itself has rights and the master plan purports to protect many species that make the res their home. We are here tonight in response to unilateral negotiations by Parks and Rec involving the leasing out of the cafe space at the res. The historic operating hours of the res were altered and effectively zoning changes were made with the signing of the lease. Final operating hours and allowable alcohol service went far beyond initial RFP parameters. The, this lease changes the entire character of one of Boulder's best parks. It is one thing to have a sunset beer on the patio and be gone by 9 p.m. Quite another to have a vendor that is allowed to rent out our new facility for profit put on concerts and sell alcoholic drinks down, the, down to the water until midnight. This is actually what the current lease allows. It is not enough that the vendor does not sell drinks this year. The five-year lease allows alcohol-laden events such as concert, private parties, and amplified music until midnight any night of the year. It needs to be changed now before financial commitments are made. 2012 master plan specifically states endeavor to be a good neighbor to adjacent properties. It's time to be a good neighbor. We want representation in developing the good neighbor agreement that Parks and Recs brought up last week. We would be happy to have a nonprofit vendor such as Bridge House run the cafe and provide catering to daily- Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. This would be a service to the entire community. Thank you. Community-based solution. Eric, thank you. Your time is up, sorry. Next, we have Macon Coles, Chris Centeno, and Susan Peterson. Macon? My name is Macon Coles, 1726 Mapleton Avenue. I want to offer some thoughts on the selection of a new city manager that relate to that manager's experience in the area of housing. Community progress about housing, whether through area plans or ADU reform, or by means of specific projects like Alpine Balsam or the Armory site is occurring at a slow and very costly pace, such that each year our efforts are mocked by the continuing and urgent need to provide housing at a price point within reach of teachers, nurses, wait staff, retail workers, grocery store clerks, frontline people who have kept the economy running while fortunate Boulderites safely shelter in place. We live in a place where housing is so difficult for young people who are on their own. We might as well post a sign at the entrance to the city that says this community is limited to people who are 50 years of age or older. The number of cash buyers competing for housing ensures that most buyers of real estate are wealthy, older white people, making the town more and more a monoculture. How are we going to solve this? If cities do not do it on their own, as Minneapolis has done in permitting duplexes and triplexes by right in every single family zoned district, state legislatures increasingly are considering imposing housing requirements on cities as Oregon has done, for example. It is important when council selects the next city manager that that person have the skill and experience to lead the city to achieve solutions to the housing crisis, to implement the principles articulated by council and then implement them skillfully with planning staff. To achieve solutions will also require council to clearly articulate those principles and not allow simply a drift from plan to plan and project to project. There's a lot of work to be done and we all need to pull together to do it. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> Next we have Christopher Centeno, Susan Peterson, and James Morris. Christopher? I don't see Christopher on the list, Sam, so we'll go with Susan. Christopher, if you are here and you are appearing under a different name, please let me know in the Q&A box so that we know that you're here. 
Thank you. I'll unmute Susan now. Susan, you should be able to unmute. Got it. Just got it. Thanks. Hi, my name is Susan Peterson. I'm a private citizen. I am a member of the Environmental Advisory Board, but I'm speaking to you on my own behalf with regard to the city manager selection. Given that we're in a climate emergency, we must give a high priority to hiring a city manager who not only prioritizes environmental action, but who has dem a demonstrated track record in taking action to reduce climate impacts and in taking action to address the impacts of the climate emergency in which we find ourselves. Globally and right here in Boulder, it's the biggest crisis we face. I respectfully request the city council put a high priority on experience in taking environmental action when hiring our new city manager. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Next, we have James Morris, Leslie Glustrom, and Fred Tomlin. James? Hey, I'm, I'm Jim Morris. Please continue Boulder's leadership in confronting global warming. The ongoing fracking and excels burning of coal and natural gas for electricity are major threats to people, wildlife, and ecosystem. Boulder has prodded Excel to do more renewable energy. Boulder pushes advances in transportation, housing, efficiency, insulation, and inno innovation. Please continue to lead the organizing to reduce global warming. Also, Please withdraw from the Rocky Mountain Greenway. There are hot spots of plutonium contamination there at the nuclear weapons plant site. And you could find more details at the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center links and from the info they sent. There's lots of plutonium, both deep under the ground and both being pushed by air and by water. Finally, I oppose the CU South development. It, it's happening in a wetlands. It was supposed to be open space. It requires millions of dollars worth of dirt to be filled to elevate CU's buildings. It was done inappropriately and almost fraudulently by secretly trying to have CU, because it's exempt from city and county regulations, be able to go ahead and buy this property that was supposed to be open space. So thank you all for the hard work you do. It must be really difficult for you to deal with so many issues and so many people. And I appreciate you trying to deal with it, especially those of you who sort of try and think of longer term things like wildlife and ecosystems. Thanks again, bye. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> and Brenda, I'll turn to you and see if you wanna check on the person on the phone. Great, thank you, Sam. Yes, we do have one caller who joined us by phone um, and I am no longer seeing that number. That's the way it always works, isn't it? Uh, sure. So I think we're all good. Thank you, Sam. Yep. Next, we have Leslie Glustrom, Fred Tomlin, and David Takahashi. Leslie? Uh, I think we actually had Lucas Schaefer next. Oh, okay. I have them as withdrawing on my, sorry about that. My list has Lucas Schaefer withdrawing. Is Lucas in the meeting? Lucas is in the meeting. Perfect. Let's hear from Lucas. Apologies for that, Lucas. I have bad information. Lucas, you should be able to unmute. Lucas, you should be able to unmute. Oh, Hello? I, I am also getting, yep. We can hear you, Lucas. I'm terribly sorry. There was a mix up. I, I meant to sign up for the public hearing section, which I did, and I, I, I didn't get a chance to take my name off the open comment list. Sorry for the sorry for that. Thanks Thank so you, much. Lucas. Appreciate it. So next we have Leslie Glustrom, Fred Tomlin, and David Takahashi. Leslie. Good evening, Council. Leslie Glustrom. I live in Boulder. And thank you, as always, for the incredible amount of work you do for our community. And right now, going through the searches for the, the city manager and the city attorney, 
uh, the long interviews. I know it adds a lot of work on top of a lot of work. So thank you so very much. It's been a wild year and you've all been absolutely heroic. So really appreciate it. Obviously we don't always agree. That's not the point. The point is you're working incredibly hard and, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, I think in terms of the city manager, you might guess that I would like to make sure that we really use a strong filter on climate. There are many, many parts of the job we all know. Um, I was seeing this afternoon is a little bit like getting married. You would never get married to somebody after like two hours of interview and you know then a Zoom meeting with this or that. So it, I think it requires extra care and extra discernment on your part because this is, I think you understand the most important position probably in the city. So it'll determine so many things about how we move forward. On climate, I just wanted, just in case the candidates are listening, I wanted to remind the community and the candidates that we have taxed ourselves six times to address climate. 2006, the cap tax, 2011, 13, and 17 for the utility occupation tax. 2015, we upped the climate action plan tax. And then I think most stunningly in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, we had 31,751 people in this community vote to tax themselves to continue and expand our climate programs. That was 56.96% of the vote, which I think we can call 57%. There are not many communities willing to do that. And I think the next city manager should recognize that. I would love if they had a track record, but if not, please make sure that they have both a desire and a determination ask some hard questions. Anybody can say, sure, I care about climate, but ask some tough questions and kind of try to probe them. Again, I really appreciate everything you all do. And uh, I do look forward to meeting our new city manager. So thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Next, Fred Tomlin, David Takahashi and Ryan Harwood. Fred? I do not see Fred on our attendee list. Uh, so I will move to David Takahashi. Good evening, Envis envisioning our new city manager. Our new city manager will be inheriting the challenge of 300 years of misguided waste disposal into earth systems. As a result, we experience wildfires along the front range, flooding of biblical proportions. And around us, we have a torched earth derechos and a polar vortex freezing Texas wind turbines. If you think that COVID is bad, COVID is actually climate disruption on training wheels. When hired, she will be the liaison between the public and you, our council taskmasters. She will be seasoned enough to know that the public will be here after council members come and go. She will be steeped in crisis management and know that when things come unraveled, she will be counting on the community fabric to flex with the uncertainty of a relentless nature unleashed. She will appreciate how the general public stepped up to Katrina. She will have studied the lessons from the heat wave in Chicago. She may have experienced the living hell of a runaway wildfire and she will have an appreciation that in these uncertain times, she must count on bringing all hands on deck, each in their appropriate time. She will be a stage director and the stage will be our instable climate reaching unimaginable tipping points. She will understand that our current predicament and the sustainable world prescribed by our comp plan will require some creative transitionally complex dance steps. She will understand that putting band-aids on the symptoms is going to be necessary. And she will understand that she needs to walk a bit upstream and begin engaging the root causes of this unstable time. She will be- Thank, thank you, David. I'm sorry, your time is up. Appreciate okay. your comments. Right. Thank you, everyone. Next, we have Ryan Harwood, Jan Burton, and Lynn Siegel. Ryan?
Brian, you should be able to unmute. Awesome. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Yeah, this is Ryan from SAFE. Uh, this weekend, while the Boulder Police Department Sorry about that, Ryan. Let me get you back on. You are back on. You should be able to unmute again, Ryan. Ryan, are you there? My apologies. Try again. Sorry, Sam, I can't be able, I can't seem to get him back in. I see him. Can you unmute him? I, I have tried multiple times. We may be fighting our buttons here. Well, I tell you what, why don't we move on and we'll come back to Ryan. Why don't you work with him in the Q&A or the chat? And um, next we have Jan Burton, Lynn Siegel, and Roger Piozek. Jan, and I think Jan might be here under the Open Boulder name. I've gotten her name changed, so we're all Good. set. Thank you. Well, Good evening, Council and Mayor Weaver. Thank you for your work during these difficult times. Perhaps the most important decision you will make during your tenure on council is the selection of our next city manager. There are so many interest areas and priorities for a city our size. The climate, racial equity, housing and transportation, the arts, and more. I would urge you to consider more broad criteria in choosing the next chief administrative officer of the city of Boulder. A candidate, a candidate with leadership skills, vision, and proven success in community engagement can solve many problems with council support and policy decisions. Today, millions of dollars being spent on community process, yet many in the community don't feel their voices are heard. Dedicated boards and commission members often do not feel staff has an open mind to listening to their points before direction is taken and staffers leading community engagement are sometimes viewed as a part of the city's communications machine. The Tipton report pointed to dissension and mistrust within the city's own departments and staff members. Fortunately, we have the building blocks to solve many of these problems. For example, a detailed report by the Public Participation Working Group was approved unanimously by council in June of 2017 when I was on council, but it never got properly implemented. As you develop your criteria for the selection of our next chief administrator, please consider his or her leadership skills, ability to resolve conflict and experience and success in engaging the public in a proactive, inclusive manner. This can be a difference maker for the city of Boulder in the immediate and long-term future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. <clears throat> Next, we will go back, and I believe we have uh, Christopher Centeno in the meeting now. We do. Christopher, you should be able to unmute, and then Ryan Harwood will try you again after Mr. Centeno. Christopher, can you unmute? Yes, thank you. Uh, Great. So I want to thank the City Council for keeping our parks uh, usable. Uh, I really appreciate the ability now to see kids playing in the parks. Uh, that, that really wasn't the case just a month ago. Uh, recently took a walk down at the library. There were kids playing again by the library, parents. Uh, it was great to see. So thank you for your hard work there. Uh, I've also been informed that there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a parking lot permanent encampment that is planned currently at a church. Um, I don't know if that's a, a real project. Uh, the person discussing it uh, said it was. So uh, that brings up a number of different issues if that's the case. One issue would be how do you manage this? How do you deal with the, the crime aspect <clears throat> that's already been discussed by the police chief then obviously, how do you uh, police <clears throat> this type of encampment? So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Chris. Give me just a moment here. I lost, are we going to try Ryan now? Let's try Ryan now. 
Ryan, you. Yeah, I'm here. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. My fault. Okie dokie. Um, yeah, this is Ryan from SAFE. Uh, this weekend, while the Boulder Police Department was solving riddles, SAFE Boulder sought to raise funds to provide emergency shelter in hotels to people experiencing homelessness. We ended up raising over $10,000, way more than we expected, in a few short days from individual donations and collaborated with Boulder Valley Mutual Aid, Boulder County Democratic Socialists of America, and Comrade Co-op in Denver to provide shelter for 78 people for a collective total of 159 warm nights across Boulder, Lafayette, and Denver. This group included many intersectionally marginalized people, including elders, people of color, LGBTQ people, disabled and chronically ill people, families, people banned from the shelter, people without IDs, and people suffering from frostbite. I'd like to tell you a little, more, a little bit more about some of these folks. Justin is a young man who stayed at the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless on Saturday, but was not able to stay another night because this council enacted a rule that requires him to go through coordinated, coordinated entry to stay more than one night. Unfortunately, coordinated entry is closed on the weekends, so he couldn't stay at the shelter on Sunday when it was below zero. Your decisions have consequences, and that decision resulted in a young man with only lightweight winter gear being left out in sub-zero temperatures, which, as you very well know from the man who died on Thursday, can be fatal. One of our friends we got a room for has cancer. She's getting a blood transfusion as we speak, and her doctor told her she needs to stay off the streets for a few days as part of her recovery. Unfortunately, she cannot stay at the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless because she attempted to access services last year, but hadn't lived in Boulder for six months prior. So she is now banned from services for two years. Why this arbitrary, unnecessary cruelty to a homeless cancer patient while shelter beds are empty? Because of decisions made by this council at the recommendation of city staff. I have many more horror stories from this weekend, but I wanted to give you a brief update on the great work you all are doing in criminalizing homelessness and facilitating human suffering. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> Next, we have Lynn Siegel, Roger Piozak, and Giselle Herzfeld. Lynn? I do not see Lynn in the meeting at the moment. Lynn, if you're here under a different name, please let me know in the Q&A box. Instead, we will go to Roger. Roger, you should be able to unmute now. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Council members, Mayor Weaver, thank you for your time tonight. My name is Roger Pozak and I live with my family in the Valhalla neighborhood near the Boulder Reservoir. As you may know, last week, Josh Diner withdrew his application for a liquor license at the Boulder Reservoir facility. Of the 100 petitions that Josh sent out to neighbors in a one mile radius, 55 were filled out <clears throat> and returned to the BLA. And every single one of them stated no need and no desire for a liquor license at the reservoir. There were also dozens of other petitions sent from neighbors and they too were overwhelmingly negative toward a liquor license. There were even residents in the city of Boulder that sent in emails in opposition. How did we get here? Let me explain. <clears throat> the City of Boulder Parks and Recreation used a lease negotiated with Josh Diner to backdoor extended operating hours and in private parties with alcohol at the reservoir facility without public knowledge. That's how it happened. Once the public found out about these, the lease, we mobilized by writing letters to City Council, speaking at City Council meetings, inviting City Council members to our neighborhood writing letters to the Daily Camera, all to get the lease pulled up for review and change. Finally, through the BLA process, we were heard, no desire, no need for a liquor license at the reservoir. <clears throat> I need five city council members to join me to pull up the lease and make changes. The public does not want more alcohol and does not want late night hours at the res. Let's move forward and focus on what people do want and desire. You have my contact info, I'd be happy to help. One last thing, <clears throat> I ask you, Mayor Weaver, the way the lease was used to circumvent public input, is that how you want the city of Boulder to operate? Backroom deals being made? I may be wrong about you, Sam, but I don't think that's what you want. Policies, procedures for public participation are there for a reason, and that is to avoid the huge mess that we just went through. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Next we have Giselle Herzfeld, 
um, Annie LePay and Misha Tour. And I'll just say before we move on that I believe Annie LePay has withdrawn, but um, Giselle, you're up next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm speaking on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center, and I have three topics I would like to draw attention to today. The first is the Rocky Mountain Greenway. We continue to voice the concerns of the public regarding the health and safety hazards of allowing the public to recreate on Rocky Flats, particularly via a mountain biking trail intended to go around the most contaminated part of the EPA Superfund site. While we acknowledge and understand that the Boulder City Council has a lot on its plate right now, we strongly urge the City Council to conduct a study session prior to finalizing any decision regarding the City of Boulder's continued participation in this project. Secondly, we are here to stand in solidarity with our allies in the community who are speaking out about the tremendous amount of work that needs to be done to address issues of racial inequality in our community. We would particularly like to voice our concern regarding the continued disproportionate arrests of people of color in Boulder, as well as the increased amount of our city's budget that has been allocated to policing. This is especially unacceptable when we compare our city's 2021 policing budget of 36.8 million to the combined amount of city funds being allocated to housing and human services, library and arts, communication and engagement, totaling 18.3 million. That's half as much as the city's police budget. We believe that police funds should be reduced and reallocated to programs and services that help our communities to attain social and financial security and stability. And that this is very necessary conversation to have if we ever want to attain true justice and equity. Lastly, we want to thank our allies who have continued to be strong advocates in our community for the need for the city to do more to help our unhoused neighbors. Temperatures dropped below zero this past weekend, and it is our moral responsibility to do whatever it takes to ensure that every unhoused person has a safe, warm place to go, especially when temperatures are this dangerously cold. Not having a home should never be a crime punishable by death. When we let people freeze to death, we are failing in our moral duty to protect those who are the most vulnerable. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you, Giselle. <clears throat> Next, we have Misha Tour and Brad Siegel. Misha? I do not see Misha on the list, so we'll go ahead to Brad. Um, Fred Tomlin, Lynn Siegel, or Misha Tour, if you are here under a different name, please let me know in the Q&A so that we can get you um, in before we end open comment. And Brad, I will go ahead and unmute you now. You should be able to unmute, Brad. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, I'm Brad D. Siegel, a 40-year Boulder resident from South Boulder. Um, thanks for the opportunity to come in. I want to thank you all for the hard work you do. It's a tough job. My comments basically reinforce previous uh, commentary regarding a need for a city manager with strong climate abilities, strong climate remediation abilities and motivation. As noted in previous comments, climate is probably our highest long-term priority. Obviously, we have lots of local priorities that need uh, attention from a city manager. We have to have someone who can multitask. We have housing issues, local economy, safety, equity, environment, transportation, floodplain management, growth. It goes on and on. But none of this is going to mean a hill of beans if we don't solve the climate deal. And we all know that. Uh, now, we need to make sure that the city manager does. And we'll work on this. And some of the previous speakers have talked about that, especially Leslie. Uh, COVID is huge, for example, and you might notice how much trouble we've had with that over the last year. It's uh, been terrible for our economy, our health, our uh, quality of life. This is nothing compared to what climate change is going to be, and I know you all know this, but let's make sure we get someone who can work on this issue really with some good skills. As per my email comments I sent to you on Friday, finalists must be, have demonstrated skills and motivation, not just talk. It's got to be a walk. We're moving into a very tricky period right now. We're in an inflection point. We've got a new deal going on. And uh, this person's gonna have to be able to work with regulators like the PUC, Excel, state legislators, federal opportunities can't just be going through the motions. Uh, we're trying to get to 100% renewables by 2030. It won't be easy. It's the right thing to do. And we have a strong mandate from voters. Remember 54,000 people on both sides of the of the franchise issue wanted this to happen. So let's make it happen. As I said in my email, it'll be a lot easier if we have the right person to lead us. Uh, thanks a lot for listening and best of luck with this difficult selection. 
Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> and with that, we will bring open comment to a close and I will turn to staff and see if staff has any uh, comments or feedback. Thanks, Sam. Good evening, council members. Just one item for me, which is um, this, several speakers that uh, talked about the city manager selection process. There is uh, an opportunity for community members to meet the candidates. Uh, and if you go to the city website and click on the calendar, uh, you can find that item on the calendar where you can sign up to receive the link uh, for the meeting, as well as uh, you can submit questions in advance of that meeting if you'd like to. So uh, that's the only item for me tonight. Thank you, Chris. Tom? Uh, thank you, Sam. I do not have anything else. Very good. And turning to council, I see Rachel and Aaron. Rachel? Thanks, Sam. Um, I just had a couple follow-up questions about a couple of uh, speakers' questions on homelessness. Um, I was concerned about coordinated entry being closed on Sunday. I wanted to double check. Is that is that how things are working? Because that certainly is problematic. So that was one. And then number two, I wanted um, to see, I, I would think that somebody with um, cancer could maybe stay um, at the CRC right now. So I wanted to know if that's true. And if so, if we can better um, communicate that to the community and people who might need um, need a, a more medical place to stay. Thank you, Rachel. I see Kurt here. Kurt, would you like to respond? Uh, good evening, Council. Kurt Fernhaber, Director of Housing and Human Services. Um, so coordinated entry, um, uh, as the speaker mentioned, you get sort of a, a free night and then um, you need to um, go to coordinated entry. If coordinated entry hadn't been open during the time um, then they, they um, give you a pass on that. So if you're there on the weekend and coordinated entry isn't open, you were there the night before, then they'll, they'll give you a pass. Um, as far as the individual um, with cancer, um, so originally you're correct, the CRC um, uh, earlier in 2020, we were using for individuals that weren't necessarily COVID positive, but needed to um, either stay isolated or um, recover from some sort of serious illness. We haven't done that in the last couple of months because we've had so many, um, we might have a, we've had a much larger number of positives um, staying at the, at the CRC. However, our, the hotel program, um, since the season opened the 1st of October, um, is we have 25 rooms every night and those rooms are actually targeted for individuals um, who have some either chronic condition or are elderly or are at some risk, health risk um, related to COVID. Someone with a, a condition as described by that speaker would be well-placed. Um, and it's actually designed for individuals like that um, in, the, in the hotel rooms, which we have available every night. Uh, thanks for that clarification. So it might be worth I don't know, checking in with the shelter about how well we're communicating. I know we don't run the shelter, but if people could have had places to stay that night and, and weren't able to, that's um, that's unsafe and unfortunate. And then one other question, um, I somebody asked about safe parking and wanted to ask Tom, like if a uh, church and nonprofit want to run a um, safe parking or sanctioned encampment, the city doesn't have any say over that. Is that correct? Like we can't, um, other than if, if something arose, you know, we would respond to it, but is it accurate that yeah. it's not really a jurisdiction? With that, Carl, with that added bit at the end there, um, this, this, it doesn't violate our camping ordinance for someone while allow camping on their own property, uh, but there could be other ordinance violations that we would obviously respond to. Thanks. Is that it, Rachel? Very good. Aaron? Uh, thanks, Rachel. I asked my question about coordinated entry. Appreciate that answer, Kurt. Um, but just while I got the floor, uh, Chris, thanks for announcing the city manager event. Just wanted to, I don't believe you mentioned the date and time. That's going to be uh, Thursday, the 25th, from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. So I hope lots of community members can come join us for a question and answer session with candidates. Great. Thank you for that, Aaron. <clears throat> Seeing no other hands, I will close open comment then and turn back to Alicia. All right, sir. 
Our next item on our agenda is the consent agenda, which is items A through J. Very good. And I will turn to council and see if there are any questions or comment or a motion for passing the consent agenda. Uh, Mark. All right. Um, I have a question concerning the supplemental appropriation uh, with respect to uh, newer uh, legal representation. Um, as I read this, the, the memo on it, uh, it appears that there's a possibility that we will not be standing up the tax structure to collect funds for newer until 2022. Um, and I was a, you know, an advocate of putting funds up in advance of the tax collections in order to um, get things going. Uh, but my question is, um, how will the appropriation of a million thirty thousand dollars this year be repaid um, if, in fact, we're not um, implementing the tax until 2022? Thanks, Mark, for that question. Cara Skinner from our finance department is here. Hi, okay. thank you. Cara Skinner, assistant director of finance. Can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. So um, we are still working out what mechanism we're going to use to collect this tax. And if, in fact, we don't start collecting the tax um, until 2022, between now and the regularly scheduled ATB in May, adjustment to base, in May, we will devise a recommended repayment plan for council's consideration to the general fund. And it might be over two years or three years or something like that. But um, so that's what we're gonna determine the mechanism first, which might result in us generating some tax revenue during 2021. And if that's not true, we will come back to you with that repayment plan. Okay, um, so it, it's not simply an appropriation, It's an appropriation with the expectation of repayment. Correct. Okay, thank you, you've answered my mm -hmm. question. Thank you, Mark, uh, Rachel and Bob. Rachel? Yeah, I had a couple of questions on um, agenda item H, landmarking designation for 90 Arapaho. And with landmarks, I, I know there's, you know, the quasi-judicial, so I'm not sure when the right time to ask questions is, if it's now or at the next hearing. So that's my first question. What what am I, um, what can I ask about tonight? You can go ahead and ask questions and we'll just put them as, make them make sure the answers are part of the public record. Okay, so thanks for that. Um, it, I was a little bit confused in the application, like it was in, initially applied for in 2017. So I was wondering why it took so long, whether it's the um, owner who applied in 2017 is the owner now and do we still is this still um an owner uh requested landmarking so that's kind of two questions who's who's requesting it and why the delay um and is it still operating as a motel and then in 2018 there were some pictures of showing um either a request or an approval for sort of rehabilitation and i wasn't sure did that happen um is that on the table? Like, where is that? Um, and then kind of jumping, this is a more broad, maybe philosophical question. Um, and I don't know if Tom can answer it or not, but if I jump ahead on the agenda, I think we're gonna pass the racial equity plan tonight. And I wonder like, how does something like landmarking going to sync with racial equity plan goals um, and, and broadly with uh, transportation, TMP goals and housing goals. Um, except I'm looking at something like this and um, you know, I see landmarking a single story building with a lot of parking. Um, I just wanna know how does that sync up with our other goals and when do we look at that in a landmarking um, application? How do we take that into account in these reviews? So those are my questions. So, so Rachel, let me ask you a question about your questions. Is it okay if we um, take those forward and answer them the night of the hearing? I think so, yeah. Okay, super. So I will assume, Chris, that someone from staff has got those questions and if not, okay, super. 
All right, Rachel, thank you. Anything else? Okay, Bob? <clears throat> Two unrelated items. One was the one that Mark raised and Mark, thank you for asking the question. Cara, can I just wanna make sure I fully understand your answer to Mark? Um, and so um, I understand that we're gonna allocate the money now, which I'm fine with, but um, will the tax, even if the tax is not collected until later this year or even in 2022, will it be retroactive to January 1? In other words, will we be collecting tax for all of 2021 from the applicable taxpayers eventually? Yes, and, and what that population exactly looks like is still under discussion too. But yes, we're anticipating that the effective date of the tax would be uh, 2021. So. Great. So, so for example, if we, don't, if we administratively, we need till 2022 to kind of get this in place, it's possible that some of the relevant taxpayers might um, make a double payment for 2021 and 2022 or something like that. Is that right? Potentially, but I, I think not. I think the way that the, once, it, once the, um, they likely will only make one payment each year. It's just, it might be in arrears. So they I may see. pay in 2022 for 21, pay in 2023 for 2022. I got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, completely unrelated to that, I want to make a comment on 3F. Um, there was a request by the uh, Council Agenda Committee a few weeks ago for anyone interested in serving on the uh, subcommittee for the attorney, city attorney recruitment. I raised my hand as did Mark, as did Rachel. Um, it occurs to me that a committee of three is a little awkward, might be entirely nimble. And I have tremendous confidence in Mark and Rachel to do that. So I'm gonna withdraw my, um, my request to serve on that committee. And I would uh, support 3F if we limit it to uh, Mark and Rachel. Super. Thank you very much, Bob. <clears throat> Rachel, is your hand a leftover or new? It's new. I just okay. wanted to um, thank Bob for that. He has uh, stepped out of the way for me to be on at least one other committee, CU South, and um, I appreciate that that he um, makes room in that way. So thank you, Bob. Thank you, Rachel. And then Tom, I'll turn to you. Did you have uh, alternate motion language for this? I'm trying to recall. Yes, Sam, I did. I posted it on hotline today and I can read that if that's convenient. I think that would be good. Thank you. I'm just pulling it up now. Uh, motion to create a city attorney recruitment subcommittee pursuant to charter section nine with all authority provided there under and to appoint council members friend and Wallach to that committee and to ratify any actions taken between February 2nd, 2021 and the present. Very good. So I would entertain a motion to amend the consent agenda to replace uh, item F with what Tom just put out there. Aaron? Go ahead and move the consent agenda, uh, except with 3F changed to the language that Tom just used. Thank you, Aaron. Bob? We'll second that. Very good. So we have a motion and a second on the consent agenda as amended. Alicia, I believe this is a show of hands. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. And Tom, um, Bob, I see your hand still up. Is that a leftover? Leftover. Super. Sam, so this, Sam, this is a roll call. Item J is a second reading. Okay. Beautiful. Oh, thank you, Tom. Thank you for catching that, Tom. So let's do a roll call vote, Alicia. Friday, Council Member Swetnick. Aye. Wallach. Aye. Weaver. Aye. Gates. Yes. Young. Yes. Brockett. Aye. Friend. Yes. Joseph. Yes. Nagel. Aye. The consent agenda is approved unanimously, sir. Excellent. As amended. As amended, thank you. All right, our next item is item four, call up check-in. Item A is a consideration of a proposal to add a deck and replace windows at rear, replace chimney and paint brick at 1740 Sunset Boulevard, an individual landmark, HIS 2020-00339. 
Thank you, Alicia. Um, council, any interest in calling this up? Seeing none, I think we're ready to move on, Alicia. Thank you, sir. Our next item is the public hearings. Item A, declaration honoring Black History Month to be presented by Councilmember Friend and consideration of a motion to adopt the racial equity plan and its supporting goals, strategies, activities, and outcomes. Great, I think Chris, this is over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Uh, and um, we're really excited to bring this item forward to Central tonight. Uh, before I turn it over to Amy Kane and Ryan Hanschen and Rachel for the declaration, uh, I just wanna share that uh, this is another step in, in the city's journey to uh, the in the work that we're doing related to racial equity. Uh, and uh, I just wanna appreciate uh, Amy's leadership uh, on this item, as well as uh, that of the entire team. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Amy. Thank you, Chris. That was really sweet. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much, Council, for having us back yet again to discuss the consideration of adoption of the city's first racial equity plan. I'm hoping that the PowerPoint can be pulled up if that hasn't happened already. Excellent. There it is. There it is, yay. Um, so with that, <clears throat> our planning team was intentional in bringing the plan to you for adoption during the month of February to align with Black History Month. This was planned out last year when we were gearing up to um, start meeting with a racial equity engagement working group. So February is a month to recognize and celebrate the too often ignored and underrepresented accomplishments of Black Americans in every aspect of American history. This is a time for all of us to not only reflect on history and the accomplishes, accomplishments of so many who have laid down their lives and made numerous sacrifices for freedom, but it is also an opportunity for you to recommit to dismantling institutional and systemic barriers that prevent us from truly having a country committed to liberty and justice for all. Adoption of the racial equity plan tonight is your opportunity to continue your commitment to advance racial equity as outlined in resolution 1275. The racial equity plan before you is not perfect by any means, but it is a start. This racial equity plan represents a milestone for our city government and community in the work to advance racial equity. This touchstone document reflects significant community input heard in recent years and strategizes steps that the city must take to eliminate systemic and institutional racism in its policies, practices, and financial decisions. This initial racial equity plan is a necessary next step in this vital work. Some of this work is already underway and represents small steps in what will certainly be a long iterative journey. We fully acknowledge that achieving the long-term outcomes included in this plan will not be easy and that substantial effort over the next three years and beyond will be needed to further address racism within our city operations. We are immensely grateful for the institutional partners and community members who have been instrumental in shaping this racial equity plan through contri contributing their lived experience and perspective, identifying areas of most significant impact and strategizing how to move the needle and advancing racial equity across our community. We appreciate your partnership and accountability as we move forward with this crucial racial equity work. But before we move forward with our presentation about the draft racial or the racial equity plan, <laughs> I want to step back so our colleague and council member Rachel Friend can read and propose adoption of a declaration about Black History Month. Next slide. We can wait on that. Rachel, you want to go? Yeah, thanks so much, Amy. And I also want to thank um, Taylor Ryman, who worked so hard putting this together and always does great research for city council declarations. So thank you to Taylor if you're watching. Okay, um, the declaration is as follows. Black History Month, February 16th, 2021. The origin of Black History Month began in 1915, half a century after the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States. The month of celebration and honor grew out of Negro History Week, which was created by Carter G. Woodson and other founding members, members of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. 
The second week in February was chosen for its overlap with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Fre Frederick Douglass. With the civil rights movement and a growing awareness of black identity, Black History Month or National African American History Month evolved to an annual celebration of achievements by black Americans and a time for recognizing the central role of African Americans in US history. This year's theme for Black History Month recognizes black family representation, identity and diversity and explores the African diaspora, the spread of black families across the United States centuries of this forced migration is most notably traced back to the Atlantic slave trade and the enslavement of Africans and their descendants in the Americas. Despite the historic atrocities and continued inequities faced by black Americans, their contributions hail from all, walk, all walks of life and have made unforgettable marks in our nation as artists, scientists, educators, entrepreneurs, influential thinkers, members of the faith community, athletes and civic leaders and are reflected in the greatness of our community. We, the City Council of the City of Boulder, Colorado, declare February 2021 as Black History Month and encourage everyone in the community to join in honoring and celebrating by seeking out and taking in Black culture and history, supporting Black-owned businesses, and taking time to reflect on what Black history means to each of, the, each of us this month and all year. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And I'm just going to jump in here and point out to the public that um, when we take open comment, please comment on whether you think we should adopt this as council or not. So we will be making a motion, I expect, at the end to adopt it. And if any commenters have an interest in this, we'll hear what you have to say at a, at a public hearing on this. Amy, I think back to you. Sam? Yes, Jenny. Before you go to Amy, I just wanted to um, to add, and I just wanted to thank Rachel for this um, declaration and also the rest of council as well. And I just wanted to add um, for people in the community who are looking for, I guess, as mentioned, Rachel, I, I mean, as Rachel mentioned, for something substantive as it relates to uh, Black History Month, I just wanted to share that I've been invited to an event that's happening on the 27th of this month. And it's called, uh, it's by the Executive Committee for African-American Cultural Events. And it will be, it will, which will be holding their 2021 Boulder, Pub Boulder County Black History Celebration. The event will premiere on YouTube on February 27th, as I mentioned, at 6.30. This year it's virtual, so everyone in the community can participate. The celebration will highlight and reflect on contribution of countless African-American men and women in our country. It's free for everyone, anyone can participate. And if you need more information from someone in the community, there's this lady called Madeline uh, Strong Woodley and her phone number is 720-841-1654. Thank you, Junie. Okay, Amy, I think back to you. Cool, Judy, thank you for that information. That's really exciting. Um, and Rachel, thank you so much for that declaration. You read it beautifully. Um, so my name is Amy Kane and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I identify as a white cisgender female and I have been working with community and staff team members in our organization since just working to create this plan. My passion lies with this critical work and breaking down barriers that exist for black, brown and indigenous people who have his been historically excluded from government since our democracy began. And with that, I'm gonna ask my colleague Ryan to introduce himself, please. Good evening, council. My name is Ryan Hanchen. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a white cisgender man and I'm dedicated to strengthening our democracy by access to meaningful and inclusive community engagement that shapes city decision-making. Next slide, please. So since the last time we were here in December, we have done a number of edits to the original draft of this plan. And tonight we're here to address the feedback from our last time together to do a deeper dive in the accountability measures of the plan as requested, and to utilize this time as an opportunity to begin closing the loop with community who have been instrumental in this work. 
Next slide, please. So the last time that we were here, you all provided comments and questions, which I would like to address at this time. Council suggested increased acknowledgement of the, contrib the contributions of Jane Brodingham, former city manager, and Tanya Angie, former deputy city manager, as they were instrumental in bringing this work and this programming to the city of Boulder. After discussion amongst our team members, it was determined that this work was accomplished because of the contributions of so many, including community members, and giving additional real estate to two white women felt incongruent with what we were trying to achieve. Additionally, knowing the commitment to this work that both Jane and Tanya have, we feel that ultimately they would agree with this decision. So another request was to include the raw numbers in the census data if possible. And so as you all know, the most recent census data um, from 2020 has yet to be released. So the team felt like this was an area where we would like to focus. And once that is, information is available, we can add that as an update to the plan at an upcoming council meeting. There was also a lot of questions about providing more thought and inclusion of the immigrant population. And so while we are focusing our en energy on immigrant populations, as mentioned by the equity community connectors and residents at the council retreat, and as our membership with the Cities for Action. So Cities for Action is a coalition of nearly 200 US mayors and county executives who advocate for pro-immigrant federal policies and launching innovative, inclusive programs and policies at the local level. I participate in their monthly meetings as well as pop-up meetings as relevant information is being discussed nationally. For example, in planning for COVID-19 vaccination distribution and communication that is, going, that is critical for immigrant populations. Another question that we had was really around data disaggregation. As we mentioned this in the accountability section of the updated plan, and this really also plans for collecting some of that baseline data. So on page 24 of the plan itself, you will see a simplified version of our logic model with short-term outcomes. And collecting and analyzing meaningful data is a key area where we need to not only collect relevant data disaggregated by race and ethnicity, but we aim to coordinate data systems to understand and track needs and impacts. So as you can all well imagine, this is going to be a huge lift, um, but it's critical to our work ahead and necessary for everything that we're trying to accomplish. So Mark, this one is for you. This is about fixing our typos. And we went through the plan with a fine tooth comb and with every review, we do find another typo. Um, so we also had members of the community who were diligent in assisting us with their feedback. And for that, we were hugely grateful. And yet today, we still identified some additional typos, which we will be collecting and, and uh, correcting as soon as our design colleague is back in the office. So for those of you who have already attended our bias and microaggression workshop, you all know that we celebrate our mistakes and that we also take action on them and move forward. Um, it's really important that, and we do believe that calling people in in order to change hearts and minds is necessary to this work. And so we won't be calling out our colleagues in our mistakes. So thank you for that. If I can have the next slide, please. There was a request for more concrete actions. And so we hope that you see in the plan under the goals and strategies, individual action items that are outlined in addition to those that are outlined in the very extensive detailed logic model. We also wanna leave a little bit of space for or action items that we have yet to identify that will help support those goals and strategies. As we all know, things can really change from year to year and we wanna ensure that we that we're being mindful of that. We didn't know that there was gonna be a pandemic and yet here we are and that's changed our focus with our racial equity work considerably. So Sam, you had asked about a cultural center and as much as we think that this sounds like an amazing idea and we'd really love to do this, um, we felt like at this point, this is something that we are going to table for future iterations so we can really gauge from community and potential partners on what this would take to make that work a reality and ensuring um, that we're really working with community in this space and can resource it appropriately. 
So eventual equity, um, having racial equity as part of the sustainability and resilience framework was another ask that we heard. And so what we thought would be helpful, you may have noticed in the final iteration um, of the plan, we tied the racial equity plan to various plans in the city, the county, state, as well as the federal orders. And we also tied it to our sustainability and resilience fra framework. Because this was just revised a couple of years ago, um, and until we know what the plan revision for that will be in the future, uh, we tied it to the framework and are super hopeful that this is included as part of that framework in the future. We're not just hopeful, we'll work towards that. Um, there's also a focus on reframing and providing documentation of land use concerns on that nasty page 15. Um, that was where we spent the bulk of our conversation last time we were here. And so um, as part of that last meeting, um, the members of the guiding coalition committed to taking on that particular body of work and, um, and helping finesse it through, through the guiding coalition. So on January 5th, the Racial Equity Guiding Coalition hosted a special meeting where they had a robust discussion about the racial history of the city of Boulder, and they made a lot of suggestions for editing. Staff took this feedback and they incorporated what you see in the revised racial history that you see outlined in the plan today. So now I'm going to hand it back over to my colleague, Ryan, um, so he can talk about how we've addressed some of the accountability concerns that were expressed in December and community engagement. So next slide, please. Thank you, Amy. We heard from our community over and over that this racial equity plan is only as good as accompanying accountability mechanisms that help ensure tangible progress. And to honor this feedback, we've included the following to further strengthen accountability for the implementation of this plan. Within the logic model, many outcomes include a measurable output as reflected in the logic model, establishing measurements and collecting this baseline data is a top priority. Outcomes will also be measured in results from staff racial equity training assessments, as well as the city's biannual community survey, where results will be disaggregated by race and analyzed by trends over time. Additionally, many outputs will be further developed through departmental racial equity plans. Recognizing the need to measure outcomes quantitatively and qualitatively, staff also plan to co-design and co-host an annual series of focus groups, listening sessions with community members of color to hear more about their lived experience, as well as the impacts of the city's work to advance racial equity. City staff plan to provide an update on this work to council each year. This update will include progress on outcomes, how racial equity priorities determine decisions, challenges faced, and accomplishments. Proposed next steps and adjustments to short-term, mid-term, and long-term outcomes in response to council feedback may also be included. Updates will be publicly available through a series of digestible mediums for community members, such as videos, brief online overviews, or community gatherings. And as we move forward over the next three years, this living plan will continue to reflect the community's goals. After three years, the plan will be updated to reflect changes in circumstances, community desires, and new priorities. Next slide, please. And you can see in, in Boulder's decision-making process, uh, the wheel on, on the right-hand side here. Tonight, we are in step seven of Boulder's decision-making process, make a decision. And if and when council decides to adopt this racial equity plan, we'll move into step eight, communicate decision and rationale. And to share this decision with the community and to close the loop on input we've sought from community members, a draft communication plan will be further fleshed out. This plan will focus on deep reach uh, with participants who share their perspectives and lived experience as part of this process partner organizations who committed to support focus groups and who work closely with community members of color, and our racial equity engagement working group who is instrumental throughout this process. Specific outreach plans may include bilingual Spanish English video, uh, Notasera Boulder and Inside Boulder News, uh, Somos Boulder podcast, or social media on the city's Spanish language Facebook page. 
as this racial equity plan will serve as a touchstone document for our entire community, we'll also include an announcement in our citywide newsletter and social media communications. We'll also share this progress with institutional partners locally, as well as across the GARE uh, network nationwide. Next slide, please. So before I open it up, if you all have any questions and, and we go to public feedback, I wanna apologize to our interpreters this evening. I have a tendency to talk very fast um, and was coached to do that, to not do that at the beginning of the meeting. So I just wanna offer an apology to our interpreter friends on the line tonight. So thank you for that. So does council have any questions or do we need to roll on to public comments? Sam. Hey, thank you, Amy. Yeah. Let's find out. Council members, yeah. any questions? Mark and then Aaron. Mark? Mark, you're on mute like I was. <laughs> All right, it was my turn. Um, Amy, to yes. what extent um, was community feedback funneled through the Be Heard Boulder um, site? And was, it, was that the, the major portion of community feedback that you got? No, sir. In fact, we had minimal engagement with the Be Heard Boulder site. Most of the community engagement that you saw attached to the memo and throughout the racial equity plan was with community partners um, that, that were outlined in that plan. Okay, thank you. That yeah. That's good. Yep. Thank you. Ryan probably knows better the statistics. Okay. You, you yeah, you captured the, the big picture, Amy. We. Okay. Had many more folks through small focus group conversations and feedback sessions. Got it. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. You, Aaron. Where are you? Uh, Amy and Ryan, thanks so much for that uh, presentation and for all of your amazing work on this plan. I'm very, very Thank appreciative. Um, my one question is: so we have the the goals and the strategies, and they're okay. great goals and they're great strategies. And then we have the full logic model, which has uh, many, many different implementation steps, which is very detailed, and I uh, also appreciate that. There's one thing that I didn't see, and I may well have missed it, but I want to ask about it. So uh, strategy 5.1 is to address boards, commissions, and working groups. And one of the bullet points in that is to identify and mitigate barriers in the operation of board, commission, and working group meetings, like times of day, frequency, locations, days of the week, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've had my eye on for years as a potential barrier for folks who want to participate in those organizations. But I didn't see anything in the full logic model about following up on that strategy. Um, what's your thought about a plan for getting that done? Personally, I have a passion for that particular set of work, particularly after working with the police oversight death task force over the past couple of years and just the challenges um, getting the times and getting the people to even have the capacity to participate in that process. So that's one of my top priorities. Um, I would like to see that start rolling out this year. As you can well imagine, that is an, a giant, um, giant project, but I think it's one of our number one priorities, personally. Great. So, but you hear that? <laughs> Does it need to be in the full logic model to make sure? It that is outlined in the logic model in a point, but it doesn't have the specific year. Okay. okay. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm glad to hear about that. I'm glad to yeah. hear you're on it. That's one of my biggest priorities. Yeah. Ask Chris. A, I complain about it a lot. <laughs> great. It is one of those barriers. I'm glad you're working around. For sure. Yeah. Very good. Council, any other questions before we go to our public hearing? <clears throat> great. Seeing none, we will turn to our public hearing. Um, we have our first three speakers are Catherine Farnan, Liz Marasco, and Taylor Gare. Catherine? Thank you, Sam. And I'll just remind our speakers um, to speak slowly and to breathe between sentences. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. And I will point out as you're bringing up um, Catherine that we have two minutes per speaker because we have 19 speakers tonight. Thank you. And Catherine, you should be able to unmute now. Thank you. Oh, that's that's heavy rule. That's a heavy rule you just said. Um, okay, I'll try to breathe. 
Um, my name is Katie Farnan. I'm speaking tonight to urge you to adopt the racial equity plan and make tangible policy and budget changes. And obviously to adopt the, um, the measure that Rachel Friend brought up tonight about Black History Month. Um, community input planning, study and debate have a time and place, but they must lead to policy change. As a white person who owns a home here and raises a family here, I see it as my responsibility to do what I can to protect my town. And we need to start seeing racial equity as a matter of basic protection for our long-term stability in the region. Because housing opportunity, education and criminal justice gaps that we have here, um, you know, as a result of decades of policy and budget decisions long before this current council are all huge risks to our economic sustainability. Other communities are seeing that because racial inequity is systemic, it's baked in because of common approaches communities take to wealth protection, to zoning, to city planning. Boulder is not unique in its challenges. Boulder has a wealth and ability to allocate, reallocate resources to home ownership, business opportunities, community centers, leadership and government in order for us to become stronger, to be a true economic center, to become a place people can envision launching new ideas in, a place where young families can imagine living in, growing up in and working in. There are barriers to all of these things that fall on, along color lines that we can actually address through policy. And when we make policy around equity, we strengthen Boulder's resiliency and its cultural position in the region. Policy and budget, that is where racial inequity lives. We can't change hearts and minds, we can change policy. And the first step is approving the racial equity plan. We still make choices and we still impact lives when we accept status quo arguments that do not have long-term economic vision. When we stay in the study and planning phase and, and as a result of accepting those status quo arguments, that is also a decision. And that is also a choice. Let's not make that choice. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Next, we have Liz Marasco, Taylor Gare, and Cora Weissmore. Liz? Liz, you should be able to unmute now. Oh, thank you. I started speaking. OK, thank you, council members. Um, so on the first page of the racial equity plan in the letter from the guiding committee, it says the work of dismantling institutional racism will require that some of us give up some comfort and power. Nevertheless, without doing so, we cannot live up to our stated values. I also saw in the uh, plan all of the ways by which we intend to measure success. So the number of trainings, hiring quotas, coalitions, things of that nature. But I did not see how this plan asks anyone to really give up comfort and power as you stated in the letter. I think you're right that racial equity will, will, meet, will mean that people have to give up comfort and power, but let's not fool ourselves. That doesn't mean we force people to sit in trainings. It means money and it means land. Right now, as we're holding this meeting, there are community members who are doing the work. They lead their communities. They know the problems inside and out. They know the solutions. Occasionally, these community members are tapped to sit on a board or a commission, or they'll be offered an inadequate stipend to share their expertise time and emotional labor as yet another government representative asks them to for their input on yet another initiative and then nothing changes. We should reallocate our resources to support the members of the community who actually know how to get us closer to racial equity. Why are we reinventing the wheel? Giving up comfort and power doesn't mean that comfort and power just disappear. It can get transferred. Let's start actually transferring comfort and power. Please adopt the racial equity plan. The city can no doubt accomplish everything in this plan and we will be better for it but even a perfect execution of this plan will not achieve anything close to racial equity in our city. The only way to do that is by long-term, sustained, serious investment in the community. And a great place to find those funds is in our enormous police budget. Taking money from the police budget and reallocating it directly to communities of color will help get us where we need to go. That would be a real transfer of comfort and power. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Next, we have Taylor Gare. Cora Weiss-Moore and Lauren Groth. Taylor? Thank you, I'm Taylor. I'm an organizer for Boulder Surge. After George Floyd's murder this summer, there was another collective outcry from well-meaning people asking, how do we address racism and police violence? The message from the group leading the fight against this violence, clear, defund the police. Instead of listening with humility, this was met with hysteria, largely surrounding the fear that the movement is too radical. 
History shows us that labeling movements towards justice as radical has been one of the most effective tactics against them. If we can free ourselves from the mental paralysis the label radical induces and truly trust BIPOC activists, we'll see just how obvious an approach like defunding the police is. Mark Wallach characterized calls to defund as devaluing the significance of public safety. This shows he's not even trying because pu public safety is what the whole movement is about. Pilot programs like CAHOOTS and the STAR program in Denver have shown time again that public safety can be provided better and with less money and less racist outcomes than policing. Thank you, Aaron, for proposing this. This racial equity plan is a start but real commitment to racial equity is shown through the budget. The police budget is by far the biggest general expense at 36.8 million and one of the only departments to receive increased ongoing spending. I'm urging for a serious excellent examination into how police funds can be reallocated and that effort should be led by BIPOC and unhoused community members and activists. A great place to start would be to restore the funds to community partners on the police master plan you defunded. Maybe restore the $300,000 in human services grants you cut. The council's contempt for the smallest no cost baby steps to address housing gives me little confidence that there's a real desire to truly address racial equity. Adopt the plan and do something. Thank you, Taylor. Next, we have Cora Weiss Moore, Lauren Groth, and Chelsea Castellano. Cora? Hi there, my name is Cora Weiss Moore. I'm a cisgender woman and I'm white, speaking to you on Diné Bikea, Cheyenne, and Arapaho land, commonly known as Table Mesa. I've lived in several majority white cities like Boulder, and they're dealing with a similar legacy of inequitable racist policies often using racial equity plans and policy making tools as proposed here. Um, and I thank you for that work. This is a great start. Many of them though first addressed what I think of as an obvious target, changing policies that are widely known across the country to contribute to inequitable racial outcomes. I assumed that this plan would provide a timeline and strategy for revising and dismantling Boulder's inequitable policies. And I was concerned when I didn't even see those policies that are acknowledged in the history section addressed in the logic model by name. To be honest, I don't think that this is acceptable. It's common knowledge from analogous equity efforts that policies like height restrictions, single family zoning, occupancy limits, and green belting require priority revision. Reviewing these policies it needs to be clear and prominent section of this plan and probably should have been an earlier step in this whole process. I encourage you to hire and appoint experienced community leaders and experts of color to revise city policies and budget immediately and critically to act on their expertise by incorporating their priorities into this next plan's timeline, committing yourself to bolder residents of color. These policies have direct negative impacts on BIPOC and low income community members, keeping Boulder exclusionary and limited in diversity. We need to not only acknowledge the racist history of Boulder, but work promptly and courageously to repair this legacy in our most obviously unjust policies. Thank you. Thank you, Cora. Next we have Lauren Groth, Chelsea Castellano and Riley Mancuso. Lauren? Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I wanted to start off by expressing first my appreciation to staff, the working group and community members who have done such great work on the racial equity plan. I'm particularly grateful to their commitment to acknowledging and examining the history of racial exclusion in Boulder and pushing our community to do the same. I'm speaking tonight because I am a community member and property owner in Boulder and I wholeheartedly support the adoption of the racial equity plan and the declaration. I ask that the council commit to adopting the plan with all of its current language included. But I also want to take this opportunity to ask city council to make the racial, racial excuse me, equity plan the first step in a much broader effort of acknowledging the ways that our city's practices and policies consciously and unconsciously perpetuate inequality and to commit to taking real steps towards rectifying those inequalities. This requires a commitment to trying tr 
to truly vulnerable conversations. And as the plan notes, a willingness to give up some measure of comfort and power in the pursuit of a more equal and inclusive community. And it requires city leaders to truly acknowledge and name the ways that well-meaning policy decisions have contributed to the perpetuation of racism in our community. Addressing racial inequality in Boulder also requires more than just plans and honest conversation. It requires actively dedicating our resources to this effort. We can't dismantle systemic racism through short-term grants, temporary efforts at community engagement or good intentions. City council has to be willing to make long-term investments in BIPOC communities. And we have to be willing to allocate real money in our budget towards improving equal access to resources in our community. The good news is that there are amazing community organizations and BIPOC leaders already doing this work. And as another speaker noted, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We need to trust their insights and recommendations and allow them to lead city council in these efforts. While adopting the racial equity plan is a good first step, I'm asking city council to continue this hard work through real policy and budgetary decisions that reflect a commitment towards addressing racial inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Next, we have Chelsea Castellano, Riley Mancuso, and Mason Roberts. Chelsea? Um, hi, my name is Chelsea Castellano, and an organizer with Bedrooms Are for People, a ballot initiative that will expand access to housing in Boulder by reforming our archaic and exclusionary home occupancy laws. As members of this community, it is critical that we hold ourselves accountable to doing everything we can to unravel the systemic racism that has persisted for far too long. When zoning laws across the country were originated in the early 20th century, they were specifically segregated by race. And we still live with vestiges of, the, of these policies today. And we must acknowledge that many of these policies that currently exist in Boulder are continuing to have extremely harmful impacts that are perpetuating systemic racism. Specifically, many of our zoning laws that prohibit multifamily buildings, require minimum square footages, or restrict the number of unrelated people per home, carry on these systemic inequities and continue to segregate our city and neighborhoods. KKK leader Thomas Robb told a local reporter in 1993 that Boulder had, quote, done everything right and that planning and zoning to exclude um, had made had made Boulder inhospitable to minorities, and if more communities would plan and zone to exclude, then more of them would be predominant, predominantly white like Boulder, end quote. I don't want to live in a community that the KKK looks to as a model. We must align and uh, our desire for racial equity with our actions. Um, we have the power to take these actions, and it is my hope now that you will um, have the courage and the will to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Next, we have Riley Mancuso, Mason Roberts, and Lynn Siegel. Riley? What up, council? Um, so uh, I would first like to say that I must inform you that Kurt Fernhaber was lying when he told you that the woman that Ryan mentioned could secure a hotel room due to her extreme medical vulnerability. In fact, earlier this evening, I called the Boulder shelter and was told that um, eligibility for the CRC was determined entirely arbitrarily by shelter staff. I was told this by Ben, a staff member at the Boulder shelter. And, uh, and furthermore, I was told that this woman did not qualify for any shelter services, CRC or hotel rooms, and was told that I should go to the lodge, that I should try to get her into the lodge, um, which the city loves to direct people to because it's entirely unfunded um, by public sources. Um, and um, furthermore, another staff member of the shelter, Robert Rowe, uh, recently told SAFE on Twitter during this meeting that hotel stays are prioritized by the case management team and it is never a quick last minute decision, meaning that tonight this woman uh, has nowhere to go except because SAFE uh, reserved a hotel room for tonight. Um, but we can't do that long term and she needs care and isolation and safety and a place to rest while she recovers from serious blood loss and other medical uh, ailments. Um, and this is just one example of the ways that the city constantly exaggerates the services that are available. And what I wanna say is that I think the racial equity plan is worth is, I'm pro it, but I also think it doesn't go far enough because it's not just about providing, uh, it's not just about trying to make uh, people of 
marginalized people equal to white people in Boulder and give them all the things that white people in Boulder have. People, white people in Boulder need to give up the things that they have, like single family home ownership and other unsustainable land use and city and um, urban planning policies, um, which are bad for the environment, by the way. Um, apologies to the translators. Um, what Thank we need you, to Riley. Do, we need Thank to you, focus Riley. on the well-being Riley, of the least your time is up. In Riley, I'm sorry, your time's up. Thank you. Next, we have Mason Roberts, Lynn Siegel, and Katie Dyer. Mason? Hey, everyone. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for all that you do. I know how sometimes thankless your work can be, and I, I want to know that I, I appreciate all of you all. So really to get down to it, um, I believe the racial equity plan is a start. I believe that its words and policy proposals are an important step in, in addressing racial inequity in our community. I also have been um, squarely disappointed in the pushback of some council members who seem to feel that it is a step too far, whether from the point of view of improving housing policies or from uh, reimagining the police budget. I believe that in fact, adopting the plan is the bare minimum the council can do given the decades of exclusionary policies and practices of the city of Boulder. Beyond embracing the plan, the city needs to make long-term investments in the BIPOC community. They need to take a supporting role towards leaders in Boulder's communities of color and dismantle systemic racism. As mentioned prior by another speaker, truly enacting this plan will take hard work, not only in your professional lives, but also in your personal retrospection. We all have work to do on ourselves in order to truly succeed in these tasks, and council members are not exempt. As I see it, there are a couple opportunities directly ahead of us that will help us do this work. First, is the racial equity plan, of course. I think its words are important, so please adopt this plan and faithfully enact it. Uh, second, the new city manager. Uh, you all have the opportunity to hire someone who has a proven track record addressing the issues outlined in this plan. Third, the Boulder uh, Police Master Plan. You can empower communities of color to be part of this process and support reform efforts that increase the safety of the community as, and, and the police, as well as provide an opportunity to shift funds to invest into communities of color. And lastly, the Police Oversight Committee. Uh, committee. You can give the committee real power to hold bad actors accountable. As already said before me, enacting this plan will make us stronger, uh, personally, as well as a community. It is perhaps the best thing that we can do for the long-term health of our community. Thanks again for your time, and I truly look forward to working with you all to accomplish these tasks. Thank you, Mason. Next, we have Lynn Siegel, Katie Dyer, and Lane Taplin. Lynn? I don't see Lynn in the meeting, so I will go to Katie Dyer. Katie, you should be able to unmute. Great, I'm unmuted, I believe. Um, thank you, City Council. Uh, my name is Katie Dyer. I'm a white, queer, non-binary psychotherapist. And because I have a partner who owns a home in Boulder, I have home ownership privilege. Since moving to this city eight years ago, I've seen some white people wake up to racial disparities. Some white people continue to cling in defense and shame to inherited privileges and many black, indigenous and people of color move away. The limited racial, cultural and economic diversity in Boulder is heartbreaking and makes me question if I can or want to continue living here. Larry Ward, a black scholar and Buddhist, teaches that integrity means wholeness. What does it look like for Boulder to be a city of integrity, a city in its wholeness, including all people? Please adopt the racial equity plan. Like Amy Kane said earlier, it is a start, but it must be used to create concrete policy changes and concrete actions. The current plan is not enough. Accountability is a must. And there are hundreds of leaders in communities of color in Boulder who have been tirelessly doing racial justice work for decades. The city needs to partner with these leaders and organizations, fund their projects and let them lead. Systemic racism is not dismantled by racial equity plans or two to three year grants. Like Lauren commented earlier, the city needs to get rid of short-term project-based grants 
and make long-term investments in Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities and organizations. It is time to reallocate the police budget and reimagine public safety. Black and brown people experience disproportional number of arrests and police violence. Other cities are successfully creating alternative programs. Boulder can look to these cities as resources and guides. The Denver Star program, which diverts non-criminal 911 calls to two-person teams is seeing success. And I believe, I'm not positive, but I think Councilman Brockett suggested putting resources into a program similar to the CAHOOTS program, which is in Eugene, Oregon. Thank and this you, program. Thank you, Katie. Right. Your time is up. Appreciate your comments. Next, we have Lane Taplin, Arian Gutierrez, and Laura McGuire. Lane? Hi, I want to start by thanking the City Council for its efforts in bringing this racial equity plan to the table. My name is Lane Taplin and I am white, queer, Jewish and have class privilege, which allows me home ownership in a city that's unaffordable to most, particularly people of color due to generations of systemic racism. I'm here to encourage the city council to adopt the racial equity plan and also to consider that it's not nearly enough. It needs to be carried through by concrete policy change and investment in communities already doing racial equity work. The task of even beginning to work towards racial equity I know is enormous and I want the council to know that you don't have to do it alone. Many folks in the community, especially people of color, have been doing this work for generations but just haven't had access to the funds to sustain it due to institutional racism. I encourage you to make long-term investments rather than short-term grants to the communities who know deeply from personal experience what inequity feels like and exactly what's needed to create a just thriving Boulder. When you say in the plan that this work means giving up some comfort and power, this is exactly what that looks like. Trusting the community you serve with financial resources and listening to them when they offer solutions. As a psychotherapist, I'm painfully aware of the disparity in access to already limited services between white and BIPOC residents here. I strongly urge you all to consider reallocating police funds towards programs that meet the needs of all our community members. This includes the needs of the police. Sending undertrained officers into these crises is unsafe for them too. Other cities have reallocated police funds towards programs like CAHOOTS, which has been mentioned, and has seen a lot of success. And I know you've heard about this from council member Brockett. Council know that you don't need to reinvent the wheel with this plan. Please listen to your community, make resources accessible and let the community lead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lane. Next we have Arian Gutierrez, Laura McGuire and Ralph Burns. Arian? Hi, hopefully I'm unmuted. Yep. Um, hi, so my name is Arian Gutierrez. I'm a resident here in North Boulder, um, and I'd like to comment on many of the same points that other people have more eloquently brought up this evening already. Um, I support the adoption of a racial equity plan as outlined today, um, but Boulder has the ability and the responsibility to go so much further. I'd like the city to listen to community leaders and reallocate police resources. Um, for example, by sending medical professionals to respond to, to, respond to non-criminal criminal calls. Um, reallocating police resources would also allow the city to easily invest into the community. And frankly, it would keep remaining officers safer by shifting the burden of dealing with things like mental health issues um, to people who are more qualified to cope with them. Um, thanks, uh, I, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Arian. Next, we have <clears throat> Laura McGuire, Ralph Burns, and Robert McNown. Uh, Laura? Laura, I believe you are unmuted. Hmm. Uh, Laura's microphone looks unmuted, but I don't know that we can hear Laura. Brenda, we, why don't we come back to Laura? It, that sounds right. Okay. Can we go to Ralph Burns next? 
Yes. Ralph, you should have a mute and unmute button now. Hello, my name is Ralph Burns. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, council members. And uh, thank you for the racial equity plan. I read through the plan and found more of a broad reaching goals document. And I have a specific request for budget inclusion for 24 seven co-responding EMS mental crisis service. These co-responding programs such as EDGE have proven robust and have been shown to be like a four to one budget savings when compared to police response. But these programs have been funded with short-term grants. The mental crisis response is an appropriate response to a multiplicity of dispatch calls that disproportionately affect Boulder's people of color and Boulder's poor. My two snippets of experience come as a volunteer EMT firefighter and as working at our homeless shelter, where I see that our repeat EMS customers, uh, such as uh, drug abusers, result in uh, the fatalities. And I see the residents at Boulder's homeless shelters suffering from uh, mental crises, making them just inappropriately able to cope. And I think the co-responding is just the best tool for the job and best for our budget, best for our citizens. So I'd like to see it as a, a firmly budgeted entity in our um, services. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. <clears throat> Next, we have Robert McNown, Kate McQuaid, and Mylene Villard. Robert? <clears throat> Yes, uh, thank you. I'm representing the uh, United Nations Association of Boulder County. And uh, our, our mission is to support the goals of the UN, whether that's locally or nationally or internationally. And certainly this conversation today in support of the equity plan is, is an important goal uh, by the United Nations and something that our local chapter has really adopted as, as an important part of our mission. I really appreciate the depth and breadth of this report. And the coalition is to be applauded for the work and thought that has gone into this. I wanna limit my focus to one section of the logic plan that relates to employment. First of all, I agree to the need for collection of meaningful data. Something was emphasized by Ryan in his presentation. It's important to know where we stand currently within the city of Boulder staff and how demographic groups are represented at different levels of employment and different rates of pay. The goal of a 10% increase in the number of people of color employed by the city is not meaningful unless we know the current number. We should also have explicit goals of pay and position equity across demographic groups. To make progress towards increased representation of BIPOC employees in our city offices, with equality and pay and levels of employment is a challenge. Outreach to our institutions of higher education could provide access to well-qualified entry-level employees with a variety of skills that the city could make good use of. I noted a section in the logic plan that calls for collaboration with CU and Naropa. Development of an extensive internship program in cooperation with these institutions could open up training and employment opportunities for BIPOC students, ideally paid internships that might be funded by local foundations. Again, I certainly advocate the adoption of this plan. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> Next, I think we'll go back and try Laura McGuire again. We had trouble hearing her before. Um, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, and uh, apologies, the microphone trouble was on my end. Thanks for coming back around. Um, so I wanted to support what a number of previous commenters have said in urging the city to go farther than the current racial equity plan. Um, I want to reiterate what they've said that there are many BIPOC leaders in the Boulder community who already know what needs doing and who could do this work better and more sustainably if the city is truly committed to giving up comfort and power by funding BIPOC led projects. Um, I also want to say again that any meaningful progress towards racial equity in Boulder needs to reimagine public safety by reallocating funding from the police towards new public safety programs. Law enforcement officers 
are not mental health workers or social service workers, and neither they nor our community are well served by sending them into mental health crisis situations. A crucial part of racial equity is a program such as the Star or Cahoots programs that have already been mentioned, both of which have seen incredible success and could be recreated here in Boulder. I urge you to adopt the plan and also to make significant policy and budgetary changes to support racial equity. In the end, the current racial equity plan puts too much emphasis on trainings and not enough on the kind of structural change that is needed if Boulder is to become truly welcoming to everyone. Our community has the resources needed to move towards real equity, but only if we're willing to take risks and make hard choices. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And next we will go back to someone else we passed over, um, Lynn Siegel. Lynn, you should be able to unmute. Yeah, just a moment here. Um, I agree with what the last person said about structural change. Lynn, we're having a real problem hearing you. Oh, okay. Can you hear now? Better. Okay. I agree with the last person that talked about structural change. If you want racial equity in Boulder, you're going to have to stop making it worse because the jobs housing imbalance is making it worse. The growth in East Boulder puts us on another acceleration in out commuters by a factor of one third. It's just like going to the ellipse and firing up QAnon for an insurrection and not expecting it to happen. That's what subsidizing these developers does. The insurrection's happening and the developers are laughing all the way to the bank and the racial equity is depleted. Most importantly, the city of Boulder is in charge, like Don Trump, but we need to do the right thing. So why doesn't the one in charge stop the disaster in East Boulder and all the development just push it east and and before it happens, instead of egging it on with subsidies. Dare I suggest that they wanted it to happen? Or shall I say that they could not overcome the pressure from developers? Well, how well did that work? The virus ate up the developers, just like the virus ate up the Muni, Sam. Well, not with the Muni, because it was Sam, Tom, and Bob that ate up the Muni with their short-term thinking and long-term increased costs to Boulder residents. And that hurts social equity and racial equity. But the virus did eat up the developers. They got those subsidies based on the god of sales tax revenue. Where's the bars and restaurants spewing all that sales tax revenue generated by the development subsidy in the toilet? Developers, like transit, are so yesterday. Thank you, Lynn. Next, we have our last three speakers, Kate McQuaid, Mylene Villalard, and Lucas Schaefer, and Susan Peterson has withdrawn. So, Kate? I do not see Kate in the meeting, Sam, so I will go directly to Mylene. Mylene, you should be able to unmute. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Milan Dialard. I reside at 905 Hartford Drive. I identify as white and I've, I have home ownership privilege. I would like to start tonight with a quote from the very first paragraph of the introduction to the uh, racial equity plan. I quote, input from community members of color who have bravely shared their perspectives and lived experiences have made it clear we have significant work to do, unquote. I'm so grateful to these people for having hope in this process. Let's not disappoint them yet again. People of color keep showing up, yet they are met with constant obstacles and racism. Some of you might have listened to the Black in Boulder conversations on January 16th, and if you haven't, do go listen to it on YouTube. 
no matter how liberal, tolerant, and pro-diversity we feel, Boulder has not been and is not a welcoming community for people of color. So we do have significant work to do. And if the racial equity plan is a start, it is far from being enough. So I urge you to approve this plan and take significant and concrete steps forward. Once it passes, let's not pat ourselves on the back because we have an REP and equity trainings. I would like to see the city of Boulder really invest in the long term in our BIPOC communities so that they can finally thrive. This means, among other things, reallocating the police budget. Because here we are, we're working on an REP on the one hand and we're increasing the police budget on the other while cutting all other community services. So we need to reimagine pu public safety. Other cities are showing us the way. Let's not trail behind. Let's give power directly to BIPOC and racial equity organizations through financial resources, they know how best to use them. I encourage you to give up some of your power and trust them and take some truly concrete step forward by letting them lead. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. And finally, we have Lucas Schaefer. Uh, hello. Hello, we can hear you. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Lucas Schaefer. I am currently a law student and I've lived in Boulder for the last five years. I want to preface uh, by saying that I am speaking from the perspective of a privileged white male. <clears throat> first, I fully support adopting the plan. I think it is uh, an essential first step towards working towards uh, correcting racial inequity in our community. There is good emphasis on communicating and working with communities of color. Uh, the emphasis on data collecting, self-evaluation, and monitoring is also critical to ensure that our public officials continue to work directly uh, with these impacted communities. Uh, in addition, there is a clear acknowledgement of how the history of institutional racism has and continues to affect Boulder. Uh, however, I would like to offer a specific critique concerning the last section I mentioned. Uh, as it stands, the conclusion of the racial history section on page 13 of the plan, I think is confusing and therefore problematic. Uh, I think it potentially undermines the point of this section as well as the plan as a whole by suggesting that the city is not open to the potential necessity of significant policy reversal. The plan here acknowledges the extraordinary and terrible historical impact of racism as well as the scope of systemic racism in our lifetimes. Uh, we as a very white community inherently must accept that significant systemic changes will likely if not certainly be necessary. And we are not in a position to take ideas off the table, so to speak. Uh, systemic racism is by definition intertwined with every level of policy and therefore will inevitably require some significant policy reversal. Uh, in addition, I believe that in order for us as a community to acknowledge institutional racism and, and commit to uh, making things better, we also have to admit to a degree of ignorance and speaking from my own perspective, uh, I cannot possibly fathom at this point the extent of what's needed to actually effectively address the racial equity problems uh, that we all exist, uh, acknowledge exist on an unprecedented uh, scale. And so it's a little confusing to me that the plan would suggest uh, that the city uh, would not advocate for reversing policy decisions should mechanisms outlined in the plan indicate that such large scale action is necessary for the thank sake of equity. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Sorry, I, I was, Again, I fully support the plan, and that was the last thing I want to say. Thank you, Lucas. Appreciate it. And uh, with that, um, just checking in one more time, Brenda, uh, do we have um, Kate McQuaid here? I have not seen Kate McQuaid join us, so I believe we are finished, Sam. Okay, very good. With that, I will close um, the public hearing and bring it back to council, and I would like to turn to Mary next. Thanks, Sam. Um, I would like to make a motion. Um, so I move that we adopt the racial equity plan. Second. Great. We have a motion and a second. Um, Mary, would you like to speak to your motion? Yeah. Um, I want to thank all of the community members that came out and spoke tonight. Um, but I especially want to thank um, the staff that worked on this and, um, and all of the community um, members that had input and all the partners that had input on the plan. 
Um, it is, as many um, of the speakers noted tonight, a start. And it is something that's focused on the city operations, the policies, programs, and process that many of the speakers, processes that many of the speakers mentioned. What the plan does not address is um, community members themselves. And a, a couple of community members mentioned um, the doing the work. And I just wanted to just talk a little bit about doing the work. Erin um, Okuno, who um, runs a blog by the name of Fakequity, um, says that her version of doing the work around race includes learning, understanding, reflection, analysis, and healing around race. In order for a person to do their work around race means having to actively take part in all of these steps. A person can't read a book or watch a documentary and say they have now done their work. That is one step, but not the destination or the end of their work. They should also reflect and spend the time thinking about what it means for themselves. So with that, I would just like to also um, hope that community members will do the work. And, and just to say that it's not easy work because it does require self-reflection. And it's really hard to acknowledge your own biases and even harder to address them. So um, thank you everyone and for all the hard work and I'm looking forward to implementing this document which is a living document. So it will change as we move along the way. Great, thank you, Mary. Aaron, would you like to speak to your second? Yeah, I'll say a few words. Um, thank you for that, Mary. Um, and I uh, echo Mary's thank yous to the community members um, and especially the staff that have worked so hard on this. Um, that it's been many hours and months of effort and this is an important milestone. And, but of course it's an important step adopting this plan, but it is far from sufficient in and of itself. Uh, we have a lot of work left to do. Um, I, I just took my first session of the bias and microaggression training uh, last week. Um, there are two sessions. That's being required of all city staff. Um, I found it to be valuable. I look forward to my next one. That's another item that, that's a, it's an important step, uh, but definitely not sufficient. You know, these are, these are all um, items that we do that are part of a, a larger journey towards racial equity. Um, we have centuries of um, oppression and uh, systemic racism uh, to fight against and, and overcome. So, uh, you know, the important work comes next in terms of implementing this and following through on the goals and strategies that are outlined in the plan um, and holding ourselves accountable, uh, each of us on city council, um, all members of city staff, and then the members, all the members of our Boulder community to, to do this work uh, together uh, to advance towards uh, a more just and equitable society. So I, um, I invite um, all of our community members to hold us accountable. Um, you know, watch out for these strategies and goals and, and work that we're doing. Uh, let us know, uh, you know, when, when things are going well and when we're falling short. And, um, you know, together we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep at this. Thanks everyone. Great, thank you, Aaron. Um, any other council members like to comment? Adam. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, first of all, I, I did wanna thank, and I don't think we can thank enough, Amy Kane and her team and all of city staff who are open and willing to take on this work. You know, when we look at so many cities across our country right now um, who are going in the opposite direction of this, it makes me incredibly proud um, to have such a dedicated group of people working on this. And again, I think it's been stated, but this is only the beginning. This is <laughs> nowhere near the end of the journey. Um, specifically to one of the concerns I've heard multiple times from the community about uh, policing, especially. Uh, if you didn't watch last week's city council study session, we did as a council commit to looking at major changes um, 
during the police master planning process and you will have abundant opportunities to be involved in that process uh, as it's going to take a couple of years to actually finalize that police master plan. So please, if you came here tonight to speak, especially about that, stay involved, um, keep speaking about it and keep coming out to uh, show us the vision that you want uh, implemented here in the city. Again, this is only the start of the journey and it's gonna take your input all along the way to make those changes happen. So um, thank you for everyone who came out, everyone who contributed to this work. Uh, we have a long way to go, but this is a great starting place. Thank you, Adam. Next, Junie. Thanks, Sam. I just wanna take a moment to thank staff and Aaron, but also I want to thank Mary. Um, again, I've been on council for only about a year and a couple of months now, and most of the work was done before I got there. And I have had the opportunity to see how hard Mary worked as a fellow council member. And I'm very proud of how hard she has worked and she really inspired me because of the work she has done um, in the subcommittee. And also, I just wanted to say, I did say uh, thank you to staff for all the work. I've seen it behind closed door. I think a lot of times what community members end up seeing is the beautiful piece of work that comes at the end, but they don't see the hard work that a lot of staff members put in and also council members. Council members who are passionate about the work, not just, you know, um, at the time we were on city council. So I, I, I really um, thank all of you. And also, I just wanted to say something. I know uh, community members, you hold us to the fire and we appreciate it because that's how we get better, being held to the fire. Sometimes it can be hard, um, but we really appreciate that. And something that uh, Mary mentioned, I, I guess that resonates with me, is that we all have blind spots and none of us are perfect. I'm working on mine, but I think to get to a better community, we all have to work on our blind spots because I think that's really where um, the hard work needs to be because this is a pro progressive community, yet we're dealing with the same issues that uh, some communities that are less progressives are dealing with. So it's so important that we reflect again, as Mary mentioned, do the, the, the work and do the self-reflection so that I guess as a community, we can move to a better, um, a, a much more equitable boulder as um, Aaron mentioned. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Junie. Rachel? Yep. Um, thanks for that, Junie. I'm following up on um, part of what she said. I want to also thank especially Mary and Aaron for all the years of work as guiding coalition members before um, many of us uh, joined to this council and you've been leaders on this issue and I'm, I'm grateful for you all for doing um, a lot of work for a lot of years on this. Uh, and also to Amy Kane, who has done an, also a lot of work for a lot of years on this. So special thanks to the three of you. Um, and I also wanna say that assuming that we pass this unanimously tonight, I'm really proud to be on a council that is universally committed to this endeavor. I support the plan. As Amy said, it's a first step. It's a foundation that we will build on. It's not enough, but I think it's a really good start. Um, and uh, I, I, I see tonight as sort of the easy part. Um, as council member, I think tonight our work is, is more or less committing to an idea, um, but when we have to follow those ideas and the ideals that we're setting out in this plan, when we're working through a thorny issue where the plan might cause some discomfort and be in conflict with desired outcomes um, on some of the tricky issues that we face, that's where I think the, the rubber will meet the road. And I hope that all nine of us, as well as members of future councils will rise to the challenge and be brave when it's necessary to enact the goals of this plan. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. 
As I don't see anybody else with the hand raise, I'll call on myself and I'm going to start like everyone else with a big thank you. And I want to call out some names here. Um, the five council members who worked on this, um, Aaron Brockett, Rachel Friend, Junie Joseph, Adam Swetlick, and especially Mary Young, who, as everyone has noted, has been working on this for a very long time. I appreciate that you all stepped up to this. I don't think we've ever had a council committee with as many people on it. And so it is great credit to all of you who worked on it that you are interested enough in especially the three of you who are in your first year on council to step up to this work. So thank you for that. And I wanna call out some staff by name who are also part of the Guiding Coalition. Kurt Fernhaber, Maris Harold, Amy Kane, of course. Um, we all appreciate the hard work Amy's had to do to organize this complex effort. Jacob Lindsay, a new addition to the Guiding Coalition from Planning. Of course, Chris Meschuk, who has been instrumental also in facilitating this work um, with staff, and Jen Sprinkle from Human Resources. So it has been a broad team, and then it goes much deeper than that into many community members who have given their time and given their wisdom to us to be able to shape this plan. So to all of you, uh, who I've named and who I haven't named. Thank you so much for your very hard work on this. And it is only a first step, but a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. So we should take this opportunity to at least acknowledge that we're taking this step and to celebrate the fact that we are starting on this journey. It is not the end and we will have to continue to keep pushing. Um, and another thing I think is important to consider as we put this into effect, not everyone in our community is at the same place in this discussion. Um, everyone starts where they start and hopefully works towards better understanding of each other as human beings and as people who have suffered and who have achieved. And so what I would say is let's look with humanity and grace on each other. And when we see people falling short of the ideal of <clears throat> acknowledging or even understanding the, the challenges that the community has structurally, let's try and bring them along because we, we are all better if we can all increase our understanding. So again, with that, I'll just say a special thank you to Amy for all the hard work you've done. This is an excellent, excellent document. Thank you for corralling all of us. And to Mary, a special thank you for the time that we've shared on council. You've been working on this the entire time and it is greatly appreciated. So with that, I will turn to see any other comments. If not, Alicia, I believe this is a roll call vote. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. And just to be clear, um, <clears throat> unless you say differently, an I vote here, I'll assume, is for adopting the declaration as well as adopting the declaration on Black History Month, as well as adopting the racial equity plan. Okay, Alicia. Councilmember Wallach. Emphatically, yes. Weaver? Aye. Gates? Yes. Young? Yes. Rocket? Aye. Friend? Yes. Joseph? Yes. Bagel? Aye. Sputnik? Unanimously, yes. But the Plan was and declaration were adopted, sir, unanimously. Thank you very much. Congratulations to everybody. And one, one more thank you to Amy King for her extraordinary work for all this time on making this happen. Wouldn't be here without you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. I think we're ready to move to our next item. All right, sir. Our next public hearing is a second reading and consideration of a motion to adopt Ordinance 8432, revising Chapter 12, Mobile Homes, by amending Sections 10-12-25, Limitation on the Prohibition of Sales of Mobile Homes, 
and 10-12-26, limitation on required upgrades to existing mobile homes, BRC 1981 and setting for related details. Great, thanks Alicia. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Kurt Fernhaber, our Director of Housing and Human Services, who will uh, give an introduction and then uh, turn it over to Crystal and the team. So with that, take it away, Kurt. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, it's a, uh, an honor to be uh, going on the heels of the Racial Equity Plan. And um, over the last um, four years, um, we, we've always brought you something um, related to manufactured home communities, always trying to uh, improve these communities, how they work, how they function, um, both for the, the, the residents um, and the owners um, who, um, who, who represent our, some of our most affordable um, ownership units in the city and also represent a lot of the, 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 the amazing diversity um, um, that we have. Um, in those communities. So uh, Crystal Launder is um, one of our um, housing human services uh, plan housing planners. And um, she's done a lot of this, uh, this great work tonight. It's a carry on from ordinance changes that we made um, uh, towards the end of last year. And it really came from a lot of great input from the residents in these communities. And they've participated um, in a tremendous way um, in this work over the last few years as well, um, as well as the, the owners of the manufactured home communities. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to, to Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, Emily, could I get control of the presentation, please? And just one moment. Did that work, Crystal, or do I? It, it, can you um, see it? Can everyone see it? Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. So good evening, council members. I'm Crystal Launder, and I'm here tonight to talk about Ordinance 8432, the Manufactured Home Sales Ordinance. I will be speaking a little slower tonight for the benefit of our interpreters. So manufactured housing is the most affordable market rate home ownership option in Boulder. But a tension exists between the rights of the homeowner and the community owner acting as a landlord, as Kurt um, highlighted a little bit earlier. So in this presentation, um, I will be reviewing um, the regu regulatory landscape for manufactured home communities in Boulder and statewide, of which I, I will say both our council and our community members have had an outsized um, role. I will touch on the strategies guiding principles and on um, community the community engagement process that informed Ordinance 8432. And I will provide an overview of proposed changes to the mobile homes chapter of the code. So in 1991, um, the State Mobile Home Park Act, which regulates mobile home parks or manufactured home communities, as I like to say, um, was enacted. Um, what I don't have listed here, but I think is important to this discussion um, is that in, in 2000, a policy to preserve manufactured home communities was added to the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And I think that kind of, um, in my mind, explains um, that kind of more active role that, that Boulder has played in this um, arena. So a decade later, in 2010, um, the Mobile Home Park Act was updated and that was, um, there was city staff involved with that update at the direction of our council. In 2015, and again in 2017, council adopted two local ordinances defining the rights and roles of the landlord-tenant relationship in manufactured home communities. Um, 
Um, so another item that's not on here, but I, I um, will mention is that in 2018, um, our manufactured homeowners from Boulder led a successful petition for a sunrise review of the Mobile Home Park Act. Um, it found that homeowners were experiencing harm um, and that the reason for that was really that there was no regulation um, available to homeowners under the act. Um, so in 2019, um, city staff again um, at the direction of council were involved in, um, in a bill that introduced the dispute resolution and enforcement program that is now um, in effect at the state level. Um, that same year, um, the manufactured housing strategy was adopted. And, um, and then a year later, um, city, staff, city staff, again, under the umbrella of the strategy and as a result of the city's legislative agenda, um, joined Boulder, Council, or Boulder County staff and a broad coalition of homeowners and other organizations from across the straight state and informed two bills that were enacted and adva advanced several action items from the manufactured housing strategy. And then more recently in um, September of this year, um, the manufactured housing ordinance brought forward four additional items from the strategy and that was also adopted by this council. Um, but what's noteworthy to tonight's hearing is that the ordinance was, in, um, there was significant um, public testimony focused on the need for regulatory, um, for regulation of manufactured home sales, which is an issue um, that wasn't actually part of the um, strategy at that point. Um, so council directed staff to return with the manufactured home sales ordinance that is here tonight. So just as a reminder to council, the guiding principles of the strategy include affordability, accountability, community, and viability. And this ordinance advances the principles of affordability and community by seeking to establish a clear path and common expectations for both parties when a manufactured home is sold. Um, so as stated earlier, um, really that first kind of touch point where there was community engagement where we heard from um, the community was on September 1st um, at that um, ordinance 8383. Um, later that month, um, in terms of community engagement, uh, the city staff received a propo proposed amendments um, from a coalition of homeowners that um, came from a couple of communities here in Boulder. And between um, late October and early November, um, staff uh, received input um, on some proposed code amendments. And that the ordinance um, that was put brought to council on December 15th um, was informed by that input. Um, but at the same time, um, council also received uh, a letter from that homeowner coalition um, requesting um, additional changes. And so council recommended that staff get additional input, um, which happened in late December and early January, um, which um, brought another a revised ordinance to our housing advisory board um, and provided a, another public hearing. And um, the housing advisory board enthusiastically recommended um, that the council adopt the ordinance and since um, that housing advisory board meeting, uh, there have been, staff has received no further requests for changes um, to the ordinance. So as an overview, this ordinance proposes updates to two sections of the mobile homes chapter of the code. Um, one category of change is um, new restrictions. Um, so community owners would not be able to um, do certain actions um, that could interfere with a listing or a home sale. Um, it would disallow community owners from requiring interior inspections of the home. It would extend the limitation of unreasonable upgrades 
um, beyond manufactured homes. So currently it applies to manufactured homes, um, but it would extend it to also address accessory structures such as porches and sheds. And it would finally um, disallow a community owner from denying an, applic an applicant because the potential buyer agreed to perform the upgrades um, that were required by the community owner. And I'll talk just a little bit more about that. So it's a little bit more clear in a later slide. Um, I think a central piece to this ordinance is um, establishing reasonable timelines for various touch points um, between those various parties. So between the community owner, the buyer and the seller. And then just, this is my um, catch all category or other. Um, so one of the challenges that, this, that um, has been, I think observed kind of by everybody um, is that home buyers and home sellers often um, are unaware of their rights. And so one of the um, additions would be um, notification um, by the community owner of, of their rights and responsibilities. Um, to both the buyer and the seller. And that would include a notice that we have a uh, mobile home park resources webpage, um, which will in the future, if um, this ordinance moves forward, um, include a user-friendly buyers and sellers guide. Um, the ordinance would also introduce, introduce new flexibility, including allowing community owners to petition if they cannot meet the deadline on sharing the results of the application with the buyer. Um, so um, if there was you know, something that was reason out of their reasonable control that interfered with that. Um, it would also create flexibility um, that would allow the buyer to complete the repair, the required repairs. So a, a community owner um, can define what the required repairs are, um, but um, as it stands right now, it's the, it's the seller's responsibility to perform those repairs before the home is sold. And then finally, um, there would just be several um, language tweaks um, to just create greater clarity for all parties. So if uh, the ordinance passes tonight or in the future, um, the city staff's next steps would be to revise um, the code navigation guide to update it, and also to develop that user-friendly home sales guide. And so with that, um, I will put up the motion language and my presentation is done. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you, Kurt and Chris. I will turn to council and see if we have any questions. I am not seeing question. Oh, there we go. Mark. Couldn't resist. Um, on February 2nd at our meeting, I had um, raised an issue about looking at the possibility of making residents of manufactured home communities uh, eligible for support, uh, either legal support or rental assistance um, from newer uh, funds. And I'd like to continue that request and, and make the suggestion perhaps that this is something for HAB to take a look at in terms of its implications, um, what kind of changes might be necessary in order to affect this change if it were indeed uh, deemed to be desirable. Um, I, I know Tom, you had mentioned at the time that uh, we can expect subsequent updates to this statute, which I wholeheartedly support. Um, and I'd like to get this possibility in the queue for those, um, for the next round of updates. Yeah, Mark, it's on the queue. It's, that's what I told you last time. So we're working okay. on it. Okay, then I am content. Thank you. Any other council questions? Great, seeing none, I think we will go to the public hearing. Um, our first folks signed up for our public hearing are Lynn Siegel, Mark Robbins, and Amy Bove. I'll we'll start with Lynn. Hi, um, can you hear me, Sam? 
Yes, and I'll just say, Lynn, before you start, because we only have five people, you each have three minutes. So, Lynn, you have three minutes. Okay. Um, you know, I'd go even further than some of what um, Crystal was discussing here. You know, for instance, having to repair your place before you sell it should be between the, the buyer and the seller not anything to do with the ownership of the mobile home park. And I'll tell you this from my experience in Boulder, you're not gonna find anyone to do any repair that I can't find anyone to do my, any repair, any deferred maintenance on my place on the margin of Mapleton Hill, because guess what? There isn't such a thing as fixing things up in Boulder anymore. It's all about scrape and rebuild, brand new, new build. That's what Boulder's about. That's what's driving up the cost of everything. And that's what's driving up the cost to the extent that these, these um, owners of these manufactured housing um, groups in town are just pushing the envelope into demands on the homeowners. There isn't such a thing as, own. my house is worth nothing. My land is worth everything. It's all in the land. You know, and we have a deconstruction policy now in Boulder. It's a dollar a square foot, which is a joke. No one's gonna do deconstruction in Boulder. It's called new build. Do you hear that all of you council members? That's what Boulder's about, brand new build. And that's what we've stuck it to these mobile home people like we did in Panorama or Ponderosa, whichever that one in North Boulder is. More expensive. East Point, that was affordable. Rebuild, nope. That's what Boulder's about. And you talk about racial equity and you talk about how you're gonna solve this thing and you know what, I mean, this is a good thing what you're doing, Crystal. I gather that. But it needs to go further, my point. Um, you know, this is this got to stop at some point. You know, there was the infrastructure issue originally. You know, we've got infrastructure issues that we're not dealing with with the building of CU South. And if we have a major flood, we almost, we filled up people's basements with sewer to the benefit of our sewer treatment plant. We have a, something called the 42 inch interceptor with our sewer system in Boulder that needs massive reconstruction. Talk about the mobile home park. We need massive reconstruction of our entire sewer system. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, your time is up. Appreciate your comments. Next we have, Mark Robbins, Amy Bove, and Renee Hummel. Mark? Yes, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, I'm Mark Robbins from Orchard Grove Neighbors Association. I just wanted you to know that while the improvements in state law in the last few years have helped considerably to level the playing field, at least on paper, there are still gaps and gray areas that park owners have taken advantage of to interfere with homeowners when it comes to buying or selling a home. This is not theoretical. It comes from our experience in Orchard Grove and Vista Village. And think about it, when someone is trying to sell a home, mobile or not, it's often the individual's largest asset. They usually need to sell it quickly. They may, they may well have closed on another home or are moving out of state or are paying rent elsewhere. When a park owner arbitrarily and capriciously interferes with the sale of a home, the seller must continue paying rent in the park every month and paying for two homes may lead to abandonment of the mobile home, which can be a windfall for a park owner. This is a somewhat gray area in state law and while the new state enforcement agency is now up and running, they are way behind in addressing complaints. An Orchard Grove resident filed a complaint six months ago about some of these abusive practices of the complaint is still in the system and has not yet been addressed. Uh, let me give you one example of unreasonable, demand, unreasonable demands upon the seller 
Uh, many modern mobile homes have shingled roofs with overhangs with which both shield the wall from water dripping off the roof, uh, which can infiltrate windows, and they partially shade the windows from summer sun while allowing winter sun to warm the home, thus saving energy. In Orchard Grove, the park management actually asked a homeowner to cut off this overhang so that the roof is flush with the wall and does not overhang. Uh, this is not only ridiculous, but essentially impossible because the overhang is part of the roof structure and attempting to cut it off would compromise the integrity of the roof. For years, Boulder has been in the forefront of protecting mobile homeowners' rights and many policies started in Boulder have made their way to the state level. MH zoning is one example and is now spreading to other cities as they, as they strive to protect this very important source of unsubsidized market affordable housing. This bill has been tweaked and worked on by both city staff and those concerned with protecting the rights of both park owners and homeowners over the last few months. I urge you to support this bill. It is needed, fair for both sides, and may well become the template for state law in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Next, we have Amy Bove, Renee Hummel, and Tony Payton. Amy? Amy, you should be able to unmute. Try again. There you go. All right. Hello, my name is Amy Bove, and um, I represent the uh, Boulder Meadows. I first wanted to thank Crystal and Brenda. Um, they have worked very well in reaching out to the local communities, um, in hearing us, looking at our written statements, and revising and working with um, and creating the ordinance you see before you today. Um, it has been a beneficial process, and it made a far better document. That being said, um, what I would like to bring to your attention is the amount of regulation. We heard Crystal explain in great detail the amount of regulation that Boulder has done itself and also what the state has done since that Sunrise Review in 2018. And that is like what Mark mentioned before is we did have a significant 2019 amendment, a 2020 amendment, and also with the 2019 amendment, the DOLA program. Now that is the oversight program that if the community or the tenant believes that there's a problem, they can reach out to DOLA and a resolution can hopefully be met and it does have the right to impose fines if violations are found. Um, with that in mind and the idea that we just passed ordinances last year in the city is the communities need a little bit of breathing time. There's a huge amount of regulations and processes that we must follow, that we should follow for the betterment of the tenants and the community. But with each additional layer of regulation, there's a greater hindrance in the operation and ability to provide what's best for the tenants. So going back and forth from the city, we did remove a lot of duplication, but there still is some duplication in the ordinance before you. For example, the um, mandate that within 10 business days, an application must be approved or denied. Well, there's already been this provision for many, many years at the state level where a response has to be done in 20 business days. The only difference is that amount of time. So the more that we overregulate, it's just harder for everybody to keep up. And I would just ask that um, after this round, let's allow the laws to work before creating more laws. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Next, we have Renee Hummel and Tony Payton. Renee? Hello, this is Renee Hummel from Vista Village. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to um, thank Council, as always, for your attention to our mobile home communities um, and for the opportunity to uh, 
bring this ordinance forward. Um, it's been close to six months now that um, since we started the process and have been working on it. And I'm really looking forward to um, the, the vote tonight. Um, I'd like to address a couple of things that have been said by others. Um, first, uh, I thank Mark Robbins for um, giving a very clear statement um, about issues and why this is needed. Uh, Crystal Launder's presentation was great. Um, Regarding uh, what um, Lynn Siegel had to say about repairs should just be between buyer and seller, um, there's actually a provision in the state mobile home park that says at time of sale, the park owner can require a home to, um, you know, come up to standard. So um, this um, gives guidance around that time of sale provision and helps to protect people in the community who own the home. A lot of people are elders. Um, some of the people uh, who found the experience traumatic and um, inspired this um, ordinance were trying to sell their home to move into subsidized senior housing. They didn't really have the money available to, to do the repairs. And although um, the park owners did at times make accommodation, uh, it wasn't consistent. Some people would be prohibited totally from letting the buyer assume it. Others were able to pay some money at the last minute and not have to paint their home, um, you know, et cetera. So um, this makes for a consistent process, clear timelines. Um, it just makes it a lot more fair for everyone. And regarding what Amy Bove said about the uh, 10 days, um, as you may recall, the ordinance that was passed in 2015 gave the park owners 10 days to uh, do what they now have 10 business days to do. So actually the timeline has been extended um, and I feel very good about that, that you know, there's something that's of benefit to the park owners um, in that way around that. Um, and regarding what Lynn was saying about scrape and rebuild and new, 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 this actually is going to help because what happens, uh, at least here in Vista Village, uh, at times people are interfered with, delayed, and they end up just giving up. They get a buyout for a low amount. The home, which is perfectly good, is pulled out and a brand new, much more expensive home goes in in its place. So this actually helps to preserve the affordable housing um, here in these diverse communities. So thank you very much for your time and consideration. Good night. Thank you, Renee. <clears throat> and finally, we have Tony Payton. You should be able to unmute, Tony. Tawny, you should be able to unmute. There we go. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Tawny Payton. I'm with the Rocky Mountain Home Association. Uh, I would like to acknowledge both city council and their staff for their willingness to work with all the stakeholders over the five plus years that we all have been working on this project. Um, this has been an emotional project, um, but something that's important to all stakeholders in, in Boulder. Um, we've submitted comments, city staff has considered our comments, um, implemented some of them, some of them not, but but our voice has been heard where other times it has not. So I just wanna say thank you for that. Uh, also to address the concern or um, the concern about selling a home in Boulder and across the state of Colorado, manufactured housing really is the only or the largest, uh, the largest unsubsidized source of affordable housing in Colorado. And so it's a great resource for people who want to move to our beautiful state uh, and not have to um, go into extreme amount of debt to live here. And so we really want to protect that and welcome that and encourage 
folks to come to our state and not burden them with selling their homes with all these restrictions. So I appreciate the city staff's willingness to work with our community owners to find a happy medium to make it work for both the community owners and the neighbors that also wanna protect their property values, but also the folks that are selling their homes and buying their homes. Okay, thank you for that, Tommy. And with that, I will bring the matter back to council and see if anyone has questions, commentary, emotion. Adam. I'm happy to make a motion if uh, you wouldn't mind putting it up again, just because I don't have it on my own screen right now. Uh, motion to adopt ordinance 8432 revising chapter 12 mobile homes by amending sections 10, 12, 25 limitation on the prohibition of sales of mobile homes and 10, 12, 26 limitation on required upgrades to existing mobile homes, BRC 1981 and setting forth related details. Second. Great, we have a motion and a second. Um, Adam, would you like to speak to your motion? Sure, I'll, I'll just briefly say, this is another area that I'm super happy um, we could be a part of and um, move for some legislation that helps preserve truly market rate affordable housing that we have here in Boulder. Um, I, this is another place where we're not done working, but um, this is another excellent step in the right direction. So thank you um, to all the staff and um, community members who contributed to this and made it as good as it is. And here's hoping that we can do even more in the future. Great, thank you, Adam. Mark, do you wanna to speak to your second? I wanna reiterate what uh, Adam said. I think this is a, a good common sense uh, set of amendments. Uh, I think it will be helpful to our residents in manufactured home communities. Um, and I also wanna thank staff and uh, community members who participated in this. Um, it makes eminent good sense to me and I'm happy to support it. Super, thank you, Mark. Next, I have Rachel and Mary and Aaron, though I'm not sure if that's the order hands went up in, but we'll do it that way. Rachel? Okay, well, I think I was actually last, so sorry, Aaron and Mary. Thank you, Sam. I just wanted to um, say that based on emails, it seemed like, um, and testimony we got tonight, community members really felt heard on this, and so I wanted to give kudos to staff for um, doing a really good process and um, enabling people to feel good about this and this ordinance and where we got. So thank you, Crystal and Kurt and all staff who worked on this, nice job. Thank you, Rachel. And Rachel was right. Um, apparently Zoom is not sorting by who breezed first, but now I've got it. Aaron, you're next and then Mary, Aaron. Um, yeah, thanks so much everyone for bringing this forward. It's a great uh, next step in terms of preserving uh, the rights of our manufactured housing residents. And I'm excited to be voting for it tonight. I just wanted to really um, thank um, the everyone for the collaboration that was involved in putting this final version together. You know, we had uh, this ordinance, a version of this ordinance came before us last year. And, um, and we realized that it hadn't gotten enough community input. And, um, and I really appreciate staff for um, pulling back and, and consulting with the community and for those uh, members of the manufactured housing community and other stakeholders uh, for their input and collaboration. And I feel like we've gotten to a really great place. And like with Rachel said, with um, just really excellent outreach and, and collaboration. So thanks again. Thank you, Aaron. Mary? Yeah, I just wanted to echo everything that um, everyone's been said. And I just wanted to also add that um, as Crystal was going through the sets of ordinances that have happened and when they started happening. Um, it's been, it's been a, a long road and instrumental to that. I just wanted to recognize Tom Carr's role in this. Um, I think it was back in like 2014 or something like that when um, 
a lot of residents came to us and wanting to have some money for legal assistance so that they could um, address some of the issues that they were having. And instead of doing that and running out what was not a real huge sum, um, Tom recruited Ishbel Dickens to come and help organize the communities. And that set into motion all of these changes that have come since. And so I wanted to thank Tom for that idea and bringing Ishbel on board, which really set all of these wheels in motions that, um, that everybody has you know, played a huge role. Everybody on staff has played a huge role, but it all started with Tom's idea. So thank you, Tom. Great, thank you, Mary. And I see no other hands. I will just briefly say this is great work. Um, I recall when Mary and I were early on council, we would often hear from uh, members of mobile home communities who were having really negative experiences. And from what Mary described, from what Tom did and staff has done, we've come to a place where I think we are helping lead the state at thinking through the um, regulation of these, these housing types. So thanks to the community, thanks to staff, and it's great to see us taking this next step. So with that, Alicia, I believe this is a roll call vote. Is that correct? It is correct, sir. Okay. Council member Weaver. Mayor Aye. Weaver. Aye. Gates. Yes. Young. Yes. Rocket. Aye. Friend. Yes. Joseph. Yes. Yes. Ego. Aye. And Wallach. Yes. I'm also a yes, by the way. I miss you. <laughs> Just barely. Ah, I'm sorry I had you marked, but thank you for correcting that for me. All right, sir, that ordinance is adopted. Very good. Passes unanimously. Thank you again, staff. Thanks, council, for unanimous vote on that. And Chris, I think over to you, maybe. Yeah, I'll let uh, Alicia go ahead and mention it. Next yeah. item. Thank you, sir. Next, we have item 6A, which is matters from the city manager, and it's an update on CU South annexation negotiations. Thank you. And uh, as council is aware, staff has been uh, negotiating with CU regarding their annexation application. And we've reached a point in the discussion and, and conversations with them now that I'd like to add some members to my team that represents the city. So uh, I intend to invite two council members, Mayor Weaver and council member Friend, to assist staff in the negotiations with CU in order to bring some level of the public voice into the discussions, in addition to city staff. Uh, I'll ask them to advise me on the negotiations. Uh, they would not in any way speak for council. If they accept this invitation, it would be appropriate for them to resign from the council appointed process subcommittee uh, and be replaced by two new members to be appointed by council in order to avoid crossover of the council committee to these negotiations. So with that, uh, I'm happy to hear council's feedback. Very good. Thank you with that, Chris, for that, Chris. And I would also invite any council feedback or comment, Bob. Uh, well, first of all, I, I fully endorse Chris's invitation to having uh, uh, Sam and, and Rachel uh, serve as um, advisors to staff on um, as they work through negotiations. I think that um, uh, staff found, Sam and I did something similar with the XL negotiations last year. And I think staff found it valuable to have a couple of council members as sounding boards. Uh, as Chris just said, um, Sam and Rachel would not speak for council. They would not make decisions. They would not instruct staff, but it's just an opportunity to bounce um, things off of uh, a couple of council members. I assume that, that Rachel and Sam and staff will bring points back to discussions happen over the next several months. Um, but I, I, I think Sam and I found this was be, and, and staff more importantly, a helpful tool to use. And I think we should use it 
whenever we have a situation where staff is in, in discussions with a, a party on the other side and we need um, access to some um, feedback from, from council between council meetings or between check-ins. With respect, <clears throat> I understand the reason for um, Mark, for, excuse me, for um, Rachel and Sam to need to leave the process committee um, because of this new role they're taking on. Um, I served on the, on, the, on the first team of the process committee back in, gosh, was it was 2019, I guess it was, um, with uh, Cindy Carlisle. And so I'd be happy to raise my hand um, to, to be one person to replace uh, Sam and Rachel on the process committee. So uh, I don't know if other council members are interested, but I'm happy to, um, happy to do that. Very good. Thank you very much, Bob, Mark, and then Aaron, Mark. Uh, yeah, I, I would also support uh, Chris's invitation. I think uh, uh, Sam and Rachel, given their knowledge base on this subject, are the appropriate council members to work with staff on this. And uh, I would also endorse uh, uh, Bob's inclusion as uh, a new member of the uh, process committee. Um, I, I think all of those uh, would be very, very uh, uh, helpful. So. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Aaron? Yeah, that all sounds like a good idea to me. Thanks. Uh, if Sam and Rachel are willing, thank you for being willing to step up. I'm sure it'll take a fair amount of time. It'll be some difficult work, but we will um, benefit from your expertise and knowledge, I'm sure. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, I'm willing to put my name forward as well for that um, process subcommittee since those couple seats are empty, um, unless somebody else wants it. Thank you, Aaron. And I see, Mark, is your hand up again? Up again. Okay, go for it, Mark, and then Rachel. Just quickly, I, I think Aaron would make an excellent second member of the process subcommittee, and I would endorse that as well. Thank Very you. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Rachel? Thanks, Sam. Um, and thanks, Chris, for this invitation. Um, I would say that my overarching goals are to help get people safe from flooding and to um, ensure that we get maximum community benefit and annexation. So if I can help with those goals by um, stepping up and, and helping you, then I'm happy to do that. Um, and I'm also uh, happy to step back from the process subcommittee and would support Aaron and Bob um, moving on to it and appreciate their willingness to do that. Thank you, Rachel. Mary? Yeah, so um, I support um, Sam and Rachel moving on to uh, be part of the negotiations and Aaron and Bob to um, keep those seats warm on this um, process subcommittee. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you all for your comments. I also, Chris, will um, gratefully accept your offer. Um, it will be a lot of work, but it's an important community project. And I think having uh, the political lens um, in staff discussions is helpful to kind of ground things in the community desires for a project like this. So um, I will formally resign from the process subcommittee. Um, Rachel, I think maybe we want to have you say that you want to resign as well. And then I turn to Tom to see what we need to do to formalize all this. Well, I think appointing the, the, the difference between the two things is that the process subcommittee is a formal committee of council uh, with power to delegate it by council to organize the process for the CU South annexation project. Um, so that should probably be appointed by council motion. Uh, and Sam, if you'd like, we could do the same thing we did last time, which is do it by uh, telling me what you want and I'll draft it and put it on the consent agenda for the next regular council meeting at the beginning of March. Uh, and then the uh, invitation doesn't need any action from council. Very good. And Tom, just to clarify, would it be okay if we made a motion under matters tonight to appoint um, Bob and Aaron? to the process subcommittee and then opened the public hearing and took a vote? Yes. Okay. Should we do that under matters from the mayor and members of council or should we do it now? Uh, I, I, it doesn't matter. You, you, the, your rules allow you to do it either now or at the end of um, the, at the end of the matters. Okay, super. Thanks for the advice, Rachel. 
Um, a couple of things I wanted to clarify with Tom, you know, when we did the Excel negotiations, there were um, some people who were um, not super excited that council members were, were stepping up to do that. So I wanted to make sure um, that there are no legal issues if Sam and I go forward and do this. So hope to clarify that. No, there weren't then and there are, aren't now. Um, the, when council, two council members can meet uh, and not, it's not a, a, a meeting under the Open Meetings Act. Uh, under the Open Meetings Act for a local government body, it requires three meeting members. It, it becomes a meeting if the council delegates authority to a committee, which is what the process subcommittee is. And then you do have to follow the Open Meetings Act. Uh, the, an invitation from the city manager for two council members to provide informal advice on negotiations isn't in any authority. Okay. Um... Thank you for that clarification. And I, I, I do want to say to any community members um, watching, we are sensitive to um, wanting to make sure that the community has information and um, people aren't alarmed by this. So um, feel free to reach out to Sam or I or the process subcommittee members with any um, concerns. And, and I, I, it would be my intention that we um, are very transparent and loop the community in frequently um, and fully. So um, with that, I will also formally resign from the process subcommittee and I will flag <laughs> for Aaron and Bob, y'all meet Friday <laughs> at 11. So hopefully that's great. Um, and then also to Tom, just another question um, with a vote tonight, when, when are we officially not the process subcommittee and free to um, meet with Chris? That would be effective immediately. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. And with that, I'm going to make a motion. I'm going to move that we appoint um, Bob and Aaron as members of the CU South Process Subcommittee. Rachel? I'll, I'll um, second, and I don't know if it needs to be a part of, of the motion that um, we also want people to, we also want our colleagues to accept our resignations from the subcommittee. So I might add yes. that. Yeah. So thank you. I accept that amendment. Um, and is that a second? I take it, Rachel? It is. Yep. Okay. Very good. We have a motion and a second for council to accept uh, my and Rachel's resignation from the CU South Process Subcommittee and to appoint Bob and Aaron as the new members of the CU South Process Subcommittee. Um, Tom, I assume this can be a show of hands? Yes. Okay, Adam. You might wanna open that uh, public hearing real quick. Yep, thank you very much, appreciate it. So um, we have motion second. Um, let's open the um, public hearing. So Brenda, can you rem remind me of what we do here? Do we look for people to raise their hands in the chat? We do, yes. Um, the other thing we could do is I could, it would take me a minute, but I could try to throw together a quick slide with the link to tonight's meeting um, so that other members of the public who might be watching on YouTube um, could join us for that meeting. So if okay. you have just a minute to do that, I'm happy to pull that together. Yep, that would be great. Um, and Tom, is it okay if we make the motion um, open the public hearing and wait for people to um, inform Brenda and then come back to it. So can we move on, in other words, to uh, an item under matters from the mayor, members of council and come back to this public hearing in a few minutes? Yes, you can. Okay, super. So if it's okay with council, we'll do that. We'll give five minutes for Brenda to get a slide up and people to come in. Thanks, Adam, for the reminder. And while we're waiting for that, um, why don't we move on to um, item, the next item. Uh, Alicia, you wanna take us to the next item? Yes, sir, of course. Item 8A is our next item and that will be an update from the city manager search committee identifying the city manager finalist. Thank you very much. And I will turn to our search committee, Mary and Aaron. Mary, do you want Thanks. to get us started? Yes, I will do that. So um, 
throughout the course of last Friday and Saturday, um, council interviewed five semi-finalists for the position of city manager. They were candidates K, I, G, A, and L. And we're using letters to identify them in order to uh, preserve the confidentiality of the um, semi-finalists. Um, so council members um, were all aligned in their ratings of the semi-finalists, which um, has resulted in two very strong finalists. Um, so therefore the subcommittee recommends um, candidates K, candidate K and candidate I as the two finalists. So um, we'll open it up for council discussion here. Thank you, Mary. Aaron, do you want to add anything? No, ju just to say that, um, yeah, that these two finalists uh, were chosen by uh, every single council member as their top two choices. So we had a strong consensus on who our semifinal, our, who our finalists should be. And, uh, you know, we had originally thought maybe we would have three finalists, but the uh, consensus on the top two was so strong that we felt like um, it would be efficient to just bring those two forward. Thank you, Aaron. Then I've got Bob and Rachel. Bob? Yeah, I just want to add a clarification and then ask a question. Um, a clarification on the process, as Mary said, uh, council members interviewed the five semifinalists on Friday and Saturday last week. Um, we didn't do that as a whole council. We broke up. Um, there was not a public meeting. Uh, and then our, our input on the five semifinalists was, were solicited separately and independently by our HR director and our recruiting a consultant. And so, as Mary said, interestingly and surprisingly, or, or maybe not surprisingly, given the strengths of the, of, of the top two candidates, we independently and separately identified uh, the, the two candidates that Mary mentioned as our top two candidates as finalists. So I wanted to be very clear about the fact that uh, we didn't sit around in a room and talk about it. We, we, um, we interviewed these people and then we weighed in and, and, uh, and the votes were compiled and, and uh, it was a very, a very, uh, um, clear alignment. So I think that speaks highly to the two candidates. Uh, the, the, um, just a question, and Mary and Aaron, if you know, or maybe if Jen Sprinkle is on, she could answer the question. Um, so we've identified these candidates by letter. I, I think we all appreciate the fact that we've gone from over 60 applicants to 13 quarter finalists to five uh, finalists who we interviewed a week ago and to, to the two finalists that the community will have an opportunity to, to meet next week. Um, when will uh, the, the names and backgrounds of those two finalists be available to the community? I know we've got a, um, a se some sessions lined up for next Thursday for community members to meet them and ask them questions, hear their presentations. Uh, will that be um, available later this week or early next week, the, the actual names and, and backgrounds of those two uh, finalists? Thank you, Bob. Yes. I, see, I see Jen has uh, popped up yeah, on I'm our screen. To... So Jen, what do, what do we got? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, so. The next step will be the recruiter will notify these individuals that they've been selected by council as final. Jen, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you just say your name and your role for the city, please? Yes, Jen Sprinkle, the HR director for the city of Boulder. Thank you. Yeah, so the next step is the recruiter will um, notify these individuals that they've been selected by council as finalists. So we'll give those folks an opportunity um, to uh, prepare for their names to be public um, as finalists. And so a press release will be issued um, after that, that process is complete. So um, that will be before our community forum next week, um, which is on the 25th. So by February 24th, the press release will be issued. Great, Jen. And, and to the extent that we can um, get it out a few days before that, that'd be great. I, I realize we have to work with them and, and they don't know it yet and so on and so forth. So, but I think as much advance notice as we can provide to the community um, so they can uh, do, you know, do their own due diligence on these people and, and be prepared for the, for the, the meeting with these two people on the, on the 25th. I think that'd be great. So as early as we can, if, if, if possible. Thanks. Yeah, and I believe we're targeting this week, uh, barring unforeseen circumstances. That'd be perfect, Aaron. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rachel. Yeah, um, Bob asked my question basically about when, when we would get notice out to the community who I know are very interested in this. Um, so I would just add that I thought it was a, a delightful process. And once again, we have sort of some unanimity on this council and that also feels very good. So nice work to um, 
Aaron and Mary and that um, process committee on getting us to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And I also want to make a comment and have a question. Um, so first comment is, I thought it was an excellent, excellent um, step to anonymize everything. Um, it was great to be reading through the resumes as we look through the semifinalists with nothing but the qualification and experience there. We didn't know the names. We didn't know the cities that they were from. It was, uh, and, and many items that could have been identifying were redacted from the materials we got. So I just want to say that that is a, a, a step that I think we should take um, kind of broadly in the organization. It's not like that um, council gets to hire city manager, city attorney, or municipal judge very often, but that was a really helpful way to do it. I don't know how it's done within the city, but it, I will just comment that I thought it was, um, I've never done that before. I've hired a lot of people and I've never gone through resumes in that way. And I thought it was super helpful. Um, and then the question, Tom, do we need a motion of any kind here to uh, ratify this or can our committee, our appointed subcommittee just move ahead with this? You're on mute, sorry. It would be helpful to have a motion. There are legal consequences to someone being a finalist uh, that don't apply to semifinalists. And I would feel more comfortable if we drew a clear, bright line between the two. So Very if good. approve the selection of the two finalists, you could do it by a show of hands. And Tom, just to be clear, since it's under matters, if we do that, we need to open a public hearing. Is that correct? Yeah. So you, you could suspend the rules and waive the public hearing. I, I think we probably just want to dot our I's and cross our T's unless council would like to suspend the rules. Um, shortly after we get to Mary, we'll put a slide up that has a way for people to um, come in for the public hearing and then they should indicate whether they want to speak about the um, city manager or about the CU South uh, process subcommittee. With that, I'll turn to Mary and then Aaron. Mary. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, several of um, you all mentioned the process and how well it went, and I agree. It was a very smooth process, and um, the redaction was really quite um, phenomenal in that we were purely evaluating the candidates on their um, experience and capabilities. Um, but I wanted to thank um, Jen Sprinkle and um, Heather, our consultant, who have really done the heavy lifting on this. Um, Aaron and I just get asked questions and, and then we give direction and off they go. Um, but they have definitely been doing all of the heavy lifting and have done a stupendous job. And so I just wanted to recognize them and thank them. Thank you, Mary. Aaron? Yeah, I was going to make that same point. Thank you, Mary. Um, and Jen, uh, who's still here, thank you. You uh, spent so many hours with us over the last few days in the interviews and helping uh, correlate the, um, the feedback and such. So just incredibly appreciative of all that uh, very hard and very high quality work uh, as well as for, from our search consultant, Heather. So thanks so much. And th th I'm happy to make a motion if uh, now is a reasonable time to do so. I think it is, we'll, we'll do your motion and then we'll do the public hearing on the first motion and vote on that. And then we'll do a public hearing on the second motion. So go ahead, Aaron. Okay, and then I do have a little bit more information to give about next steps as well. But um, I will go ahead and move uh, the council move candidates K and I as the two finalists for the city manager position. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We will open a public hearing on that as well. So Brenda, I'm gonna to turn to you and you said you would talk us through your thoughts on this. I'm happy to. So I'm going to share my screen now um, and let me go ahead and make that just a little bigger for folks. Um, so here is the link to join tonight's virtual meeting. Um, so we invite any of the public who are watching on YouTube or Channel 8 to do so now. Um, you can use that phone number to join by phone as well. 
And then what we'll do is as people join us, um, Sam, you wanna go ahead and do this public hearing first, the one we just had a motion on um, for the finalist candidates. Sorry, Sam, is that correct? We'll start with the motion for the Yes, start with the motion on the CU South process subcommittee. Sorry, um, Zoom crashed on me briefly. Sorry. Apologies. No worries. So we'll start with the motion on the CU subcommittee process committee. I'm not wording anything well um, by of, of the folks who are stepping off of that committee. So if you are interested in participating in that hearing, um, please raise your hand now. You will find your hand raise button um, if you click the participant icon at the bottom of your screen, you will find a hand raise button in that box or under your reactions. If you have an icon that says reactions, you will find a raise hand button there. I have activated that feature for everyone. So folks should be able to use that feature now. We do have two hands up at the moment, Sam, so we can get started as other folks find their way to us. Perfect, that's great. I see the two hands and the two hands I see are Laura Tyler and Lynn Siegel. You'll each have three minutes to speak and we will also collect more hand raises for a couple more minutes. Um, Laura, why don't we start with you? You'll have three minutes. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, this opportunity to speak. Um, great job, Sam and Rachel. Uh, on the subcommittee, I'm sad to see you go. You did fantastic work. Um, we're really delighted with the turnout on the Be Heard Boulder. Uh, looks like it's getting a lot of response. And so, yes, this motion has my wholehearted support. And I believe I can safely speak for my neighbors and colleagues that are part of the South Boulder Creek Action Group. So, and then welcome Bob and Aaron. <laughs> Great, thank you, Laura. Um, Lynn, you're next. Um, Sorry, go ahead, Lynn. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, barely. Uh, let me turn up my volume. Um, can you hear now? That's better, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've got to um, contact people because y y y you're kidding, right? You're kidding. This is a public hearing. No, no. Sorry, people. This is not a public hearing. You just announced this right now. I have to send to all of my friends. Like, I, how can I instantly do this? You, this is unbelievable. You're trying to pull Sam and Rachel, who are going to support annexation, a hundred year floodplain, flood out all of Boulder, take out our 42 inch interceptor, take out the sewer system. We'll have not only the mobile home infrastructure to deal with, we'll have the whole of Boulder with a hundred year floodplain. You are kidding. This is outrageous. No on Sam, no on Rachel, no way. And Rachel's right when she said, yeah, this is, is this going to be any kind of a problem? Maybe it's not a legal problem, Tom, but it's a problem for the city of Boulder. It's a problem for transparency. It's a problem just like you did for 10 years of working against us on the municipalization effort, because you had no spine as a lawyer in our situation trying to get for 10 years. You know, this is unbelievable. You just pull up a public hearing out of nowhere and everyone's supposed to come. And guess what? I had to forward them my link, which is illegal to do. Come and get me, send the police, Tom, because people need to get on through this. They can't go to channel eight and actually make a statement, can they? Can they, um, who is on here, I'm sorry, um, Brenda, can they? This is called um, engagement, public engagement, this is not public engagement. Unbelievable trying to pull this. Public hearing, no notice. See you south, biggest deal happening to Boulder. 300 acre campus there, you know, a football field size of 20 stories 
of dirt that the city of Boulder is supposed to give to see you on a platter. That's what Sam and Rachel want. Annexation. That's what Sam, Sam and Rachel want. Another whole university in this town. This is unbelievable. No way. You just do this over, you know, public hearing. This is no public hearing. This is a joke. This city, this, this engagement process, this is outrageous. I thought this was a progressive university town. <laughs> yeah, it's a university town, two universities for one town of 107,000 people. They don't need any handholding. They've got plenty of other campuses. The annexation has nothing to do with safety, Rachel, in the South Thank, thank you, Lynn, your time is up. So just to be clear to those who are commenting, the comment is on the motion to have Rachel and I come off of the process subcommittee and Bob and Aaron to come on. We haven't restructured anything in any significant way as far as the process that will be held going forward. Um, so I just wanna make that clear. We have two more people with hands up. I see Paul Colnan and Brad Siegel. Um, Paul? Good evening, council members. Um, yeah, I'm gonna comment also on this, this process of the public hearing. This was made, how many people are still watching this meeting right now? And Brenda, I know you put the URL up, but you didn't put it up long enough. I, fortunately, I was watching on uh, YouTube, so I was able to stop the video and go back and, and find the URL and type it in. Um, but this, uh, you know, you, you guys are in a tough situation. No matter how you decide on CU South, you know, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be unhappy. But this process doesn't help. Doing the process this way doesn't help things. So... Um, <laughs> The, the optics are bad. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next, we have Brad Siegel and then Margaret LeCompte. Brad? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, uh, I, I happen to agree with both uh, Paul and my sister, which doesn't actually happen that often. I don't agree with my sister a lot of times. Uh, she's right on the nose. I think you guys really need to be careful with this. I'm not going to get into all the details about all my opinions on this, but it does not look transparent and it's really making me nervous, man. I've been here 40 years and I have not seen this kind of stuff going on until recently. And there's some bad things going on here. We gotta be real careful about how this is coming across to the public. Uh, this is gonna be uh, looking bad. I'm, I'm very concerned. I was very concerned about the process that went on when Bob and uh, Sam, we're working with uh, Excel, and I think we got to be real careful about how we move ahead. Maybe this is legal. I don't know what, Tom, what Tom's got in mind, but it does not look good, and I'm trying to be a reasonable citizen. I generally don't come across as some kind of crazy, but uh, we got to watch out here. I'm just urging some real caution. Rachel, I think, is on the right track. Uh, understanding there's going to be some people really having some problems with this and it's starting to look bad even though maybe this is just one little step right now i would just say be very careful thank you brad next we have margaret lecomte margaret you should there we go all right, I'm very sorry because I didn't get notice of this meeting until in a public hearing until probably uh, maybe 10 minutes ago. So I do not know what you all have said, but I share the feelings of the previous speaker that I'm absolutely infuriating, infuriated that I have not heard about this or votes or any other thing like that. I am usually a pretty reasonable member of the public who is, cares a lot and knows a lot about is what is going on. But I feel incredibly in the dark about all of the kinds of things that are taking place that are not transparent. 
And I don't think this is the boulder that I move to and care about. And I do not think this is what the public wants to know about. I only found out about this uh, public hearing because of a, uh, a, per, a citizen who told me about it. And so I joined in. So I feel like I don't really know what all is going on. However, the fact that I don't know about what's going on and that I am, as most of you know very well, I am a well-informed and truly committed citizen of this community. The fact that I don't know about this is absolutely an aberration that should not happen. I would really like for whatever decisions are going on about CU South to stop right now for really genuine public participation to take place. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. <clears throat> um, so I guess we have a suggestion that we talk about how this would happen in a physical public hearing. We would do the same thing that we did tonight, except that people who are present physically in the room would be able to raise their hands. And I would just emphasize that um, from the standpoint of the process for CU South, essentially nothing has changed in the sense of we'll have the process subcommittee and then there will be the opportunity and we haven't gotten to this yet, but we, we will in the next couple of days, we will add additional public um, engagement opportunities to work with Rachel and I, if, if we go forward with this, to hear directly on what community members think we should be bringing to CU to speak with us about. So Aaron, I see you and then Junie. I have to say, I, based on the public testimony and, and my own thoughts before that, that I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable uh, going ahead and, and having a vote on something that we just announced a few minutes ago. Uh, Sam, your point is totally appropriate in that nothing fundamentally is changing, but, um, you know, given community concern around the issue, you know, having a last minute public hearing, I think is maybe not the best approach. So what I'm wondering is, um, you know, I think, as I understand it, Rachel and, and Sam can just resign, right? I mean, we don't need a motion to approve their resignations. Can what we're, I think what we need the motion to do is to appoint Bob and myself to the process subcommittee. Can we just table that for now and put it um, on the consent agenda for our, was it March 2nd meeting, I believe, um, so that the community has a chance to weigh in. And if they feel, I mean, because that's really what we're doing is just appointing Bob and I to that committee. And if with a couple of weeks lead time, people think that's a terrible idea. They can let us know and it might, we might vote differently, but um, I'm, I'm just a little uncomfortable with going ahead and having a vote tonight. Can I call a quick on that real quick? Go ahead. Um, so as somebody who, who has uh, been pretty passionately involved on CU South, I do understand when you hear the word CU South, you get pretty alarmed and um, don't want to miss something and don't want council to take an action that might, um, you know, harm harm your goals in it. And I completely appreciate where the um, community members are coming from on that and have felt it myself. So I don't discount it even a little bit. Um, that said, with a process subcommittee, like when Sam and I were appointed a year plus ago, um, I don't even remember there being a public hearing or anybody talking about it. I'm not sure that we had public comment on um, I can't remember police subcommittee or you know when we have our big decisions sort of um, appointing committees uh, at the beginning of the two-year cycle. So I just want to make sure that um, that we don't cause unnecessary delays in in responding to this because I I absolutely get it and I'm just not sure that we usually even get public comment on what's sort of an internal decision of like two people aren't willing to serve on the committee and and two others are and there's not a ton of um, options there. So I, maybe that's just a question on the history. Mark and then Junie. As a matter of parliamentary procedure, do we have the ability um, to hold this public hearing open and find 15 minutes to deal with it on Tuesday, even though it's a study session? 
I mean, I'm prepared to go forward today because I don't think there's any substantive uh, harm that's being done. But if, if there's a perception that we're acting in haste, um, uh, just to explore the option of, of finalizing it on Tuesday when people can make more comments if that's what they choose to do. I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to see the disadvantage of finishing it tonight because it's simply appointing two new members um, to, to a process subcommittee. But if that will make people feel a little better and, and possibly make Aaron feel a little better, is that something we could do? Yes. So I'd so, rather not wait two weeks to get get Bob and and, and Aaron going. I, I you know, it, it's, if it's you'd have to call a special meeting to to, to take action at a study session, uh, and I, I think the mayor can call a special meeting on twenty four hours notice. But I'm just look, I was just reading the charter, which is why I gave you a short, short answer, Mark. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Junie, and then Bob. I think I just wanted to say exactly what um, Aaron said. I did at first feel uncomfortable with the process, but I didn't fully understand it anyway. I think that was why I didn't raise any concern. But after hearing what Aaron said, I agree if that will help community members. And I think from what I'm hearing from you, Sam, is that that's the way things usually happen. So. In a way, it's a bit confusing how the process is going. Um, but if postponing it would help community members and get more feedback on how to move forward. And the member who would be on that committee actually said, let's wait and get it done on March 2nd. I would say, why not wait and take the committee members or the future community members advice, committee members advice. Bob and then Mary. Bob? I'll say two things which are kind of contradictory, but I'll bring it, I'll bring it home. I, I would observe that earlier this evening, we appointed a council subcommittee um, on consent agenda without a public hearing. So we do that all the time as Rachel observed. With that said, <clears throat> um, I joined with Aaron and I guess since we're the two, two members of the, of the uh, to be appointed to the committee, I joined with Aaron and, and uh, I, we heard some concerns from, from community members. They ultimately may not have a problem with um, Aaron and I serving but they don't have any advance notice of that. And there may be, and this has been a quite, um, we've had quite a number of, of active community members. So I think I would tee this up. Um, I, I don't like the idea of, of rushing a hearing at, um, and adding a, a hearing at a study session. I think we should just put this on uh, either public hearing or consent on uh, March 2nd um, at consent. People can speak at open comment or we can do a public hearing if people want, I don't really care. Um, but I, I, I do that. The one consequence I would observe on that, um, so I'm, I'm gonna agree with Aaron and agree with some of the speakers. The one thing that I would observe on that, however, is that means that um, either <clears throat> Rachel and Sam need to go forward with um, the previously scheduled uh, uh, process committee meeting this Friday, or we need to cancel that meeting and reschedule it for two weeks hence. Um, I'm fine with either one. Um, if Rachel and um, Sam need to get going with the um, support that Chris asked for, perhaps the best thing to do would be to cancel the meeting and put this on the March 2nd agenda. Mary. Uh, Bob just brought up the point I was going to bring up, which was what happens on Friday with the subcommittee meeting. But Well, if we choose to um, continue this, hearing, which would be what I would suggest if we want to do it for later, we can continue the hearing, um, close it for today, just stop it for now, um, reopen the hearing uh, March 2nd or at a special meeting, and then um, take testimony. And then until we do that, um, you know, I, I think Rachel and I would remain on the process subcommittee. But I would really rather turn to staff, uh, we see that we have Joe Tadeucci here and hear what staff would prefer as far as um, to have the meeting on Friday or to reschedule it. I, I think, um, I don't know if Joe's ready to do that or not. Um, we can probably do it later. Um, but Joe, if you have a thought, it would be interesting for us to hear. Yeah, Joe Tadeucci, Director of Utilities. and. <clears throat> I can be quick. 
I think it would be good to keep this Friday's meeting just because the schedule is is so tight for this year and to be able to meet with you and Rachel and get some uh, guidance on the process going forward. Okay. Well, with that, then I'll make a suggestion and then people can react to it. I would hold this public hearing, uh, continue, I'd suggest continuing this public hearing, scheduling it for March 2nd and doing uh, finalize accepting resignation and replacing Rachel and I on the process subcommittee. Um, I'm open to comment, Mark and then Rachel. Yeah, I, can you uh, make your resignations from the process committee effective uh, so right after the Friday meeting so that uh, uh, as council action is not required for you to work with staff, you would be resigned from, from the committee, but you would not lose two weeks in terms of any other work you're doing. Uh, that's a question for Tom. I, I think the answer is yes, but Tom? Yes, the answer is yes. You can do okay, that. So, so then I'm just gonna summarize, Mark, to make sure that I understand. You're suggesting that Rachel and I don't tender our resignations tonight. We do it after the Friday meeting? Correct. Okay. And then we Rachel? Do, do your other work, and on March 2nd, we will well, decide on your replacements. Very good. Rachel? I was going to suggest something similar to Mark, that we maybe tender resignations tonight effective Saturday morning or something like that, so that we don't have to revisit this, and um, we can have the meeting, and there's no issues. And then I just wanted to flag... Um, Bob mentioned maybe putting this on consent so that people have time to comment at open comment or to email or to call us. Um, I'm not sure for a uh, process issue that's really an internal question. Sam and I have resigned two council members and only two have stepped up that it's a valuable use of this council's time, frankly, to take hours away from other work that we could be doing to hear about a process question um, in a public hearing because I think it will be hours if we open it up um, as its own agenda item. So I think the consent agenda makes sense. People can speak at, at open comment and, and still reach out, but I don't know that we should be pushing other things aside for what's a really an internal decision. Very good, Aaron? Yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. And um, and if we can always pull it off consent if people email in and say that Bob and I are the worst possible appointments, you know, we can, we can pull it off and, and have uh, appoint two different people. Um, so if we get, we'll hear from the community if people think it's a bad idea. And to that to that point, would maybe the best process approach be to uh, withdraw the motion for tonight and then um, have a, a new motion come back on the consent agenda for the March 2nd meeting? I look to Tom here. That would be fine. So, so I think that that probably makes sense, Aaron. Um, so then just to walk this through, Rachel and I will tender our resignations tonight, subject uh, effective on Saturday. And then we can bring back the appointment um, on consent. Is that your suggestion, Aaron? And so the, the motion on consent will be to appoint Bob and Aaron to the CU South Process Subcommittee. And we will take community input on that going forward. Council, does that make sense? Okay, very good. So I will amend my resignation to say that I will resign from the process, CU South process subcommittee effective Saturday. Rachel? That's exactly what I was gonna say. I amend my resignation to be effective uh, this Saturday um, morning, I guess. I don't know if we need an exact time, but that's my intention. Okay, very good. Um, so we've heard from the community, Rachel and I resign after the next process subcommittee meeting. And um, between now and then, that will be what we work on is just the process subcommittee only. And then we'll resign and we can see what Chris would like us to do with staff after that. Um, with that, I think we're done with this item because there's Sam, no act. Aaron? Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I forget who made, who made the motion. I think that might have been me. 
So do you want to actually formally withdraw the motion? Then? I will formally withdraw the motion to appoint um, Aaron and Bob to the process subcommittee. I seconded it. So if I need to withdraw that, I also do. Okay. okay. Thanks for uh, talking it through everybody. Yep, you bet. Thank you all for the input. And so that takes us to our next item, which we are also taking input on. And that was the uh, city manager. So do we have any hands for that? Um, I do not see hands for that yet. Um, let me open my box again and look. Uh, I have put the slide up again for any folks who would like to weigh in on um, choosing the finalists um, by letter of the city manager. It looks like folks who, we have had a couple folks join since we started the first hearing. So I'll just say the best way to find your raise hand button is either through your participant box, you click on the participant icon and there may be a button um, to raise hand at the bottom of that box, or you may find it in your reactions box. And I'm not seeing any hands. Sam. I don't see any hands either. Oh, there's a hand. Nope, oh. went away. Lynn Siegel. Lynn, this uh, public hearing is about the city manager candidates who we've identified by letter. So if you have comments on that, um, you're good to go. My hand was raised. That's there why we called. Glitches happen. That's why we called on you, Lynn. Right. Well, it's just lucky that my hand raised because I'd done it multiple times. Just saying. Now, you can go ahead and after what I have to say, discount it because I'm speaking to the wrong issue or something. But you know what? This needs to be more of a dialogue. The last thing I didn't even understand, Rachel and Sam are leaving this, the, that process subcommittee so they can be appointed to another thing that's about CU South. But I'm going to look at the case Lynn, earlier. You're going to you're going to need to speak to the city manager, sir. My for, time, Sam. My time, Sam. No, it's not your time. You get to yes, speak. It's to a confusion the, on the, from the public. It's a confusion to the public. What is even going on? Lynn, to, right now we're speaking the about the city manager. Okay. Let's see if we have anyone else who wants to speak about the nominations for the city manager. And Sam, to be clear, I muted Lynn so that she would be able to hear what you were trying to say to her. Thank um, you. But Lynn, we really do need to concentrate on this tonight. We put off the, um, the CU South process subcommittee appointments until um, March 2nd. So if you would like to speak, you can speak on that. I see Paul Coleman also has his hand raised, but the subject for now is the city manager nominees. So I'm gonna have Brenda, unmute you, Lynn, and if you have any comments on that subject, we'd be happy to hear them. I watched the city manager when Jane came on. This is a big deal. The city manager stays forever before you can get rid of him. Luckily, we got rid of Jane. I want to see the pre, the ones that you go through first and the council just throws out without me even knowing who they are. And I get it that they're trying to get jobs. And so, the, you know, they can't let their employer know and that kind of thing. But I want to see everything that you see. And I don't. You already vet them yourself. Maybe one of those people is the one I wanted. I didn't want Jane. I wanted the guy from Ann Arbor. That was, I don't know, 10 years ago. I listened to all the interviews. I worked on this a lot, Sam. So give me some credit here. 
I would like to see who those people are, what their bios are, be able to review them, not just be given a few or a couple or I don't know how many people that you've already decided to vet yourself. That's not right. The public should have an option to see those people and not by their name so that we could, you know, risk them their job and their community, but by their values. We've got a huge issue coming up with this virus and with climate change, with municipalization, with, which I'm intending to do in 2025, Sam, as soon as we can get out of Excel. But we need a manager that's going to appreciate those things. And we need to know who those options are. It's hard enough to know what somebody's going to turn out to be. And, you know, approving the Oz without even it going to council first. You know, are we going to get another city manager that's going to do something like that? That he has the audacity to actually say, oh, there wasn't a council meeting in time. So, Lynn, thank you, Lynn. If your time's up. Thank you for your comments. And we'll go now to Paul Coleman. Paul, you should. Uh, thank you, Council. I'm, I'm here. Um, this is real short. I just would really like you to have three finalists instead of two. I don't know, maybe there's a big drop off in quality after the first two, but I would appreciate if there were three finalists. Thank you. Paul, if I could ask you a question when we've got you on the phone, why would you prefer three to two exactly? Because that uh, gives us more choice. I mean, I know nothing about, these are letters. I know nothing about anybody. Um, and you're saying that only two of these people are worth looking at. Um, I'd rather look at three. Okay, thank you. That's noted. Um, and then we've got Brad Siegel. Oh yeah, can you hear me? We can, Brad. I, I tend to, to back what Paul says. I realize you guys have probably had a good process and maybe very well you've got you know two that are just great. I, I was kind of looking at three. I was sort of looking forward to talking to three. That seems like a little more reasonable a number to be able to have. Uh, we've had processes at CU where they only had one candidate. That was no good. Two is not quite so good either. So I guess I'd just say it would feel better to me if we had a chance. You know, something like what my sister brought up, the idea we're not going to be seeing all the details about the person. I understand these confidentiality issues. That's a reasonable point. Uh, but uh, it seems like three would be better. I, I back Paul on that. Thank you, Brad. I will bring it back to council then. Um, we have no more hands up. And so um, I, I guess I'll start with Adam. Adam? Yeah, I'd just like to say for the community's uh, interest that uh, when you put someone out in the public um, in, a, in a job role like this, potentially hiring them, they put at risk their current job. And uh, that can have very devastating negative consequences for them if they're visibly looking for other work. So um, keep that in mind when we choose two instead of three. Uh, if, if we don't feel they have a really, really good shot at getting this job, we don't wanna sacrifice their current job as well. So think about that a little bit too, please. And, and I would follow up that comment, Adam, which I agree with, with another comment, which is, this is ultimately going to be a council hire. And I think another consideration that we had was given that there was such broad agreement on these two candidates, we did not want to bring someone in that had all the risks that Adam pointed out when the chances that um, they were going to be the final selection were, were small. And so I think there's also a balancing act that we took the advice really of our consultant uh, and our professional HR folks on if you know that um, a person that you're bringing in is very unlikely to make the cut, then it can be more damaging to them, not only for their career risk, but all the work that you're making them do and, and the, um, the uh, 
amount that you're putting them out. So I just wanted to say that that entered in the conversation as well. Rachel? Yeah, I, I had the same thought as um, Adam and your addition to it, Sam. And, and also just want to add to um, one of the commenters' points about releasing like the redacted versions to the whole community. Um, I was able to, you know, intuit or figure out some cities on the redacted versions. Um, so I don't think it would be protecting privacy if we did release that. So I just want to flag that as, as uh, I'm sure that uh, Jen and HR would have a similar concern, but um, I, I don't see that being viable because you can read between the lines in, in a lot of ways and um, Google information and figure things out. So I, I support the two because I think that um, there was just such broad agreement and then um, a, uh, just a, a large enough gulf that I think we would be causing harm to ask a third person to come to the city and put their um, job at risk when our intention is really to be looking at these two. Thank you, Rachel. Aaron? Also, they're fantastic candidates. And I think when they're um, made public and when people have a chance to talk to them, I think there will be a legitimate choice involved and there will be uh, two great potential choices to be made. So I realize you have to kind of trust us here, which people, some people aren't gonna wanna do, but um, the, there was a real uh, drop off uh, to the number three position. So uh, it, it'll be fun seeing the finalists in interviews with the community. Yeah, and I will say to the community, I think you will enjoy meeting these two folks. So um, I think with that, um, we can take a vote and our vote is to accept the recommendation of our city manager search subcommittee to bring in the two candidates. Um, I believe it's K and I that they brought forward. So um, Tom, is this a show of hands? Yes, it's a show of hands, Sam. Very good. So all in favor of bringing candidates K and I, raise your hand. Very good, that's unanimous, we'll do that. Okay. And Alicia, would you like to take us to our final item? Sam, before you, you mind, Sam, if I... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I thought we were done. Bob and then Aaron. Yeah, I just want to make a process observation. Um, you know, when we, we have this rule, uh, it's been around for a really long time that if a motion is made under matters, we open a public hearing. It's a waivable rule, and sometimes we do waive it. It seemed to work when we were in chambers, and those who happen to be in chambers uh, sometimes came up and, and, and commented. Uh, but it doesn't seem to work on Zoom. Um, and um, the, the, there is an engagement, there's a community engagement subcommittee, which consists of Rachel and me, and, and coincidentally, we have a meeting tomorrow. So I just wanted to offer on behalf of Rachel and me, sorry, Rachel, um, that we, we'll, ta we'll tackle this problem <clears throat> at our meeting tomorrow, and we'll bring forward to council some suggestions on how to address it. Uh, again, it seemed to work in chambers, but it doesn't seem to work online. And so Rachel and I will come up with maybe a couple of ideas. We'll bring them back to council in a few weeks whenever CAC can schedule um, this and uh, give you guys some, some thoughts on how we make motions under matters and, and how do we handle public hearings. Um, so just uh, maybe stand by on that and we'll see if we can, we can avoid this problem in the future. Cool. And, and I'll follow up, Bob, and say, from my experience, it was never really that satisfying in chambers, to be quite honest, because you had the converse problem, right, of people watching Channel 8 who might have wanted to comment on something that came up under matters, and there was very little way for them to make their way to council chambers late at night to be able to comment. So I've always found the matters question, I mean, it seems to me like we should either not take public comment and just make the appointments we're going to make, or if we're going to invite public comment, we either invite it ahead of time so we get it by email, or um, we make it into a, a, an item of some kind. So when you take that back, um, Bob, and I think that's a great idea, I appreciate the suggestion that you do that, realize that it didn't really work very well in matters uh, sorry, in chambers either. And we've struggled with this as long as I've been on council. That, that's a great point, Sam. So we'll come up with some solutions or some proposed solutions 
that um, that deal with both um, in chambers and on Zoom. So it can be a permanent solution even after we're back together again. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, good idea, um, Bob. And yeah, it, these are uncomfortable and, and um, odd situations where we do these um, public hearings on matters, especially on Zoom. I'm just wondering if there are any um, legal um, issues involved, if it's possible that um, Tom could, could get back to us kind of early tomorrow. I think we meet at like 9.45, just if there's anything we should be aware of that might be limiting for our ideas. No, there's no requirement in the law that there be a public hearing. It's a tradition in Boulder and an expectation from the community. So it's more of a policy consideration on your behalf than a legal one. Okay, thanks. Aaron. Yeah, thanks for that offer, Bob. I look forward to what you and Rachel come up with. Um, and then I just, Sam, I, I had a little bit more information about the, the finalists and the city manager, if I could uh, go ahead and share that. That'd be great. Thank you, Aaron. Great. So um, as we talked about before, the, the names of the finalists and some background information about them um, will be made available uh, soon, hopefully in the next two or three days, but no later than February 24th. And then there will be a virtual community meeting, as you mentioned before, on Thursday, September 25th from 6 to 7.30, which will give um, community members a chance to meet and provide feedback on our two finalists. And uh, there'll also be a chance to ask questions in there and speak with the candidates in small groups during virtual breakout sessions. Um, we'll have, um, uh, as uh, Chris mentioned earlier, there'll be a place where you can register on, online uh, located on the city's calendar to, to get meeting instructions. And um, you can submit questions for the candidates in advance of the event if you're not going to be able to attend. Um, the event will include interpretation in Spanish and it will also be recorded and made available afterwards. And then we will look forward as council to getting the community's feedback on the finalists when people have had a chance to learn more about them and after this event. And uh, just also FYI to the community that there will be other events with the finalists for um, internal um, staff, stakeholders, you know, uh, department heads and such like that. So this is uh, one part of um, uh, the outreach that's, that's happening. So that's what I had. Mary, anything else? Very good. You covered Aaron. it all, Aaron. Sorry, I was a little slow to my unmute. No worries. Thank you all. Um, anything else on this item? Okay, very good. Alicia, what's our last item? Um, it is item B, which is maintaining safe and welcoming public spaces update continuation. And it is a scheduling discussion. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so I'll just tee this up a little bit and then we'll go out and make sure that I'm teeing it up right and get feedback from council. So um, CAC came off of the last discussion on this subject and we tried to schedule something quickly and we realized that uh, we we're gonna have trouble scheduling it. There were some conflicts with people who could be there and not and probably more is we weren't sure exactly what we were scheduling. So I think tonight is a scoping and a scheduling discussion. And I have brought to this discussion a few buckets that I just wanna put out there that are subject matter that I think relate to the, um, the issue at hand encampments and safe public spaces. And then I will happily write down others that I've forgotten. And then I will kick us off to see how council wants to proceed. So um, the items I have written down to talk about and try and schedule either in one hearing or in multiple um, are the issue of additional resources in the city. Do we want a city cleanup crew? And then do we want an ambassador program and or uh, additional um, police presence. Um, another item that was brought up and I don't believe we resolved were some suggestions about additional ordinances relative to propane tanks and or tents in public spaces. There was, um, I think, uh, meth rehab and recovery was a subject that was touched on. I don't think we spent much time on that, though I'm not sure there's action for us. And then there's the question of additional 
services in the city, whether it be sanctioned encampment or safe parking. And I think the focus there was it, uh, something run by a nonprofit or a private organization. So those are five buckets that I have, Bob. Sam, yeah, I think you've done a good job on the buckets. I have a thought on dates too, but we should probably scope first because that might um, inform us on what date would be um, appropriate based on how long this discussion would be. I, I don't disagree with your buckets. I think that's a good one. I'll just make two comments. First, with respect to the last point you made about sanctioned campgrounds and say parking, I, I think our staff was pretty clear and I think a majority in council indicated at a meeting, gosh, probably six or seven months ago now, that that was not something we wanted to spend city resources on. So if the question is, do we wanna revisit that discussion? I, th I think that's separate from uh, this encampments discussion. And, and certainly if there's a majority in council who wanna have that discussion, at, uh, revisit that decision at some point in time in the future, that's fine. But I don't think that falls under this umbrella. It certainly was not within the scope of the staff's memo for a meeting on January 19th, which we're effectively um, continuing now. Um, if, if it's, and Rachel earlier in the evening did um, <clears throat> ask a hypothetical question, which is what if somebody privately wants to do that? Are there things the city needs to, um, to weigh in on, I guess, around maybe uh, safety or health or something like that? I, again, I'm not really keen on answering hypothetical questions. If there's an organization in town that wants to do these with their own land and their own money, and they want to come to city staff and say, hey, listen, we're doing this what things we need to be thinking about. I, I think that becomes ripe at that point in time, but I'm not sure that we have a whole lot of time to answer hypothetical questions um, unless they're, they're real. So I, I guess I would probably not include, my, my preference would be not to include um, either a sanctioning campground um, or, or safe parking discussion in, in, in what was a pretty narrow discussion with some subparts initially, um, regardless of whether it's a revisiting of the city's earlier decision not to have the city fund these things, or if it's just a hypothetical question about what if somebody wants to do it privately. So I would I would actually exclude that from this discussion. Uh, we can have a separate discussion about whether we want to bring it back at a different date. <clears throat> Sam, you mentioned in the resource um, bucket, which is the first bucket you um, talked about, uh, the staff had recommended, or recommended we consider potentially um, uh, additional resources for our parks department to do cleanup uh, potentially some rangers, um, potentially um, some uh, police um, staffing. And then you also mentioned an ambassador program and I'm quite keen on having a discussion about that. And I, I, I suspect we probably won't be able to have this continued discussion for four to six weeks. We'll talk about a date here in a few minutes. Um, and I, I, I would, I would urge if, if, if this is the will of a majority of council, I would urge um, staff to, um, to, to lay that out as an option. I don't know if staff will recommend it or not, but I'd like to at least have it here what the options are. I know that our downtown organization has indicated that they would support this financially, that they would be happy to manage it. Um, there are organizations out there that run ambassador programs that um, provide um, ambassadorship, but also provide light cleanup, which might help Alley uh, Rhodes' team and parks. And um, they actually provide a presence. And so it could, could actually result in a, a reduction and the number of police officers that we need to have in the affected area, which I think is primarily downtown and around the civic area. It, it's, it's economically advantageous, as I understand it, to use these ambassadors. They're not police officers, they don't carry guns, they don't have badges, but they do provide a presence and they're quite a bit less expensive than having police officers. So I'd like to, to at least at this uh, rescheduled um, and continued uh, meeting to hear from staff you hear from the downtown organizations about what this might look like so we can make an informed decisions. Do we hire more cops? Do we hire um, more people to do cleanup? Or is there a third path here through a contract, um, which probably gives us a fair amount of flexibility and from what I understand is quite a bit cheaper. So I, my only request would be that we include that ambassador option as part of the package when we come back. Super. So I have that included and <clears throat> just to be clear so that, um, I, I'm not confusing folks. I was not suggesting that we revisit city-sponsored sanctioned encampment or city-sponsored or funded safe parking. I, I think it had been brought up by some members of council as something that they were interested in finding out, are there barriers? I don't know if we want to talk about it. I just have it as a bucket to to hear from council members on, but I was not suggesting, uh, and I haven't heard a suggestion that we revisit the previous decision about not considering them at the moment for city funding. 
So I was, and I'll, I'll leave it to people who are interested in that subject to hear if they want to have this scheduled or not. So first question, so Aaron, good. Um, first question, make sure we got the buckets and everything we want in the buckets, and then let's talk about how to schedule them. Aaron and Rachel. Yeah, Sam, I thought your, your buckets were good. Um, and, uh, but I do wanna make it clear as I think, as I put out in my hotline post before our last meeting, when we, we ran out of time, that, that I do want to have as part of the discussion, um, you know, additional um, service alternatives that, that we might offer uh, for folks experiencing homelessness. And, um, you know, that may count as a, a revisit of some previous conversations, but um, we've been through a lot of COVID since the last one. Uh, we are proposing significant additional expenditures in the area of, um, of dealing with encampments. Um, and uh, we also have a recent example of the um, safe outdoor spaces in Denver that have been quite successful. And actually just earlier tonight, the Denver City Council voted 10 to one to expand that program going forward uh, because it has been successful. So people don't have to agree with it, but I do wanna make sure that it's on the table as part of the discussion. So Aaron, I just wanna be clear. So you are suggesting that, um, <clears throat> So I believe that sanctioned encampment safe parking are part of your service alternatives, right? So, so I believe that the way you put it, service alternatives. So mm -hmm. I can make that the headline and then we can have some subparts to it. Is there anything else you'd like as a subpart? No, I think that, that puts it well. And my focus is on the um, that safe outdoor space uh, model program. That would be okay. the one that I would wanna talk over. All right, very good. Rachel? Are you done, Aaron? I am. Okay. So I also wanted to point out that, um, you know, I think when we were taking the vote last month um, on this issue, kind of part one of it, several of us said, like, you know, we'd like to talk about this holistically and not, you know, chop it apart into enforce or not enforce, because we, we um, wanted also to include a discussion of, as Aaron called it, service alternatives. And I think that was pretty well agreed to that we would have that opportunity. So I think it would be poor form for us not to include that in part two, if we agreed to include it in part one, when we were sort of advocating for, or in part two, when we were advocating during part one to do that. So um, hopefully Aaron's suggestions will get adopted as this. Um, but more broadly, as I was sort of thinking about what I wanted to lift up tonight, I found it really hard um, and almost like being asked to, to pick a favorite kid. Like there's just so much in here that it's really hard to pare down. We're gonna have this one discussion and you know, what do I really wanna make sure gets on there? And so I, th I think all I wanna lift up is, um, I think we need to have um, more space for um, us to create some ongoing substantive creative discussions on this issue because we're not going to get through what we need to get through in one more meeting and we need meaningful opportunities for community engagement so that frustrated community members in all directions are not stuck with open comment and sending emails. Um, and I, I appreciate and know that our staff works really hard on this issue, but it's the biggest issue we hear about. I think we all agree that we have not achieved perfection. And so um, I think trying to lump in everything we ever wanna talk about, um, you know, big picture stuff here is gonna be really difficult for one session. So my request is to discuss at that session, how we can dig deeper and more ongoing on this issue at the council level, um, the way we do with a lot of other things on our work plan, um, looking at also more regional collaboration opportunities. Um, and so that's that's my big request. And then aside from that, just on a smaller point, I think um, staff made a decision last week to um, double up the number of severe weather shelter days available. and. My sense is that council might want to have a discussion of that as well. That's all I got. Adam. Yeah, I just wanted to say briefly, this does seem like an additional expenditure or additional funding discussion. And it's pretty clear that, you know, there is sort of a split on council, whether or not that should go all towards enforcement or all towards um, additional services. And it's worth having that discussion like we agreed to last time, whether or not that should happen, because I can tell you, I'm probably not gonna vote in favor of 
an all enforcement uh, regime going forward. Um, and thanks to Bob to being open to an alternative, you know, that's a start for sure. But this is part of the discussion I want to have is how, how are we going to dedicate those funds going forward? Because I think there's a pretty obvious split on council about overall what we want to do with those. Very good. Thank you for that. I, I think we have a threshold question that I, I think is important to answer. And I don't really care what the answer is, but I think we need to answer it because we have a camp which wants to take the elephant in bites and break it down into some bites and talk about the bites that that's what the buckets are. And we have, we have what uh, Rachel just passionately argued for is a holistic discussion, which this is where CAC just crashed and burned because um, I have a hard time articulating what that looks like. And in fact, Rachel talked about a series of discussions and some other things. So when I talk about a, a threshold question, it's what are we trying to do? And so if the idea is to, you know, we, we talked about having a holistic discussion. I think that's an all night discussion if we wanna have it in the way I, because I think where it's gonna wander off to pretty quickly is how do we have dialogues about this with the community? And I don't think, I mean, that's a programmatic kind of question. We're not going to have one meeting or two meetings where we can decide that. We're going to have to kick off interested council members to design what that would look like. So uh, I, I think if we want to have a ongoing discussion, that's like one type of discussion for us to have. And if we're going to go there, if that's what five council members want to do, my suggestion for that is a special meeting. And this is all it is, is focused on that because everything, Aaron, that you lean towards and Rachel talked about it as far as holistic and I think Adam even referenced that he wanted to have it, that's gonna take time to frame up. And so what I'm trying to do here is to see what it is we're trying to frame up. So council members, as you listen to this discussion, be thinking, do you wanna have a meeting that is holistic? Or do five of us want to have a night where this is what we talk about? And, you know, I'll, I'll challenge Rachel and Aaron to describe that because as I try and put bucket items together and make a list of what we talk about, I feel like Aaron and Rachel perhaps don't want to frame it up that way. So it would be helpful for one or both of you to describe what that looks like so that we can plan it. But I, I really do feel that that means a special meeting that's devoted mostly to this because if I look down the list of items and put it in context with what Aaron and Rachel have described, I think that's most of an evening. Um, Mary? Thanks, Sam. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure what a holistic discussion means either. Um, but I'll start out by saying that back in January, when staff came to us asking for direction on a couple of things, those couple of things, um, one of them was whether or not Parks should establish an internal team instead of hiring out to ServPro. Um, that is a sort of reorganization of something that we were already doing. And so I don't see how, so, so to me, a holistic dis discussion and reorganizing an internal team is like, it's like apples and oranges. And, and so we've got the apple cart being held up by the oranges. Um, so if we wanna have a holistic discussion, this is what I would propose. Um, I would propose that we do it in the context of the regional discussion that the HRC is um, supposed to take up um, and to, to have it within the frame of how do we work regionally and with other partners to address these issues because we're not going to do it by ourselves. I mean, a holistic discussion to me is not going to be addressed with city resources. 
So we have to have to have partners and we have to have to do it within the context of a bigger area that is outside the boundaries of the city of Boulder. So that's what to me is a holistic discussion. Um, I, um, I really don't want to revisit the, the encampments and the safe parking um, in terms of having it be city funded. Um, I do think that if an outside organization wants to bring something like that forward, they go to the planning department and they find out what the barriers are when they're ready to do that. Um, so I think that having a discussion about what the barriers are is not really, um, it's like the, it's like the call up that we had this morning, right? It's like, well, it's, it's, it's almost like micromanaging. So if, if somebody wants to do that, they go through the channels in order to do that. Um, so I think that there are two separate discussions. One is let's give direction on the things that staff asked us for direction from, which was basically a reorganization of stuff we were already doing. And then the holistic discussion I think should be done in the context of organizing a regional discussion um, because I really don't see us having any kind of impact holistically with city resources. Thank you, Mary. Next, I have Aaron, Bob, and Mark. Aaron? Well, I, I, I think that this sort of holistic approach is, is being um, kind of portrayed as, as a bigger thing than it needs to be. Um, May I appreciate your talk about needing to work things on things regionally. I absolutely agree with that. But but for me, when I if you want to call it holistic, I just mean that that we we talk about um, the staff recommendations uh, together all at the same time, along with uh, seeing whether there's interest in providing service alternatives that we might also spend some money on. So so that's really it. It's just that we. It's just that we don't take one proposal from staff at a time at a separate meeting, each one. I know we're not proposing just that, but that, but that we don't break it up into little individual pieces and talk about each individual one completely separately, but that we look at all of the proposals from staff as well as service alternatives um, together. And I mean, if, if CAC really thinks that takes a whole special meeting, I defer to your scheduling expertise, but that doesn't seem like um, it's that much longer of a discussion. Um, you know, it seems like something we could talk about on, in an evening along with another agenda item or two. So I just want Aaron, to colloquy. Oh, I'm sorry. I was I'm just, just going to colloquy briefly that I'm not sure, Aaron, that your and Rachel's descriptions match in my mind. Mary, go ahead. Um, yeah, and and uh, sorry, Sam. I think that this is how I'm thinking. I'm not. I'm not speaking for Rachel here. I know. I, I get it. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to parse because you're both using the word holistic, and I, I'm just. I think this is good. We're actually making a bit of progress here. Sorry, Mary. I interrupted you. Can I go now? So I had a question for Aaron, and so I could see. Um, the discussion, including some service alternatives. Um, and I think if we had a list of what those service alternatives would be, um, I think then it might be a manageable discussion. But if it's just uh, service alternatives and we don't know what we're going to be talking about, I don't you know, I just, I don't know what that means. So if we had a list of service alternatives that we could actually have a discussion about, then that would be good. So do you mind if I go, since Mary asked me a question yet? Yeah. So Mary, I mean, for me personally, I'm just bringing forward the, the safe outdoor space model, um, but other people might propose other specific ones. Um, but it's certainly fair to have people come prepared with a list in advance. That's my one um, that I want to talk over. But I thought, if I may ask, um, but I thought that the safe outdoor space was outdoor camping and 
safe parking lots, which is no, what. Well, it, no, it's it's a it's a sanctioned encampment model, but pre-set up, right? So it's not like people bring their own tents. It's you know there's a nonprofit that sets up ice fishing tents with heaters and and then a couple shared heated spaces. Um, I had a links to it in, in my hotline post. It does not include parking. Um, it's it's a it's a pre-set up uh, camp campground. Okay, but Mark. Other people who want to discuss other alternatives. Yeah, might have been next, Sam. Yeah. I'm sorry, Bob, and then Mark. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I want to go back to what Mary said originally, which is apples and oranges. The staff in January asked us four questions, and we really didn't answer them. And none of them have to do with sanctioned campgrounds. They asked us, and basically, Sam, Sam in the first four of Sam's five buckets, he, he summarized them very well. And I think we owe it to staff to answer their questions. They, um, and, and the, the topic for the meeting was about keeping our public spaces safe and clean. And so the staff had some ideas on how to do that. Some of it was gonna require money, some of it was gonna require reorganization. And, and to be fair to staff, we haven't answered their questions. And I think we should just take care of that business first. Um, we should answer their questions as quickly as we can. They've teed it up, they've given us all the information, they've given us all the research. Um, and we just need to say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no to these things. I think a sanctioned campground, a revisiting of a sanctioned campground um, discussion is a long and complicated discussion. It will require staff a significant amount of time. And I just think tacking that on to these four pretty straightforward questions that staff is waiting for answers for just does staff a disservice. And so, you know, if, if a majority on council wants to revisit our decision on sanctioned campground, that's fine. But what I really oppose is a process where we tack that very, very lengthy and contentious and already decided decision onto four pretty straightforward questions that staff has already teed up. And all we really need to t take is an hour, an hour and a half and answer their questions. Mark? I, I tend to agree with Bob on this. Um, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to start relitigating uh, some of the questions that we dealt with and I thought had decided in January. I am receptive to a conversation after we deal with the, the, the core issues of what the staff has asked us about public safety, to a conversation about what has changed in the world, what new programs have worked, what are, how are they not working, how might they be applicable to here, um, but, but simply to open it up to a general uh, let's do this again because we didn't like the answer we got in January. I, I don't think that's productive. I'd be more than happy to hear an analysis of what the Denver programs look like, what's going on nationally. Uh, is there new data that we need to look at that, that might change our view of the world um, in, in terms of service alternatives? But, but simply starting again and, and doing it again, I'm, I'm not sure is going to be very productive for us. Um, I would urge us to, to at least focus for the first part of this conversation on the things that we need to respond to staff on. I am prepared to have a second conversation because e either one of these conversations is a full evening. Um, and I'm happy to have two special meetings if that's what's required. But let's not kid ourselves that you know, looking at um, service alternatives, even in the context that I've described them, uh, is anything less than a full evening of, of conversation. Um, and I would urge uh, council members who want to take a, a look at some of these service alternatives to bring us information um, to show why we need to take a, a new look. I mean, I, I think there's a, having made decisions in January, I think there's a certain burden on council members who want to look at it again to show us why that's a good idea. And I'm, I'm always hopefully responsive to new information, new data, um, new analysis that says, hey, what we looked at back then is different today because somebody's figured out a better way to do it. Uh, why don't we look at that? And, and I'm, I'm prepared to do that. But I think in the, in the first instance, we need to be focusing on specific things that, that we discussed at the last meeting that staff is looking for guidance on. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I got a lot of council hands up. I'm going to turn to Kurt Fernhaber, who's got his hand up, and see if we can inject the staff perspective. I think, Kurt, before you start, I think one thing that we'd like to hear before you end, you don't have to start with it, is what do you want to hear from us as far as what was in the last memo we didn't touch? But other than that, go go whatever you were thinking. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Sam. So um, the, the other thing that I'll um, interject is that um, once a year, we've been trying to have sort of the, the annual um, kind of homeless meeting and homeless update with city council where a lot of the issues that, that I think are being discussed tonight um, are often addressed. And we look back at the last year, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what do we need to tweak or improve? Um, and sometimes it's looking at um, other programs or other ways of doing that. Um, it's normally a very full night. Um, and um, it can sometimes be the majority of only the, the one, uh, um, item on the agenda. Um, we haven't really scheduled that yet for this year because quite frankly, I was sort of waiting to see um, how these conversations and the, these meetings would, would play out. But last year it happened in July. Um, and then we had a follow on um, meeting with additional questions that came from that in September where we focused on severe weather shelter. Um, as far as What's, what would be helpful for staff. Um, I think the direction that we heard at the last meeting, um, one is that the, um, I think it was item number four, if I'm correct, which was more around um, different approaches to sentencing and um, additional serv um, uh, treatment services that happened through that. There wasn't, a, there wasn't um, really any support for that on council. Um, I don't see us re-litigating um, um, that conversation. Um, I think council was pretty clear on that. Um, we also felt like there was support around um, um, identifying um, approaches for residential meth treatment, which is a, um, a very important issue in our community that needs to be tackled. Um, the other two weren't, um, weren't really addressed by council in a way that gave us direction, which was additional staff for things like park rangers um, or um, a block to block program or something, um, something like that. And the other was um, a sort of reorganization of how we actually do the cleanups with an internal team. And we could have uh, done that without council's um, um, approval, but there's budget implications to that and potentially staff implications that we, um, particularly in these tight budgets, we're not able to really um, maneuver that um, without additional support from council. Thank you, Kurt. I think that's very helpful. So I'm gonna to summarize to council what I just heard, which is really only the first bucket that I brought up tonight is what staff is asking us to speak to. So I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, but my interpretation, if you disagree with that interpretation, tell me when I call on you. Um, there's a few hands up, Adam, and then Aaron and Rachel. Yeah, just in response to Mark, um, there is information out there. HRC and HAB did a very extensive research project. I was part of the joint committee that did it. They sent it to all of us. I don't know if you read it or not, but the information is there. Well, may, may I colloquy on that? Yeah. HRC did a very interesting analysis of um, uh, safe parking. They did almost no analysis in the report that, that, that I looked at of um, sanctioned campgrounds. And they made a request for tiny homes with, also with very little data. So, I mean, they, they it's not that they... Uh, did not fulfill their function. I thought they did it very well on um, the parking facilities, but I don't think they really addressed, I mean, any of the major questions with respect to sanctioned campgrounds. And, and you know, I'm not gonna bore us today, but I, I have at least 12 to 15 of them that I put down on a piece of paper after reading it and saying, you know, we don't have answers to these things. And I'd be happy to have them take a look at it and do as good a job on that 
as they did on um, parking, to, you know, safe parking. Um, so it, it, it's not the case that they gave us a report that fully addressed all of those core issues. I really thought they only addressed one. They made a very interesting case um, on, on the, the safe parking, but I don't think they did that on sanctioned campgrounds or tiny homes. I appreciate that, Mark. Um, I'll finish by just saying, essentially we're being asked to allocate new additional funding towards enforcement. And I can tell you without having the additional supportive structure conversation, I'm uninclined to vote towards additional enforcement. That's why I think we're having this issue about holistic versus non-holistic. Several of the council members are asking us to vote on these specific issues that are all enforcement based. I totally understand that. I'm just saying, if you want my vote on some of those, we I have to look at the vote. other side. I always want your vote, Adam. I know. <laughs> I know you do, Mark. Uh, that's, that's all I'm trying to get at here. I understand. Thank so you. Adam, I have a question for you. <clears throat> um, when it comes to the ambassador and police program, I think that fits in your description. I'm not so sure about the city internal cleanup crew. Do you view that as enforcement as well? It's technically an enforcement mechanism of our camping ban. So in a way, yes, I understand that it's a little bit different and there is room for discussion there for sure, but it's still an enforcement mechanism. Okay, so got it. Anything else that you would like to say? Okay, um, Aaron and then Rachel. Yeah, I mean, similarly, I was going to make a similar point to Adam, which is that the reason why I'm, I'm bringing this up in this context is that my understanding is that we're proposing spending significant additional dollars, city funds, you know, to deal with uh, issues around encampments. And so if we are going to be devoting significant additional financial resources to these issues, then I think it um, if we need to look at what... Um, potential service alternatives we might consider with those uh, some portion of those funds. You know, if um, you know, when we're, that's the way it, this is all apples, right? That, that if it were just a, like a no dollar, additional dollar expenditure, but moving a function from an external one to an internal one, that's a pretty small question you could deal with on your own, but I believe it, it also comes with a, a larger budget. Um, so, that's similar to what Adam's saying. It's like, if we're gonna spend a, a substantial amount of additional money on these issues, I, I think we need to consider um, what we might do with those dollars um, and, and look at other alternatives um, as other parts of it as well. And, and that's why, yeah, so I think it belongs as part of this discussion because of the dollars. Okay, so Aaron, I'm gonna try and summarize. Help me, correct me when I get it wrong. Um, so staff asked us, a few questions about city cleanup and potential ambassadors or police. And that takes more money. And so because it takes more money, you believe that service alternatives need to be in the conversation about what to do with the money. All funds, correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rachel and then Mary. Uh, yep, um, following up on Aaron and Adam, I just reiterate, like, I feel a little bit like there's been a bait and switch if we don't include that discussion, because when we had part one and everybody agreed to vote on part one, knowing that we were going to get to part two, which included Aaron had lifted up like the Denver sanction encampment discussion. And it, it seemed like people said, yes, we will have this part two discussion. So I feel confused about that. If we now cut it out, that just it doesn't feel um like good, good, um, it just doesn't feel like follow through to me. Um, and I appreciate Kurt reminding us about the annual updates. And, you know, I've only been on council a year, so I can't speak to what an ordinary year looks like. But this issue, I feel like really has us chasing our tails as a council the whole year. And the volume of emails that we get about it, the amount of time that we spend, you know, talking one on one to each other about it is is I think the, the topmost issue. So I just, I don't feel like even with the additional supplements to the annual um, discussion that we are like getting our heads around this sufficiently. So that's why I'm talking about something holistic and I don't know exactly what the method is to get there, 
I don't think we have to discuss or, or decide that tonight. I just wanted to lift it up for something to be discussed as part of that discussion. Like, how do we, you know, maybe go at this a little bit differently so that we can, I think most of us agree on the progress we want to make. We want to um, help individuals and, and ensure that spaces are safe. So how do we get there? Because we're not, we're not there, definitely not this year. And I think COVID has complicated things. And so I, I just think we need, again, more robust and creative opportunities for discussion. That's what I mean by holistic. Thanks. Mary? And then Mirabai? Mary? So I just wanted to bring up the, the, the safety issue of um, the propane tanks, which is not, is that's a different bucket. Is that true? I have it as a, it was the second bucket I put out there. Yeah. Okay. That's all I had. You're the only one to come back to it, Mary. So I just want to make sure that um, it's something you're interested in having. Well, in. yeah, it's a significant safety issue since it was causing fires. Um, I just think that is a real significant um, issue, no matter what we do. Okay, thank you. Mirabai? Um, I'll just jump in here. Uh, I, I know that last time it was getting late and we agreed to put off the meeting to have a more robust conversation um, on what, what was trying to be discussed. So, I mean, I support addressing the four topics that, uh, the four questions that staff needs addressed. And I think we should do that first and foremost. Uh, I do understand the robust conversation, but I think like Mary is stating, and this is what I brought up during our retreat is that have a more robust conversation. Yeah, I mean, maybe during a council chat or something like that, but this is where third parties need to jump in. And I thought that was wonderful that one of the speakers talked about on open comment today, um, where they raised funds so that people had hotel rooms to stay in. I mean, that's outstanding. Uh, we have many, many services within the county and obviously there can always be more, but it's gonna take community to jump in and third parties to jump in. And I think that going the route of them working together and coming and finding out what the roadblocks are from the city is going to be the best and most effective option because right now we have the funds that we have. And I think we have a phenomenal program that our staff and county have put together. So I think, I mean, I, I don't know the stats in the nation, but it sure seems like we're leading in a lot of ways and doing a fantastic job. So um, I'd like to get staff those answers and, and open it up and, and really ask that third party community members that you know share a deep passion in this jump in and, and start helping us. Because again, unfortunately, we, I mean, it'd be great to have unlimited funds, but, but we don't. So, or, or resources with staff and buildings, et cetera. So that's kind of where I'm sitting on this issue. Thank you, Mayor Bynes. So <clears throat> I am gonna try and frame it up again um, based on our conversation so far. So one thing I'm hearing looks more like a process to me. That's like iterative conversations going forward. Some of these, I think we could do in a meeting, um, it would be a long one, but I think that the items that I have that we would like to talk about, and I'll say holistically in the sense that Aaron said it, and what, what that means is if we're gonna spend more money, or maybe Aaron and Adam both, if we're gonna put more money towards it, let's talk about all the things we could put more money towards. And some of those are internal city cleanup crew, ambassador slash police, and then service alternatives. So those are things that involve money, right? And then we have some things which don't involve money, which include severe weather shelter days, right? That's policy. Um, there may be a little bit of money, but it's not a whole lot of money. And then what Mary brought up, which is ordinances around safety. So um, I also had brought up some items around that. Neither one of those are necessarily money, you know, because enforcement is handled the way we handle enforcement on everything else. So do people generally 
hear those two categories as two different categories. One is money. Okay, so I'm getting nods from Aaron and Mark. So that's some broad ends of the spectrum. So maybe we can say what's money and talk about money holistically. And then we can, as time permits, talk about things like severe weather, shelter days and ordinances. So is that a way that we can frame this up? So, because it sounds to me like we could do those in two separate meetings, one of which is holistic in the sense that it addresses where we're spending, and another of which is policy around this. I know they're interlinked, but that's a way of separating them. So I've got um, Mary, is that new? And then Bob and Aaron, is that old Mary? Okay, so then I've got Bob and Aaron. Bob? Yeah, I think it's interesting how you frame that up, Sam, and I don't disagree with that. I, I guess I, I really more have a question for staff, probably for Kurt. Um, so if we put all the money things into one meeting, the question I have for Kurt is, um, and if those money things including, included spending money on a city, at least partially funded, um, sanctioned campground, which it sounds like what Rachel and Aaron are proposing, um, the, um, the question I would have for Kurt is, is when could you be ready for that? Because I, I know that we're ready for all the other money dis discussions. You guys were ready in January. We just didn't answer your question. So I know, I know those questions are fully framed and ready to go whenever we can find a date on the calendar. The question, Kurt, is if we tacked on to that a question of city financial support for sanctioned campground, would that slow that up or are you kind of ready to go on that one too? So I think we would need, um, from today, we would probably need at least six weeks um, to put this memo together. Um, I think we could certainly do it within eight weeks, um, trying to bring in as many of these things. Uh, the, the things that I have mentioned, um, and just to make sure we're aligned, because um, some things seem like they came on and off the list. Um, an ambassador program, um, internal cleanup team, um, ordinances around tents and gas tanks. Um, I've taken meth recovery off because that wasn't talked about and I thought we had agreement there. Um, unless there's a cost there, we might bring that up as well. Um, and then uh, uh, sanction camps, um, I had that on there as well. Regional collaboration, um, the 60 days for a severe weather shelter, I would think that that's not as time sensitive. That might be better in a, an overall homeless conversation and possibly even the, uh, possibly even the regional collaboration. I'm not sure, but um, th that's kind of the list that I have. I think it would take us six to eight weeks to put that together in a way that was um, comprehensive. So, Thanks, sir. Can, can I just colloquy with a question, Kurt? <clears throat> yep. So say say we cut this down to the dollars and non-dollars. So I'm just going to try a, a cut through this, which is the more resources, city cleanup crew and ambassador slash more police. I believe that's already in your memo, right? So we yep. probably that's don't correct. need anything on that. Although and I do think there's additional in information that we would want to bring you. Um, when we brought this to you at the last meeting, um, it was, the question was, do you want us to spend more time looking into this in a more comprehensive way with real dollars and a real proposal? We didn't really bring you a real proposal. Um, my hope in a following meeting is that we would bring you something that um, had a little more meat on it and um, something that we'd hopefully be able to move forward with in a, in a more defined way. So Kurt, walk me through it. I know I'm breaking this down, so I apologize, but city cleanup crew, internal city cleanup crew, mm -hmm. do you feel like that's fleshed out enough or do you need more on that? Uh, we're relatively close on that. Okay, so yep. we, we pretty much have what we need on that and yep. there wouldn't be a lot of extra work. Um, police and ambassadors. So what I mean by that is I think we were told more police and what has added into that is the idea you said rangers i believe some more police or rangers and what's come in is and bob will have the name of it but it it is more of an ambassador program 
that would be collaborative with maybe um, downtown Boulder. How is that like a few weeks worth of work to, to frame up more about the, the staffing? Yeah, I think we would need more time for that because, um, and I noticed Maris has got on, but yeah, so, I think yeah, all those yeah. things come to get, they, uh, they, they play together. So um, if you had an ambassador, ambassador program, you may need less PD or, you know, you know if, you're, if you're using park rangers, um, you, you need to look at all those programs together to see how they fit together. It's not one program or another, but I'll see that Maris has gone on there. Chief. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening, Council. Um, yeah, it'll be morning soon. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think uh, Kurt's dead on there. I think that we would look at that uh, uh, as an integrated system, that it wouldn't just be one or it would be an integrated system and maybe wouldn't rely so much on the police side if we looked at that ambassador program. Um, so we would integrate that and it would take a, take a little bit of time to, to put that together, but not a lot of time. Okay, so so I, I think for the purposes of what we might do, um, we may not need detail proposal yet because what we're trying to do is sort out what we would spend our money on should we decide to go that way. So it seems like if we could have a rough outline, I think we might have that um, on the ambassador slash police, it would be enough for us to be sorting on. So I guess what I'm saying is if we're looking, you know, at a list of things we can spend our money on and we have kind of a rough idea, it may even be philosophical, right? How we make this decision. So um, I've got cleanup crew doesn't need a lot. Ambassador police to really implement would take a lot of design, but we might be able in a handful of weeks to have a picture of what that would look like were we to choose to spend our money there. And then what may be more complicated, and I'll, I'll turn to others after this, is service alternatives. And I really only heard that talked about in a couple ways, safe parking and sanctioned encampments. I keep bringing up safe parking because we heard that from HRC. It's been mentioned twice tonight. So, Kurt, you indicated it would take a long time to write something up around sanctioned encampments, safe parking. We've heard from Adam, we have what we need for safe parking. We have examples down the road for sanctioned encampments. But I think that's also a question that we might be able to come to some philosophical with this council conclusion on without a deep dive kind of study of each of those. So how comfortable are you with us having a conversation with what you can get us in if we schedule in four weeks and you wanted to make sure we had just some rough budgetary numbers? Would it take a lot of work on your part? Yeah, I, I think we can put all these things together for you. Um, again, I, I think if we scheduled it in, in you know, we're gonna work with whatever time you give us. Um, if you give us six weeks, we're going to give you six weeks of work. If we're, if you give us four, it's going to be a little more abbreviated. Um, the um, I do know there's been meetings in the past where council has said, just give us some information, but don't spend any time on it. Um, it usually hasn't gone well for us. Um, so we, we would want to give you something that um, we felt comfortable with as well. Okay, great. Thank you. So I see some hands up. I don't know if they're current. I'm going to call and we'll see Aaron, Mary, and Junie. Aaron? Yeah, thanks for all that. Sam, I just actually had, had I thought you were going in a good direction with the, the like the, the money related things and the, the not money related things. But I was a little unclear. Like I thought Mary's point about like the propane tanks as a safety issue it being you know more time sensitive. It, were you suggesting that we deal with that as one of the non-monetary issues that we could get to sooner rather than later? I wasn't putting a sooner than later. I was suggesting that as far as sorting goes, however we want to get to them, that ordinances for safety were a non-monetary piece. Well, I, I, I think that separation makes sense and I would support, you know, that the safety related non-monetary bits coming, you know, sooner rather than later um, so we could move, make progress on this. Okay, 
All right. Well, that's interesting. Um, thank you for that, Aaron, Mary, and then Junie. So thanks, Aaron. I appreciate that. And I, I think what you just brought up right now is that there's another factor to consider here. And there is um, a time element too, um, to these things as well as, as the cost and then the no cost. Um, so, so priority, I guess. Um, but one of, the, one of the things in terms of service alternatives, as I recall in January, what was brought up was um, that meth recovery, that meth addiction is a huge, 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 huge problem. And I, and I was a little concerned right now when Kurt said, well, that hasn't been brought up, so we're gonna throw it out. But it seems to me that it's something that would actually help people um, it probably goes under the bucket of um, cost money. Um, but I also think that in order to have a real impact, it's one of those things that would need to be addressed in a, on a bigger scale. Um, or maybe whatever we do could be scaled up. Um, but it seems to me that, that the whole meth recovery, since we're doing, seeing so much meth addiction, that is something that could actually have a great impact on people's lives. So um, I don't wanna let that go. Um, so I'm bringing it up because I don't wanna let it fall by the wayside in favor of something that perhaps doesn't really have an impact um, in terms of you know addiction recovery. Thank you, Mary. Junie, and then Rachel, and then I will ask for a motion to extend the meeting after that. Junie? Yeah, I was just about to say that as well, because it's already five hours into the meeting. Um, and we've mentioned four and a half hours during our retreat. Um, and also, we're just discussing whether we should bring back the four topics and I wonder whether it would be useful to just have a meeting where we discuss, really discuss those topics. But um, I wanted to say on this list that I heard tonight, I fully support the internal CD cleanup crew, the meth recovery, I think that's important. And I kind of see it almost like, maybe that's not the right word, almost like, it's, it's a balance. I wanted to say carrot, but it's a balance basically. If we're gonna, and I like the idea of the ambassadors. So having the ambassadors, and I think from what I'm hearing as well from Bob, is that the ambassadors will take away from cost because it's gonna be an engagement with other organizations in town and they will be able to pay for it or at least help cover some of the costs. So it might not be as expensive and this idea of having the ambassadors, we might not need as many police officers. So I like that, but I really think having ambassadors without really dealing with the real issue, which is the meth issue that we're dealing with in the city, it's almost like we're not doing anything. It's like we're playing, what's the word, hopscotch. So I think the meth recovery might be a good way of balancing things out. Thank Thanks. you, Junie. Uh, Rachel, and then why don't you close whatever you have to say with the motion for extending the meeting. All right, I hope I remember. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on um, Mary and Aaron's point on the propane tanks, and I don't disagree, like that's alarming. We don't want explosions there. Um, and so I understand it's a safety concern, but I think honestly, almost everything on this topic is a safety concern. Like. Addiction is a health and safety concern. Certainly the rash of overdoses in Boulder um, is alarming. Somebody froze to death last week. Um, you know, just all around this topic, I would not like for us to forget that there are just health and safety issues all over the place. And so I'm, it would be leery of us prioritizing one safety issue over others. And it's, it's just, which is why I feel like we need a, a, that holistic discussion of this is just such a, a huge tent, multi-tentacled um, issue. So I just wanted to add that in. Thanks. 
You want to make a motion for us? Dang it. Yep, I sure do. I would like to extend this meeting. I so move. Second. Any opposed? Great, seeing none, it's extended. Mark, you're up. Yeah, I, I also want to be supportive of, of Mary's comments on sort of alternative methods for treating meth uh, addiction. This, this started out as a public safety conversation and I can't think of anything that would be more impactful in a positive way uh, on public safety than dealing with the rampant meth addiction that, we, that, that we're experiencing. Um, that also has a direct correlation to the uh, crime that we're experiencing. So I think anything we can do to get a handle on that is, um, is highly valued and, and perhaps the, the single most important thing we can do. So I, uh, I appreciate Mary raising it and I wanna be uh, supportive of that as well. Thanks. Kurt. Uh, thank you uh, both Mary and Mark. So th the intent was um, not to take it off the list of things that we're working on. We, we, we have a subcommittee that's working on um, bringing um, um, one or more meth um, treatment programs to Boulder County. Um, so there's a group that's working on that now. Um, and we could make that part of the memo and the discussion to try to add more information. Um, my intent was to focus on things that we need decisions from you more you know, sooner. And we could bring, if we need, as we know more about this and we need additional funds, um, we could bring that to you at a later date. The, I think the challenge is to, to bring all of these things um, fairly um, um, defined um, We'll, we'll take some real effort, but, but, but we, we will not lose our momentum or um, effort in, in working on that. Thank you, Kurt. So, um, Rachel, I'm sorry to do this, but I'm going to push back a little bit. These things are all important, and I agree that they are, and so we could have one big meeting, and we could try and hash it all out in five hours, but I'm still going to say we need an agenda. <laughs> so, even if we do it, I'm going to keep driving towards ways to sort discussion topics. And I want to tag off what Kurt said, because Mary, I totally agree with you and Mark about meth. I think it is a top of the list challenge. And I think what I heard from Kurt last time, and I think I'm hearing it again, is there's more work that needs to be done. And there's work going on right now on that. So Kurt, is that right? We've got progress being made at the county level on this um, that's correct. Okay. So I was feeling like for the purposes of where I think we need to sit down and have a conversation with this group to make some decisions that staff has asked us for, meth isn't on the list. We had a look at it. We understand it's moving. And because we're not there yet, we don't have a request from staff on what that could look like and what the costs are and so on. So I, I, I was sorting that into a bucket of in process. So then if we look at, I mean, I am going to come down firmly on the side of um, Mark and Bob that we need to answer staff's questions, right? And so if in order to do that fairly and have a, a discussion that incorporates more than just what, what staff brought up, we want to add service alternatives, I think that's one, maybe two hour discussion to have, <clears throat> which is City cleanup crew, mostly done. Ambassador police, maybe take a little more work to get us information, just so we can have a scoping discussion and then service alternatives. I think if we bucketed those together, the objection I heard to just addressing cleanup and ambassador police is that's all enforcement. And what I heard from Aaron and I think Adam was if you added in service alternatives to that, that we could have a discussion that involved it. Now, not everybody's gonna maybe be happy with where we land, but we will have discussed the right items together in order to take a decision. So one proposal I would say is if we're going to do it, we have a bucket which looks at answering staff's question, city cleanup, crew, yes or no, ambassador police program, 
yes or no, and service alternatives, yes or no, we have a limited amount of money. So we're going to make a decision about those. And some people will be happy, some people won't, but we will have considered everything in that bucket. Then we have this other bucket, which is policy. So what I see under policy is the ordinances on safety. And the only other thing I have here is severe weather shelter days that looks like policy because regional collaboration, I don't know that we need to have a meeting on regional collaboration. I think it's super important. I think staff does a lot of it, but I don't know what we're gonna say to staff as council about regional collaboration unless we're asking them to do more. So I'll put out that I see a money bucket that is holistic in the sense that it incorporates other things than just enforcement and um, ordinances and policy and then regional collaboration as potentially mixed in there. So I'm just trying to move us towards like some kind of resolution where if we have the agenda, I think we can schedule a meeting. And so there's that. I got Mary, Aaron, and Junie. Mary, you know. That's a hand. Aaron? Tim, I, I think you're, the direction you've gone there works for me. I think it sounds like a great direction. And to Junie's point, we're spending a lot of time talking about what to talk about. And I, I think we could just go with, say with what you've proposed and then schedule a meeting where we actually talk about what to do. Um, so I think that sounds great. I'm ready to cut to the chase when we all are. Um, Junie? Sam, I just wanted to say that I didn't hear you mention the meth recovery, and I wanted to know if that was still on the table. So I, I, I tried to ask Kurt, and let's see if, if we got that right. That is in process already, I believe, and it's county work, and I don't think staff needs anything from us for that to proceed at the moment. Is that right, Kurt? That's correct. Okay, so, so Junie, I think it's incredibly important and I don't know that we have an action item on that in the short term, but I could be wrong. So I, if, if others would like that added to the money bucket, we can do that. Um, Bob, Mark. Yes, my biggest concern was that the sanctioned campground discussion um, uh, slow down the others back to Mary's apples and oranges, apples waiting on oranges or something like that. Um, so you know, Kurt's, Kurt's giving me comfort that get, if you give him six ish weeks or so, um, uh, he can be ready to talk about uh, the, the all the money things. Um, I'm fine with that. And then we'll just make, as you say, a, a, a series of, of binary discussions or decisions or, or allocate a, a bucket of money. Um, I'd like to, uh, if, if it's not premature, I'd like to throw out a date now that we seem to be, I see Mark's hands up, so maybe he's going to disagree with me, um, a coalescing around kind of a money discussion and then maybe a later policy discussion. Do you want me to do that now or do you want to hear from Mark first? Um, I'd rather hear your date. We can just throw it in the mix. Sure. Well, I'm going I'm to throw out April 6th. That's actually seven weeks from now, so we're giving Kurt an extra week. Uh, I know in talking to... Um, to chip with downtown and some staff members that they're going to be fully ready on the ambassador proposal within the next couple of weeks. Um, so it sounds like probably the long pole in the tent is really just giving uh, occurred enough time to, um, to, to pull together the sanctioned campground uh, uh, materials and, and, and money. Um, as I look at April 6, I, I believe, and, and, and Chris and staff can disagree with me and CAC can ult ultimately negotiate with this, I think there's several things on April 6th that can be moved. So for example, our COVID briefing, which is very important and we should continue to do that on a monthly basis. I think it, subject to Jeff Zach's availability, we could move that a week to April 13th, which is a study session. There's no decisions ever made in the COVID discussion. So I, I think it could just as easily be presented in a study session if Jeff is available the following week. So that, that clears up an hour. Um, and then I think there's a couple of things. There's the legislative agenda, which I know we have to get to at some point in time, and 3303 of Broadway, which I know has been put off a few times. Maybe it can be put off again. And the Rocky Mountain Greenway pro project, which I think is just an update. I don't think that's a decision. So that could be moved presumably by a week or two or to a study session. So I I'm guessing that um, with maybe the exception of either the legislative agenda or 3303 Broadway, I'm guessing that CAC and staff could probably 
clear off 80 80% of this meeting by moving off Rocky Mountain and uh, the COVID briefing by by a week or so. And that is, seven, that is seven weeks from now. Thank you, Bob. Mark, and then Rachel. Oh, Thank sorry, Mark, Mirabai, and Rachel. Mark? Um, I, Sam, I'm, I'm pretty supportive of the, the, the manner in which we've um, segregated the money issues and the policy issues. My only concern is that I think the money uh, meeting may go for eight hours and the with what's left in the policy bucket, uh, we may be done in, in you know, 75 minutes. Uh, I'm not sure it's gonna be a, a, a good allocation of, of time, but it, thematically it makes sense. And I guess we'll have to buckle up for an eight hour meeting. It, it, it's gonna be a long one. Well, well so, I'll wait to hear others. I'm not sure I agree, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Mirabai and Rachel. Um, depending on what, if we, if this is a voter discussion, if it's a, if it's a discussion, then this is fine. Um, but I have a business trip for the first two weeks in April, so I will not be attending either council meeting in April. I was just going to let everyone know as it got closer, but seeing as this is coming up, um, I figure I'd at least let you know now because if it does come down to a vote and there's a tie, um, I will not be there to break it or be on one side of it, depending on whatever the case is. So, thank you, um, Rachel. I'm um, very uh, comfortable letting CAC run with this timing discussion. So, um, whatever CAC works out, I think is fine for me. Um, but I, I do want to flag, I think that. If we um, extended severe weather shelter to 60 days a couple days ago, then I think uh, March 10th, some people will have used their 60 days. And when the temperatures drop March 11th and beyond, we're gonna be in the exact same emergency and need to make a decision about whether to do an emergency um, opening. So I'm, I'm less comfortable moving that discussion back. Um, I, I, well, just say that I think, I think that, that can of worms is gonna reopen. Sooner than later. Okay, thank you. All right, so that's the end. Um, it may be that that can of worms reopens. I, I don't know that we can schedule around that one way or the other. Um, so, but what I am hearing around that is propane tank ordinance and severe weather shelter days, whatever you think about either one of those. Um, folks seem to think we can do something sooner and shorter than the money items. And, and I'm seeing nodding heads on that. Um, then I would turn to staff if that assertion is out there. Does staff feel like you've got what you need? I mean, severe weather shelter days, you probably already have everything that we need to know about that. And we can go there. What about the ordinances? What about um, the idea of regulating propane tanks in some way that we continue to try and make them safe? It may be as simple as no propane tanks on city property. I don't know exactly without a permit. So I would just turn to staff and say, when would Kurt and or Tom, your groups be ready to talk about potential safety ordinances related to public spaces? So I would let uh, Tom weigh in on this. I think one of the, the, the positive aspects about this list is there's in some, um, there's different staff that work on different parts of this memo. Um, so no one's doing all of it. Um, the tanks would be one of those, um, but it would include um, the parks department as well as, as, well as the PD. Um, so I'll let uh, Tom or Maris reply in addition to that. Tom, do you want to start and then go to Maris? Sure. I, I, I think we could we could certainly do something in the six week time frame that you're talking about. If that's if that's what you're looking at, we could get something ready for you with um, uh, understanding the implications and drafting some language. Okay. Very good. And Maris. I'm okay. Good. Thanks, man. Okay. Um, so it sounds to me, and I'm just trying to put out there what I think I've heard that staff would need 
six ish weeks to get ordinances ready for us to look at, at least for propane tanks um, and anything attendant to it. So that, that, and it sounds like it's roughly that time frame. if we're talking April 6th to do um, the money discussion. So we've got cleanup done, some work on ambassador police um, and then service alternatives. So it seems possible that we could do this in one big meeting or we could break it into two. And if we break it into two, I think it's more manageable, but it, breaking into two like this gets us away from the holistic, holistic discussion. So, Kurt. Uh, thank you, Sam. And to respond to, to, to Mark Wall, like I think the, the length of the meeting to a certain degree is based on how successful staff is in presenting the information. I think if we do a good job in presenting these different scenarios, um, hopefully it can be done in a reasonable amount of time. I think we have narrowed it down um, to something that we can probably bite off. Um, but but I'll, I'll just make one last comment um, as people think about the time that it takes to put these things together. Um, all the staff that will be working on these options um, actually have other full-time jobs. And so um, this is sort of on top of what we do. Um, um, obviously, um, we bring things to you all the time, but um, this is, um, we have ongoing programs that we're trying to keep going and um, we're, we're not totally focused um, on each of these things either. Okay, so Kurt, I just wanna recap. It is a short list. It's city internal cleanup, ambassadors, police, uh, ranger program, and service alternatives, right? So that's the money bucket. And what I would turn to Aaron and ask and Adam is when we think of service alternatives, what is it that you'd like staff to bring back to have that conversation? Do we wanna have it just be the, the campground concept Aaron and Adam, do you want campground and safe parking? Because I, I what is your thinking about how to have that discussion framed up the way you're hoping to see it? So I, as I mentioned before, I mean, the one concept I'm working on bringing forward is the, the sanctioned uh, campground, the safe outdoor space concept. Would so, you need anything from staff or what would you need from staff to um, tee us up for that? So I, I don't need a lot. I mean, if, if they had time to take a, a, a quick look at how the program is functioning in Denver and whether they think it could apply to Boulder, great. If they don't have the time for that, I'm fine just, you know, talking over the concepts, you know, uh, independently of, a, you know, the staff bringing it forward. Adam, I'd like to hear from you and Rachel about this because if we go with what Aaron said, and I think I understood, we'd be looking at a discussion which looked at city cleanup, ambassador, police, patrol, and sanctioned campground for a module of this discussion. Is that, does that work for you for a module? Yeah, that's, that's fine for me for a module. Um, while I do want to take on the safe parking conversation at some point, I don't want to overextend uh, and make it even longer. And um, I think there's a lot of good information there that council's already been provided. If that information isn't compelling enough for you to want to bring that up as a council, then I don't think it's going to do make any difference in this context. Okay. Rachel, any thoughts? Uh, I agree with Adam. Okay. Bob? Sorry, I had to get mute off. Um, I, I was, I want to go back. So, so thanks that, for that, um, Aaron and, and Rachel and Adam, that was helpful. Um, uh, I want to come back to, I was a little concerned about Mirabai not being available. I, I threw April 6th out there, not realizing that she wouldn't be available. So I was going to um, maybe make an alternative proposal. Let me first ask a question though of Mirabai. Mirabai, would you be available on April 13th? No, sorry, I'm still out of town. So you're out on the, the 6th, the 13th, and the 20th? Yeah, I won't be back, I think, until... I, I don't think I'm back until the 17th. Oh, so you're, you are oh, wait, back? No, no, no. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. I'm okay. trying to look at this. I, I don't have the dates written in here. Okay. Oh. 
Okay, no, sorry. Um, I think I'm back. I think I'm back on the 12th or 13th. It's, sorry, our dates are fl kind of flexible because everything's really fluid right now with COVID. So I, I think I'm back somewhere around the 12th, 13th. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll guess, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if I think it's a, this, these are very important discussions and I think we should try to have everybody there. And so if, if Mirabai is out on the 6th but can be back by the 13th, I'll, I'll kind of flip what I suggested before and that we uh, move off um, the things that, um, that are on the 13th, uh, both of which I think are not time sensitive either. As a matter of fact, one of them is already, is already marked as tentative. Uh, and the other one I know is, is an ongoing project that, that probably can be briefed on at any point in time. So maybe we can just clear off the entire uh, meeting of the 13th, uh, make it a, a regular meeting if we're gonna take votes, um, which we can always do. Um, if 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 uh, Mirabai will be back by then, Bob, I'm, I was looking at February. That's why I was so screwed up on my dates. I'm sorry, it's late. My brain's not working. No, I am gone the six, the six, and the thirteenth. I'm completely gone. I will not be back until the fourteenth or fifteenth. That's why my dates. I was okay. Well, maybe maybe, maybe, you can, maybe you can work with CAC and give yeah, them. I, I start CAC dates. next week, so yeah, get, give them specific dates, and then CAC can schedule things. So anytime to the twentieth and on, I'm I'm back. So. But yeah, I start CIC on whatever Monday is, so I can work with them then. Okay. And th thanks for that, Mirabai. I think we can just let CAC run with this from here. It, it, that's right. So Aaron, I was going to go there. Thank you for that. If we're happy with the buckets and we need to see nods that we're happy with this, um, CAC can probably wrestle with it. And if we do one day for this meeting, I think the two modules, I'll just call them that for fun, would be the dollars and the policy. And the dollars would include city cleanup, ambassador, sanctioned campground. The policy is severe weather shelter days and an ordinance around safety. And I think that's digestible, but I don't know, it, it, I guess I'll ask council, if we took those modules to CAC, would you be happy with whatever CAC works out as long as we are breaking it down into those buckets. Okay, all right. Well, um, to be continued, I'm sure. Um, CAC will take this in those ways. I will turn to Kurt and Maris and Chris. Any, does this all sound digestible to you? Like we can work with this? Yep, uh, from my perspective, this is very doable. Okay. Maris, yeah, I'm seeing nods. Chris, Thanks. you okay with this? Yep, that sounds good. Okay. Sorry that took a long time. Um, Rachel, I'm not sure it gets to your bigger point about a longer term discussion, but I think that may be a process thing separately. So, okay. Um, I think we're teed up on all those tough matters items. Anything else we need to touch on? Alicia, I think we're at the end. Is this, was that the last item for us? That was the last item for you. Okay, very good. Anything else we need to touch on tonight? Seeing no hands and nothing else, I'm going to say meetings adjourned at 1125. Thank you all. Thank you, Brendan. everybody. Good night. Four million subscribers on YouTube, and he targets undeniably a pro-Russian audience. Um, he also created his own political party in 2019.